All right now, ladies and gentlemen, if you just keep together, thank you. Now, here, if you follow me, is the corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. And at this very corner, in a dirty little barber shop such as you or me would be ashamed to set foot in, it was so dirty, the notorious Sweeney Todd lived and breathed and had his being. What was Sweeney Todd famous for, Guy? He was notorious, lady. He was notorious for being a murderer. <gasps> a murderer? A notorious bloody murderer, he was. But this isn't a corner at all. I thought you said it was a corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. All done away with, sir. All done away with years back. But underneath these here stones, listen to the hollow sound of Disney Memento of the 18th century, underneath these stones was the very vault where Sweeney Todd used to burn his victims and make them into veal pies. Oh. They made veal for that guy. And that's what they had, sir. Human veal and human bow. Oh. Sweeney Todd used to murder his victims with a barber chair, he did. And at this very corner, in sight of St. Dunstan's Church, he had his notorious barber shop. Now, if we just get in a bit more close, we'll penetrate into the very scene where Sweeney Todd raised his grisly hand in murder. <laughs> Stage 47. Item 16. Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. An early Victorian melodrama written in 1842 by George Dibden Pitt. Adapted for radio by Ronald Hambleton. Starring Maver Moore as Sweeney Todd. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen with an original musical score composed and conducted by Lucio Agostini. A melodrama of a London before the days of gaslight and handsome cabs. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Hear that? St. Dunstan's bell, just like it used to ring 200 years ago. Ringing over these same streets and over streets that have gone long since. Emma of a London streets before the days of gaslight. No lamps in them days, mind you. Just a perfect breeding ground for thievery and murder. It was that very bell what brought Sweeney Todd down to his shop of a morning, watching his miserable little apprentice putting up the shutters, and then waiting in his shop like a spider lurking in his web. Boy, yes, Mr. Todd. a little more activity won't hurt you, Tobias Rag. Come here. Yes, Mr. Todd. I would have you remember that you are my apprentice, Tobias. That you have of me board, lodging, and washing. Except that you take your meals at home, that you don't sleep here, and that your mother gets up your linen. Now are you not a fortunate happy dog? Oh, yes, please, sir. How old are you, boy? Fifteen, please, Mr. Todd, sir. Old enough to have a memory, eh? I think so, sir. And remember this. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear if you repeat one word of what passes in this shop or dare to make any supposition or draw any conclusion from anything you may see or hear or fancy you may see or hear. Do you understand me? Oh, I won't say anything, Mr. Todd. And for lesser misdemeanors, there's a place for you at Jonas Fogg's madhouse in Peckham. If I say anything, sir, may I be made into veal pies at Mrs. Lovett's in Bell Yard. How dare you mention veal pies in my presence? Do you suspect... Hmm, do you want to lose this nice job, boy? And on your first day? Oh, sir, I don't suspect. Indeed, I don't. I meant no harm. Very good. I'm satisfied. Quite satisfied. And mark me, the shop, and the shop only, is your place. Yes, sir. And if any customer gives you a penny, you can keep it. So that if you get enough of them, you will become a rich man. Only I'll take care of them, and when I think you require any, you can come to me. Understand? We need not. All right, boy. Into the back room with you. Well, good morning, Mr. Smith. How's the chair working, Mr. Todd? It seems to have picked up a bit of a rasp somewhere. Come over here and have a listen. Don't see why you should complain, Mr. Sweeney Todd, thing it's not yet paid for. What, would you have me pay for a chair that doesn't give satisfaction? Listen to it, Mr. Smith. <coughs> a trifle squeaky, Mr. Smith. Perhaps something foreign has gotten into the works. Blood, breath, it's hard. Blood. What the devil do you mean? After all, even the most careful barber's hand slips a little, Mr. Todd. True. It's a delicately balanced piece of mechanism. 
Barber chairs aren't made as a rule to tip down into the cellar, Sweeney Todd. Never mind what's the rule. Your job is to see it works properly. I have my customers to think about, Mr. Smith. Tip it again, Mr. Todd. <coughs> ah, here's rusty in one or two spots. And loyal, I think. And then oil it, man, and get about your business. But, Mr. Todd, I've brought with me a little... You are surely not going to bring up again that lethal consideration owing to you in respect of this mechanical tire? Yes, Mr. Todd. I have with me an account for seven pounds, eighteen shillings, and ninepence halfpenny. And what may the ninepence halfpenny be for, Mr. Smith? For one pound of ten-inch nails, Mr. Todd. And has it occurred to you, Mr. Smith, that some parties might consider ninepence halfpenny a little excessive for a pound of ten-inch nails? It has occurred to me that I do not like your manner of haggling, Mr. Todd. Come a little nearer, Mr. Smith. What would you say to a guinea and a half? Certainly not. I want my... And perhaps a free shave, too? A really close shave afterward? I would say you are a rogue, Mr. Todd. I will make it 30 shillings. Let us say 30 shillings, Mr. Smith. Has it occurred to you that certain parties not very far up this street, certain legal parties, as you might phrase it, might gain a good deal of profit and instruction from a perusal of some of the items and specifications on this little account of mine? You mean about the chair, you dog? I mean the chair and I mean the old bailey, too, Mr. Todd. I think the amount we mentioned was seven, eighteen, nine and a half, Mr. Todd. Hmm, I was speaking of a free shave, Mr. Smith. I discern a roughness about the region of your lower lip and a hairiness about your throat that makes my razor long to be at it. Pray come in and take a seat, Mr. Smith. I'll go now, you scoundrel, but I shall be back. Yes, yes, come back next week. I shall be back before next week, Mr. Todd. Considerably before next week. Ah, he was wicked with Sweeney Todd. Glib as a sparrow and thieving as a jackdaw. Why'd as soon twist a young lad's arm as do an honest London tradesman out of his wages. But look, here's a first-rate sample of how Sweeney Todd used to do business. In fact, this is the little piece of work that finally brought him to the gathers. Too bad they didn't have electric chairs in them days. An electric barber chair would have been the thing for him. Now, young Tobias Rag was sweeping out the shop one evening. It was cold and drizzly, a regular sloppy day. And into the shop walks a chap what had sailor writ all over him. Is this barber shop open, my boy? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in. And tell your master I would use his services. Uh, but wait a minute. Do you live about here? I live over by St. Duncan's Church, sir. Do you know Miss Joanna Oakley? Oh, yes, indeed. She's a very kind-hearted lady. What you say is no surprise to me, though naturally I am delighted to hear it. Are you related to her, sir? She is my sweetheart. I've just come back from a voyage to India. I intend to marry her. Oh, that's what I should like to do. What, marry Miss Oakley? Oh, no. I mean, I should like to sail the ocean, too. The sea has its perils and its chances, my boy. I've been away for five years, not knowing when I would ever see my sweetheart again. But now I'm home again, bringing her a pearl necklace for a wedding gift. Ah, oh, Tobias, my dear boy. Oh. What a time you have been. What has detained you, my darling boy? Sir, Mr. Todd, I... Has Captain Pearson's peruke been sent home, my dear? I don't know, sir. I thought I gave you instructions never to speak to any person or another beside you, eh? You may have done, sir. Take a look! Oh! And remember for the future what it was for. Now go into the shop and attend to your business. The next time you disobey me, I'll cut your throat. From ear to ear. Your pardon, sir. I am to blame. I asked him about a particular old friend. We got him to conversation. Your apologies, I beg. Boys will be boys, and a little mild chastisement from time to time does them no harm. Perhaps you're right. But I must protest always against unnecessary severity towards young persons. But, though you are hasty, you are no doubt possessed of a generous heart. And hang me if I don't patronize you this very moment. I'm going to meet my sweetheart presently. And I think a clean face will become so important an occasion. Happy to be of service to you, young gentleman. Is it a shave you need? What am I here for but to give you a shave? To give you a closer shave than you have ever had before. Thank you, Barbara. Take the father chair, please. It's the chair I keep for special customers. <laughs> and special occasions, eh? And special occasions. Head back when I tuck in the cloth, sir. I always like to leave the throat clear. That's better... You've been to sea, sir? I've only lately come up the river from an Indian voyage. India. 
You uh, carry some treasure, I presume? Am I the brush? Among others, this small casket. Uh, this here. Eh? Exquisite workmanship. It is not the box, but its contents that must cause you wonder. For I must, in confidence, mind, tell you it contains a string of veritable pearls of the value of 12,000 pounds. 12,000 pounds? <laughs> what the devil noise was that? Only me. I laugh. Laugh? You call that a laugh? I suppose you caught it to somebody who died. That is your way of laughing. I beg you won't do it anymore. You will find me all attention to your orders, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ingestray. Mark Ingestray. Mr. Ingestray. It's well you came here. For though I say it, there isn't a barber in the city of London that thinks of polishing a customer off as I do. Fact, I assure you. <laughs> Shiver the <laughs> main thing. I, I tell you what it is, Master Barber. If you come that laugh again, I'll get up and go. Well, very good, sir. It won't occur again, if I may make so bold. Uh, who are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? You seem fond of asking questions, my friend. Perhaps before I answer them, you'll reply to me. Do you know Mr. Oakley, who lives somewhere hereabouts? He's a spectacle maker. Oh, yes. Yes, to be sure I do. Jasper Oakley in 4th Street. He has a daughter called Joanna that the young bloods call... Head back a little farther, sir. The flower of 4th Street. She is respected, I hope. Oh, of course, of course. Now, bless me, where can I have laid the mistrop? I had it this minute. Ah, I recollect. I took it into the parlor. Sit still, sir. I shan't be a minute. You can amuse yourself with the newspaper. The chair moved before I could touch the lever. What's happened? Is this a trick? The chair must have life of its own. No, no. Courage, Sweeney. It must have slipped. Smith must have put too much oil on it. And remember the pearls. The pearls. <sighs> when I was a boy, the first for avarice was first awakened by the fair gift of a farthing. And that farthing soon became a pound, a pound a hundred, and so to a thousand, till I said to myself, I will possess an hundred thousand. This string of pearls will complete the sum. Who's there? Quick, speak up. Yes, sir. Tobias, you dog, how long have you been peeping in the door? Peeping, sir. Yes, peeping, don't repeat my words. See, sir, I wasn't peeping at all. You didn't see the chair tilt back? I didn't know it could tilt back, sir. It doesn't. Did I say it did? No, sir, but I thought... Never mind what you thought. <laughs> Who's there? Somebody else skulking about? I'll soon fetch him out. Well, what do you want? It's only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be saved, sir. Only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be saved, eh? You know quite a bit, Tobias. No, sir. Tell this black servant that his master's not here. Tell him to seek elsewhere. I will, sir. I should have remembered about English fish, sir. But no matter. The pearls have come to me. And Mark Ingestry has gone to Mrs. Lovett, the pie maker. Sweeney Todd was sitting on top of the world. Twelve thousand pounds worth of pearls at one sitting, as you might say. But not an easy thing to turn into cold cash. That's not something he could do by killing, though he would have if he could have. But he bided his time until the right man came along. Good evening, neighbor. I would have you shave me. Your servant, Mr. Parmine. I think you'll find this chair comfortable. Well, thank you. You uh, deal in precious stones? I do, neighbor. To be sure. Everyone knows John Parmine, the lapidary and the jeweler. It's rather late for a bargain. Do you want to buy or sell? Head forward while I pin the cloth, sir. To sell. The only orders I get are for pearls, and they're not in the market nowadays. I have nothing but pearls to sell. I mean to keep all my diamonds, garnets, and rubies. The deuce you do. Will you look at the pearls I have? Where are they? Yeah. Hmm. Real, by heaven. All real. I know they are real. Will you deal with me or not? I'm not sure they are real, you know. Let me look at them again. Hmm. I thought so. Counterfeit. But so well done that just for the curiosity of the thing, I will give you uh, fifty pounds. Fish? Fifty pounds? Is this a joke? 
I will give you a hundred. Hark ye, friend Parmain. It neither suits me inclination nor me time to stand haggling with you. I know the value of pearls, and as a matter of ordinary business, I will sell them to you so you may get a handsome profit. Well, since you know more than I gave you credit for, and this is to be a downright uh, business transaction, I think I can find a customer who will uh, pay 11,000 pounds for them. Ah, that's better. Let me have the money tomorrow. Uh, stop a bit. You must know that a string of pearls is not to be bought and sold like a few ounces of old silver. And you must give me satisfaction as to how you came by them. Sure, man, who will question you? You're in the trade. That's all very fine, but I don't see why I should give you the full value of an article without evidence to prove your title to it. In other words, you don't care how I came by the property involved so long as I sell it to you at a thief's price. Mr. Todd, I am a respectable trader. And on the other hand, if I want the real value, you mean to be particular. I suspect you have no right to sell the pearls. And to satisfy myself, I shall insist on your coming with me to a magistrate. Respectable tradesman, you'll go all right, but by the road I choose. This chair will carry you, Mr. Parmine. Ah. Off ah. you go, Mr. Parmine. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> Sweeney Todd. Hmm? Is it you, Smith? You! Not goodbye, surely, Mr. Todd, but how do you do, dear Mr. Todd? So, you know the secret of the pearls now. It is enough. Your bill is paid. But it has to be receipted yet, Mr. Todd. Where is Mark Ingestry? It was you who sent him down to the vault, wasn't it? But I didn't cut his throat, Mr. Todd. You are a little too clever, Mr. Smith. I do not like to have such a clever mechanic in my confidence. It doesn't altogether suit. How do you like this? A little tire? <gasps> a pistol? Mr. Todd, it's not loaded. Not as big as a chair, Mr. Smith, but it works better. <laughs> ah. Mr. Clever Smith, you won't do much thinking now with that bleeding head. You can take all your cleverness down below now. You can have a ride in this particular chair of yours. It ought to work well now its master is riding in it. <laughs> ah, the secret is mine again. That's how Sweeney Todd went about his notorious bloody business. Lured him into his devilish barber chair, touched a lever, and down they went into the grisly vaults below Fleet Street. All he wanted was the smell of a bit of money, and he was after it like a ferret. Just one close shave, and he was cock of the walk, he thought. And all he had to worry about was doing poor old Mrs. Lovett out of her share of the swag. She was the lady that kept the pie shop next door. She was a fat, comfortable old girl, buried five husbands, and looked forward to five more. Why, here is Mr. Lupin, to be sure. Just fancy coming to see little me in all this rhyme. <laughs> Do give me your umbrella this minute, Mr. Lupin, and sit down and talk something warm or you'll die of cold. Aye, hey, dear sister, I bear this misfortune like all of us with fortitude, believing that our sufferings here will in a future world be changed to peace and happiness. Certainly, to be sure. Therefore, I beg you to take a little drop of tea. Dear sister, you are indeed an angel. Oh, Mr. Lupin, won't you draw your chair a little closer? Verily I will. And is it true, dear sister, that thou hast gathered up to thyself much of the mammon of unrighteousness by the sale of those same pieces of manner, which the ungodly called, though, wrapped around the flesh of the petty calf? What a lovely way of saying, dear things. There is much of the mammon of unrighteousness in what thou callest, by. Thou hast what the wicked call a stopping. Oh, brother, let us not talk of pays. Remember that all day and all night I think of nothing but pays. And sometimes pays aren't me dreams. Remember that all day I smell pays. And I might dole the pays. And I might stop and the pays. Verily, sister, it is a delicious taste. Lo, the smell of gravy haunteth me nostrils and me so quivers with delight. Then would you like a pie, brother? Miss. Oh, faithless, me so cry it out, oh, me sister, oh, me beloved. 
人在转绕啊！嗯，因此他那的很来发言。我也不晓得我说的听不，这些都是他们的吧？那那是六分，这是他的 special bag， 他至少 keep the callers and friends。And tell me, sister. Mary's great profit is up the pie. Must they put in a penny worth of the set of the car? No, Mister Lupin, how do you imagine I live? I'll put in a farthing's worth, no more. Really, a magnificent pie. Of a truth, thou art a woman in a thousand. And how much flour puttest thou in a tuppenny pie? A heaper, Mister Lupin. And whence cometh thy flour, my beloved? I buy it from Miller Brown. And Miller Brown has nearby his mill certain cavities in the earth containing chalk, at the north. Chalk? Miller Brown is a respectable merchant, Mister Lupin. I say, I say, did I say or tell? Ah, sister, what a pie! What a pie was that! <laughs> Behold, my heart yearns after thy beauty. Behold, a great love wells up in my soul. Who is to take me in? It is the stocking thou sayest. Hark! I will whisper. Is it near thy bed? Oh, brother, brother, thou! You must. Be. You are naughty man. Is the beloved which call me Loopy now? Oh, not now, not yet. True, there are yet certain ministrations of the spirit I must attend to ere time for pleasure come in. You are such a godly man, brother. Yea, even today I was able to save a wandering soul from sorrow, even an unfortunate black. Whose master has left him alone in this seeming black, a gentleman's black servant. Verily, even the heathen, dear sister, is. What did he say about his master? I mean, verily, I am gratified, highly gratified, to find studies of mercy in thy sister. Wilt come with me to Joanna Oakley, who is suffering from a great depression of the soul too. Joanna Oakley, a gentleman's black servant. We are undone. Undone, my beloved. Oh, Mister Lupin, leave me at once. But my beloved, this excessive pity for the unfortunate one seems to be a trifle. Shall I say excessive? What did you do with this black servant? I kindly took charge of a certain sum of money for him, lest he lose it, sister. What is he now? Swallowed up with thee, it do this team in city. Ah. Work of the Lord calleth his servant, and I must be gone. I will bear to Joanna Oakley expressions of your solicitude. Yes, tell her, tell her that I weep for her sorrow. Verily, a gracious sentiment, and I shall add, my dear sister, that in your eyes every tear is a pearl. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett, rather late for a call, my dear. Can I do anything for you? My mind is disturbed, Pud. The wicked manner of our lives darkens every hour and colours all my dreams with blood. Can we not reform our ways and live good, righteous lives? What drivel is this woman? You sound like that ranting parson Lupin. Lupin, I know. Lupin, oh yes. Don't talk. Twist me arm like that. Me. I'll do more than that. Now tell me exactly what are you talking about? William Grant died last night. And who may William Grant be? He was my baker, Mister T. But, my dear Mrs. L., your baker's name was Jones. But he got discontented, Mister Todd. Surely he remember. So many of them, one gets confused. But never mind. Dry those tears, <laughs> little crybaby. Mister T., the pie shop in Bell Yard must be closed. Closed, Mrs. Lovett. The conscience is aroused. I dreamt last night that I was being hanged with a rope of pearls. My heart goes out in sympathy to you, Mrs. Lovett. You must be tired of standing. Let me implore you to take a seat. Take this chair, Mrs. Lovett. My chair? Do you think I'm such a fool, Mr. T? Well, why not? It's a perfectly good chair. You and I have profited well enough by it in the past. It's a wicked chair, Todd. <laughs> it works very well. A trifle squeaky. But then all old friends squeak a little bit, Mrs. Lovett. Eh, hey, Mrs. Lovett? Let me go, Todd. Please, please, Todd, my dear. The management of women is much like the management of horses. Horse too viciously applied. What are they going to do, Todd? People are beginning to suspect. Oh, do you know of anyone, Mrs. Lovett? What about that gentleman with the pearls? He'll never suspect not any more. But what about his servant? People will speak to him. He might go to the magistrate. Now right? that, Mrs. Lovett, sounds very like an idea of your own. We're in it together. Remember that. Uh, remember. Come, my dear. 
Let us sit down and talk like old friends. You know, you don't mean to do anything, do you? Pray forgive me, Anne. It's crushing it. I have always been noted for Miss Trink. Once you're out, I must breathe the clean air. Let me go, let Why me go. Why this, Harry, to be out at this time of day, Mrs. Lovett? No, no. We shall sit here quietly and talk of your trouble. Oh. You were speaking of the unexpected demise of this, let me see, what was his name? Not Jones, what was it? I've forgotten, Tom. You are not thinking of going, Mrs. Lovett? No. Too late now. Why then, let me hold your hand. And we will sit here, holding hands like... Like lovers. Now, while Sweeney Todd and his female accomplice were sitting in his barber shop, warm in their hands, so to speak, because there was only one candle in the old room in place, Dr. Aminadab Lupin was on his errand of mercy to see Joanna Oakley. She'd pretty near cried her eyes out for Mark Ingestry by this time, and her ma and pa just didn't know what to do with her. How is this child that you look so pale? I must speak positively about you to Mr. Lupin. Lupin may be all very well in his way as a parson, but I really don't know what he can have to do with Joanna looking pale. Hush, Mr. Oakley. I'm all right, Mama. Really, I am. Lupin has been kicked out of more people's houses than anybody else from here to Aldgate. If the sainted man has been kicked, Mr. Oakley, he glories in it. Mr. Lupin likes to suffer for the faith. And if he were made a martyr, it would give him much pleasure. Not half the pleasure it would give me, Mrs. Oakley. Joanna, I, I think I feel my old complaint coming on again. Your, your father's brutality always produces it. I, I must compose my nerves with the little cherry brandy. Let me help you, Mama. No, no. I, I will suffer alone, Joanna. Well... I suppose I must offer her crumbs of comfort, as Lupin would say. Damn, Mr. Aminadab, Lupin! Ah, oh, Miss Oakley, did I hear your parents retire? Yes, Mr. Lupin, I shall call them back. Oh, dear is Joanna, I come here at the bidding of my conscience to consort with you in your dire need. You will allow me free passage from the room, Mr. Lupin. Thou art disrespectful, but I will not snub thee, virgin. Thou knowest not me, missionary. I don't want your comfort, sir. What if I were to pour into your ears the knowledge that I have? If I whisper pearls in a black servant? <gasps> oh, servant, not Mr. Ingestry. Ah, I have touched a cord in thy bosom. Thou hast heeded the tongues of rumor that have been a wagging. I do not listen to rumor, sir. Only by rumor do we learn of iniquity, virgin. It hath made a man of me and me carcass, which was as lank as an erring once, is now round and comely to look at. Oh, where is Mr. Ingestry? Have you heard from him? Oh, how long have I waited for news? I made in them news incarnate. Though I speak with the mouths of babes and saplings, I shall offer me news. If you know anything, speak, I pray you. For a consideration. Oh, anything, anything, Mr. Lupin. Then, maiden, listen. I have held converse with a certain black, for whom I was able to perform a small service. He had lost his master. He was as a ship without a rudder, as a principality without a prince. He told me of hours of waiting outside a certain shop on Fleet Street. A shop, mark you, from which his master never emerged. Where was it? I must go to him. Precipitation, virgin, is unwise. For next to this certain shop lives a lady for whom I hold a certain regard, and with whom, in fact, I have supped. And drank. When I spoke certain words to her, she blushed and they looked pale. All I wonder is this, did she blush from a lovely excitement of the pulse at the sight of me? Or did she thus reveal a guilty secret? Then how will we know? What will we do? I know an unmannerly youth who might, for a consideration, ingratiate himself within this certain lady's shop. Stop riddling, Mr. Lupin. Whose shop? Who is the lady? The shop virgin is Sweeney Todd's, and the lady is Mrs. Lovett. The pie maker. Do you think them guilty? Verily, I believe this man Sweeney to be a man of sin. I myself have a mind to test his wickedness and to introduce this youth within Mrs. Lovett's shop. Then do so, Mr. Lupin, and let me find ways to thank you. Why, you can thank me with the aforementioned consideration. What is it, then? Briefly, let me take thee unto my bosom, even as a wedded wife. Absurd! 
Have you been drinking? The fire of love rages. It consumeth me very vital. Come no dearer, sir. But eventually I may extinguish the flame of my passion by the moisture of those ruby lips. Sir, are you insane? Maiden, I am resolved. Come on, hand me the thing. Oh, repent. Moderation, sir. maiden, one oh. off. You leave them. Why, it's the hypocrite parson. Oh. Here's a bit of correction for you, Lupin. Help! I am a steel robber. Fire! Help! Now, what was all that to confabulation with Lupin, Johanna? Oh, Papa, I'm afraid for Mr. Ingersoll. Ingersoll? Is he back again? That is why I kept it my secret, Papa. I thought you might still refuse your consent. It was because of you that he went to sea. And well, he might, the wastrel. But now he has returned, rich from India, Papa. Rich from India? Then why doesn't he show himself like a man? He, he has met with some misfortune here in London. Mr. Lupin believes him dead, I think. Where was this? He was last seen at Sweeney Todd Shop in Fleet Street. And his, his black servant... Oh, buck up, Black. Dry your eyes. If Mark Ingestry is alive, we'll find him. And if Sweeney Todd is responsible for those tears of yours, he'll pay for it. And that's how the you and cry started against Sweeney Todd, the notorious bloody murderer. Of course, it wasn't the you and cry at first, because he was a slippery devil, but matters were coming to an end. Jasper Oakley was plotting to comfort his daughter, and as to Mr. Lupin, why he thought he might lie in his pocket. It is well that the children of the Lord should partake of the ill-gotten gains of the wicked and strip the villain of his so while he figured out a way to blackmail Sweeney Todd, he sent his unmannerly youth, Jarvis Williams, to worm his way into Mrs. Lovett's confidence. Go away, my good fellow. We never give anything to beggar. I ain't no beggar, Mum. But the young chap was trying to look out for a set you eyes, then. Jarvis Williams is the name. I've seen better days, Mum. I think they'll be Italy. Of the Hyken? Yes. You never seen such a barrow of greens and taters as I used to turn out. But Monopoly made me a bankrupt. The big shops ruins the little shops and stars out the cost of money. Blow time, ain't it? I dare say when you get into better days, you'll have quite sufficient incidents to make you intolerable. Are you, uh, from this bar? No, Mum. Night through. Better picking. You are unknown about the air? Even old Bailey hasn't heard of me, Mum. Very well. You ask me for employment, and I will give it to you. Follow me. Where to? To the bike house. Well, I will show you what you have to do. You must promise never to leave it on any pretense. Never to leave it? Never, unless you leave it for good and all. As Shakespeare says, my poverty and not my will consent. Help me with this back door. Will it be working in the bowels of the earth? Shut <coughs> boy, it's only our vault. Coo, it's a dismal old. By this petty young Jarvis, we must descend to the furnace in oven. Well, I will show you how to manufacture the pot. Feed the files and make yourself generally useful. And that's it, I hope. I suppose I'm to have someone assist me in this situation. One pair of hands would never do the work in such a place. Are you not content? Yes. Only you spoke of having a man. I had a man, Jarvis. He's born to be his friend. He's gone to some of his old friends who will be glad to see him. No, don't like the sound of that. Have you any scruples? No scruples, Mum, but one objection. And that is? I should like to leave when I please. <laughs> you may make your mind easy on that score. I never keep anyone many hours after the digging to feel dissatisfied. But now I must leave you for the time. What, down here? Yes, Jarvis. As long as you're industrious, you will get on very well. As soon as you begin to get idle and neglect the orders, you will receive a piece of information. What is it, Mum? I'm an inquiring young fella. You may as well give it me now. Now, I seldom find any occasion for that at first. But after a time, when you get well fed, if it is sure to want it, everyone who relinquishes the situation goes to his old friend. Friends he's not seen for many years. 
I shall return anon. manner of talking that respectable female is. There seems to be something singular in everything she says. And what a singular looking place too. Nothing visible but darkness. It will be quite unbearable but for the delicious smell of pie. Yeah, what's that? A rattlesnake? It rattles anyway. You let never feel. Bones. Skull. Ribs. I must have stumbled into a surgery. Because these are human bones. Wish I could find a funny bone. I feel a bit poorly. She was a nice looking old ma too. Strikes me that Lupin and her would make a nice pair. Why have this bag of bones is a fellow who's gone to his oldest friend. Might be it's more industry, the sailor. Now he's dead. Oh, what's that? Oh, ma. It's one of the murdered ghosts come to extra his body. Maybe it's an with interview pie. Please, it wasn't me, sir, ghost. I was only I ten minutes ago. Silence, my friend. You in league with these fiends. I hope, Mr. Ghost, they aren't going to murder me as they did you before me. Whose ghost are you? My name is Mark Ingestry. <gasps> Merciful heavens, it's the sailor. Him that was murdered for his pearl. You know about that. You must be in league with the villain. Indeed, I am not. His wages is too high for an honest man. As Shakespeare says, mine only vice is honesty. Will you help me to bring Sweeney Todd to the hands of justice? Right you are, sir. But what are you stopping down here for? I don't know how it happened, but I suddenly fell into space. It was while I was being shaved. And I was knocked senseless on this stone floor. And when you come to? I suspected treachery. Since then, I've explored these vaults from end to end, seeking proof of the villain's guilt. How do we get out of here? Have you a stout heart? Me heart? Stout enough, but my blood's running a trifle thin. What's your name? Jarvis Williams, sir. Do you know Joanna Oakley? Only by year, sir. You know where she lives? In Four Street, I think. Then go to her. No. No, that won't do. Go to her father. Tell him I'm alive and request him to communicate that intelligence to Miss Oakley. Let her know that there is yet hope. Are you going on living here? Yes, for the present. I must gather evidence and proof that Sweeney Todd is the malefactor I believe him to be. Can you keep a secret, Jarvis? Well enough, I suppose. Then come with me through this passage. What more gory owes? Follow me. Up these stairs is a door that connects these vaults with Sweeney Todd's shop. This way. Right into the lion's mouth. There I will station myself, and there you will bring Mr. Oakley so that we may apprehend the villain. Quiet now. This must be Sweeney Todd's back room, sir. It is. And what of these walls not seen, Jarvis? Look through the door. It's stupid. He's getting himself shy. Quiet, we may gather some clue. Listen to what they say. Hey, Mr. Todd, not so hard. Not so hard. What do you say? You'll either me too hard. It's such a while since I had the pleasure of shaving you, Mr. Lupin. I wanted to make a good job of it. Mr. Todd, remember what the bountiful collection we had at church meeting yesterday evening. What of it? Oh, the man of God can well afford that gracious offering known to the unrighteous as a tip. A tip, eh? Dear me, perhaps you are worth polishing off. What did you say, Mr. Todd? Uh, nothing, Parson. Pray shave me carefully, Mr. Todd, for I am to wear a wealthy heiress. I would fain make the wife of me booze. A wealthy heiress? And what's her name, may I ask? This is lovely, I'll Silence, which will ruin everything. Of a surety, she is not unknown to you. This Mrs. Lovey who owns a pie shop in Bell Yard, oh, that the Lord hath blessed with a trade both bountiful and ever flowing. What do you say, Mrs. Lovett? Then you are going to be polished up. Remain seated, sir. Lupin, sit down! <laughs> uh, no, you don't pitch me so easily, Mr. Todd. I have always been suspicious of your doings, and I prefer to stand. I should have suspected the chair. Come here, Mr. Lupin. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And now that I know how you manage it, and a sinful cunning trick it is, you'll pay blood money for it, Mr. Todd. Come back, Lupin. As you see, Mr. Todd, I am not ripe for killing yet. Oh! Yes, you are, Mr. Lupin. Very ripe. Very ripe indeed. 
Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. When they sit in Sweeney's chair, off they go to heaven knows where. Me says love, it surely knows where they go to all the him what goes. Where they go to all the him what goes. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young or old ones, come and die. I'm off, Mr. Todd, we'll talk like a... I'll cut your throat from ear to ear when I catch you. Coast clear, Mr. Ingester. What unparalleled horrors. Can't say I'm sorry to see old Lupin doing a bit of honest running for a change. See, Jarvis, this is the very chair in which I sat. And here's the chain the assassin pulls to tilt the chair and drop the victim into the depths below. And then into the furnaces where the bodies are incinerated. Fetch Mr. Oakley and the police officers. I will return to the vaults, for Sweeney Todd thinks me dead. And as long as he thinks so, he has an adversary he does not suspect. <laughs> That ranting parson has escaped me, but I fear no man of his kidney. A little money, an offering, he would call it. Blackmail, I should say. Merely a temporary disbursement to be returned along with all the other effects of the leg at all. <laughs> a pretty chest, the leg at all. And when he's been polished off, I'll deal with the rest of them. I have too many enemies to be really safe. My first step must be to get rid of Tobias Rag. I think he thinks. I need not take his life, but a close confinement of the boy in the lunatic asylum of Jonas Fogg will effectually silence him. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett too grows dissatisfied and scrupulous. I've had my eye on her for some time, and I fear she intends mischief. A little poison skillfully administered may remove any unpleasantness in that quarter. <laughs> So we need Todd. Spying, Mr. Lovett. You may call it so, and since I discover that you intend treachery, I shall on the instant demand my share of the booty. Aye, an equal share of the fruits of our mutual bloodshed. Well, so you shall. I will balance accounts with you. What is the reckoning? I find it to be 12,000 pounds to a fraction. That is just... Six thousand pounds each, there being two of it. But, Mistress Lovett, you will have to pay me for your support, lodging, and clothes. Clothes, Mr. Todd? I repeat the word, clothes. Why, I haven't had a new dress for these six months. Besides, am I to have nothing for your education? In killing, I mean, Mrs. Lovett. Oh, I have profited by that. To a degree, Mrs. Lovett, yes. For some years past, you have been totally provided for by me. And after deducting that and the expenses of erecting furnaces, purchasing flour for your delicious veal pies, we got the flour cheap because of the truck in it, and sundry other outlays, I find it leaves a balance of 16 shillings, fourpence, three farthings in my favor. In your favor? And I don't intend you to budge an inch until it is paid. You want to rob me, but you shall find to your sorrow I will have my due. You have instructed me in killing your son. Very well, Sweeney Todd. Tis you who purchased this knife. Don't be a fool, woman. Put your name to a deed consigning the owl of the wealth blood that purchased all you perish. Idiot. You should have known Sweeney Todd better than that. I calculate my chances. I have also purchased this pistol. Todd. Throw down the knife. Todd, what are you going to do? Throw down the knife, woman. There it is, Todd. No, say your prayers. Your last hour has come. Spare my life, for the love of it is our spare, George. Well, that's good, as you spared mine. 
Can it have to kill me? I'll stop before you spill my blood. I've been so to you upon my guilty soul. Take your hands off me, woman. What about Lupin? It was in our interest, Todd, that I led him on. Shaw! Take your hands from about me neck. I don't like things crawling over me. Oh, Todd, a good lady told me of home where I could end my days in solitude and peace. Let me go to it again and beg it on my knees to show you the same mercy and confession. Let us never see each other anymore. Let us lead better lives and forget we ever lived except in prayer. Will you lose your hold? It is never too late to repent, Todd. Never. It is too late for you. But if Mrs. Lovett is dead, and there is blood upon me. Now Sweeney is alone. Now let the trail work, and let the furnaces consume the body, and destroy all evidence of my guilt in this, as it has in my manifold deeds of blood. <laughs> With Mrs. Lovett dead, Sweeney Todd had to do all his dirty work by himself. He lays her in the chair, tips it down into the vault, then hurries down the back stairs and through the dark passage to finish the job off. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Lovett. Somebody shot you. Tell me who did it. Tell Sweeney, and he'll cut their throats from ear to ear. Little crybaby, it's too bad you missed getting your share, isn't it? But don't worry, I'll revenge you. Hm, all right. Footsteps on the stair. No, in the passage. In the passage? Oh, but only Mrs. Lovett and that Ezekiel Smith knows about that passage, and they are dead. Go away! Your trade was a paying one, Mr. Todd. Taylor! I'm back, Mr. Todd. Go away, Mr. Taylor. You're dead. I denounce you, thief and murderer. I have caught you in the act of disposing of one of your unhappy victims. Wait a minute, Mr. Taylor. Would you like to go the way she went? I have lots of bullets left in this pistol, and Sweeney Todd has never been known to me. I do not fear you face-to-face, murderer. Come not a step closer in so die! <laughs> Sweeney Todd. Curse you! There. This pistol is too dangerous for you to handle. Now, Mr. Todd, with my own hands I shall break you from the gallows and the end you so richly deserve. Oh, Mr. Taylor, the fortunes of war, eh? One false move and I'll shoot you as I would a mad dog. That's a bargain indeed. But, Taylor, what? Behind you! What? Ah! How is that for a bargain, eh? <laughs> ah! Oh, what a weakling. So, Mr. Taylor, you see, I am still master about here. Now, up those stairs, through the trap door into Mrs. Lovett's eye shop, and one lever locks all the doors. <laughs> You're lost now, Mr. Taylor. You'll never get out of this alive, and pretty soon you have company. <laughs> Verily, I have no wish to be included in this pursuit, Mr. Oakley. Lo, the roaring lion is abroad, and no folks shall remain of the thief. But, uh, Mr. Lupin, our plan includes you, eh, Jarvis? We've got a place for Mr. Lupin, all right. My proper place is on guard, exhorting, keeping watch and ward. Let me be the encourager, Mr. Oakley. Uh, no, Mr. Lupin, you are to be the bait. <laughs> the bait? You are to go to Sweeney Todd's shop. Now, listen carefully. Engage him in conversation. You can do that well enough. Provoke him to some damaging admission. Yes, yes. Then, when he is about to plunge his razor into your throat to silence you forever... <gasps> as late as that! It would not trick him otherwise. Then we will burst in, overpower him, and win the day! Hurrah! St. George for England! Verily, it does not appear to be so much like an holiday. It will make a man of you, Lupin. However weary he is, I'd everybody. I never did see such a man for distraction of the mind. It's the sailor! <laughs> Mark Ingestry, my dear boy. 
Have you caught the murderer? At last I have the proof of his guilt. I've seen the murderer at work. What poor soul was it this time? He has done away with his accomplice, Mrs. Lovett. <gasps> what Sempronia gone woe to England and woe to Lupin. She was a nice old ma, too. She was round as the full moon and as fleshy as the goats that wanted on the delectable mountain. And thou perished. Gone like the flower of the field. He thinks me locked in his vaults by escape by a secret tunnel. He made a great mistake in not killing you, Mr. Ingestry. Uh, for his own good, I mean. It is an error he will bitterly repent. Uh, Mark, uh, I may call my future son-in-law Mark, I believe. Bully for you, Mr. Oakley. I uh, may have dealt a pretty servilely toward you in the past, but uh, all that's forgot, eh? Of course, then let us call Johanna that you may greet your sweetheart before we take this murderer. Bully for you, Mr. Oakley. This young man is like the blackbird. He has but one song. I'll call her. Uh, Mrs. Oakley, bring Johanna at once. There is a good old friend of hers here. Now just watch her face when she sees you, Mark. What is this, Mr. Oakley? Why do you thus disturb my after-dinner rest? Calling for Joanna with a voice like the bull of Bashan. A pious phrase, good Mrs. Oakley. Uh, what's this, Mrs. O? Is Joanna not here? Well, how can she be here when she's with this gentleman? With me, madam? With you, indeed, Mark Ingersby. And I must say, too, that it is not the proper thing to do either. Sending a young woman notes like she was a trollop instead of an honest girl tenderly nurtured. I sent Joanna no letter, Mrs. Oakley. You have no call to lie about it, Mr. Ingestry. Where is this letter? Here. Naturally, I took it from her, but she would go. What devil's work is this? This is not my hand. Not your... <gasps> then she has been abducted. I got it. Yes. Only one man could be responsible for this subterfuge. And that man is... Sweetheart! Oh! Thank you, the mind has given way. Leave her where she lies. There's man's work to be done to the rescue. Once more onto the breach, as Shakespeare says. Sweeney Todd is doomed. But is there time to save Joanna Oakley? He is like a lion at bay now, enraged and unscrupulous. <laughs> This enticed maiden shall be my surety of escape. What do you think, Miss Oakley? Do your worst, your ruffian. Though my dear parents and Mr. Ingestry hold me dear, they will never let the reflection sway them in the performance of their duty. Have I not a singular grace in writing love letters? Oh, you do ill to taunt someone who is in your power, Mr. Todd. You would not dare do it if Mr. Ingestry were here. But he is here, my dear, and you shall see him in a little while. You shall join your lover in the vaults below. But first... Just don't be frightened. I'm not going to harm you yet. <laughs> I just want you to be a witness. I'll be no witness to your doings, Sweeney Todd. I have a young apprentice who has shown distressing signs of madness lately. Fancy I caught him yesterday stealing away to denounce me to the magistrate. Is that not an undoubted form of madness? I think he did... Well... Look, we'll have him in. It's near time for the keepers to arrive anyway, and you can judge his madness for yourself. I keep him in this room. Hello, Tobias Bragg. I won't enjoy it. I won't be knocked about in this way. You won't, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you are a designing, cruel, and cold-blooded murderer. There, you see, Miss Oakley, these are genuine raving. Miss Oakley... Have you lured her into your den, too? Now, don't you wish you'd been loyal to me, you dog, when we do such a brisk business? Have no fear, Tobias. Help will come. <laughs> Tobias will be far from help, and very soon. We are safe. <laughs> come in, Jonas Fogg. Now, Tobias, my boy, do you consider yourself saved? Sweeney Todd, if my memory don't deceive me. You are right. I'm not easily forgotten, I believe. You have brought the water. They are outside in the carriage. Good. Now, Jonas Fogg, I have another apprentice here who has shown such symptoms of insanity that it becomes adequate to say. Necessary to place him under your care. Indeed, does he rave? He says I am a murderer. A murderer? <laughs> yes, isn't it? Could anything be more absurd? 
I that have the milk of human kindness flowing in me every vein. For how long, Miss Todd, do you think this malady will continue? I will pay for twelve months. But I do not think between you and I that the case will last anything like so long. I think he will die like young Simpkins, suddenly. I shouldn't wonder if he did. It is decidedly the best way. It prevents expense. We make no remarks and we ask no questions. Those are the principles on which we have conducted our establishment for so long. Those are the principles upon which we shall continue to conduct it and to merit, we hope, the patronage of the public. Unquestionably. Uh, but which is the patient, I perceive you have two of them. Pay no attention to the girl. This boy is the one. Quite young. Pity, isn't it? And, of course, we deeply lament this condition. Of course. But see, he raises his eyes. He will speak directly. Rave, I should say. Sweeney Todd is a murderer, and I denounce him. There, you see him? Man, indeed. Save me from him. It is my life he seeks because I know he is a murderer. Miss Oakley, add your voice to mine. Mr. Fogg, if you have any sympathy or justice in you, you will help us. This seems to be communicable insanity in its most terrible form. I shall be upon the necessity of putting him in a straight rescue. Mr. Todd, let me have both of them. No, the girl is a, shall I say, a deposit left for my safekeeping. But, dear Jonas Fogg, why shouldn't you have both of them? Why shouldn't I deposit her with you? <laughs> Valuable security should always be banked, Mr. Todd. Hmm. A pleasant little jest, Jonas Fogg. <laughs> <laughs> Take them both! A good day's business. Convey them to one of the dark, damp cells. As too much light encourages their delirium. Villain, do your worst! I shall always aver that Chisweeney Todd is an assassin. It is true. Take him away! I will die before I submit to you or your vile myrmidon. Why, then you'll die, for no power can aid you. Yes, there is one. Where? There is heaven, which fails not to succor the helpless and persecuted. Cushers! I am undone! Quick, bolt the door, Jonas Fogg! Too late, Sweeney Todd! Much too late, Mr. Todd! Ma! Clean hey, no, off, you cowardly rascals, and I'll put the kibosh on the old corn song. The kibosh? Yes, it's a word of Greek expression meaning the hopset of the heppelkorn. You'll hang now, Sweeney Todd. And Mark Ingestry! You? Yes, Sweeney Todd. Mark Ingestry, who, preserved from death by a miracle, returns to confound the guilty and to protect the innocent. <laughs> And that's how Sawini Todd, the notorious bloody murderer of Fleet Street, was brought to justice and finally hanged at Tyburn. Mark Ingestry recovered his pearls, laid them at his sweetheart's feet, and gained her parents' consent. And what do you think Mark Ingestry did besides? Tobias Rag, do you still want to follow the sea? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Ingersby. Then I shall buy you a commission in His Britannic Majesty's Navy. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersby. And furthermore... <laughs> Mr. Lupin, if you are agreeable, you shall perform the rites at our wedding. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersby. And furthermore... <laughs> Jarvis Williams, I'm going to buy you the biggest cart in London and outfit it with the best greens and taters money can buy. That seems to have silenced the you. Let me say it. A very bully for thee, Mark Industry. And furthermore... Hurrah! Throughout our married life, Joanna, my dear... Yes, Mark? I will never ask you to make a veal pie. Hurrah! Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. First produced at the Britannia Theatre, Hoxton, in 1842. Was written by George Dibden Pitt. And here adapted by Ronald Hamilton as item 16 of stage 47. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen. With an original musical score composed with tongue-in-cheek. And conducted by Lucio Agostini. Starred as Sweeney Todd, Maver Moore. With Lister Sinclair as the guide. John Draney as Tobias. Bud Knapp as Mr. Smith. Lloyd Bachner as Mark Ingestry, 
Frank Wade as Parmine. Jane Mallet as Mrs. Lovett. Tommy Tweed as Parson Lucan. Kathleen Kidd as Mrs. Oakley. Glenn Burns as Mr. Oakley. Arden Kay as Joanna. Bernard Braden as Jarvis Williams. And Alan King as Jonas Fogg. Fred Tudor made all the sinister sounds, and Bruce Armstrong did the technical operation. Afternoon Theatre. We present The Prince of Plunder, one of the many colorful stories written by the late Sidney Haller. This story of blackmail in West End society has been adapted for radio by Rex Renitz. The Prince of Plunder. <laughs> If I may have your attention, gentlemen. <coughs> Thank you. What I have to say won't take long. For some time now, the Commissioner and I have been worried about the increase of blackmail in this country. As the senior officers of Scotland Yard, you're the eyes and ears of the law, so you must be aware of it. A great number of men and women have paid dearly and are still paying in hard cash for their indiscretions of the past. Some have even been driven to take their own lives. Now, we know as a matter of cold statistics that particular forms of crime tend to come in waves, or in cycles, if you like. Hmm. It may well be that this is just another cycle, that the success of one blackmailer has perhaps encouraged other people to emulate him. Um. On the other hand, we have had a number of stories in the press lately suggesting the existence of a highly efficient organization controlled, so our Fleet Street friends would have us believe, by a person who calls himself... The Prince of Plunder. You can't believe the papers, sir. You know what those boys are like to Charles? Anything for a story? Plunder, it's a lead of rubbish. I've never heard a more unlikely story. Well, what do you think, Clavering? Hard to say, sir. Sounds a bit fantastic, I admit. Still, there might be something in it. Oh, no. Where's the evidence? Well, there's no actual evidence, perhaps, but I've handled three blackmail cases in the last 12 months. And they all seem to follow much the same pattern. Exactly. Inspector Clavering's put his finger right on the vital spot. There is a similar pattern, very similar in almost every case we've had lately. The victims have been prominent in the professions or business or society, and the information on which they've been blackmailed has come from stolen letters or documents. Yes. Mm-hmm. Indeed, there's a suggestion that servants are being paid large sums for material of this kind. Any proof of that, sir? Unfortunately, no. At the moment, it's only a theory, with nothing tangible at all. Uh, doesn't that bear out that it is one person, sir? Or at least one organization? How do you mean, Inspector? Well, sir, let's say there have been 20 cases. If there were 20 different blackmailers, surely at least two or three of them would have bungled the job and been nabbed. That's quite a point. As I say, gentlemen, we don't know. The Prince of Plunder may exist, or he may be a mere figment of journalistic imagination. But this current wave of blackmail does exist. And it's our job to do something about it. My job and yours, gentlemen. And the sooner it's checked and stopped, the better for all concerned. Hello? Is that you, Clavering? Morley here, Assistant Commissioner. Oh, yes, sir. I've been trying to get you for ten minutes. Uh, my wife and I have just gone back from the cinema, sir. Sorry to spoil your evening, but I have an urgent job for you. Heard of Charles Crandon? Uh, Wimpole Street surgeon. That's the man. He collapsed and died half an hour or so ago at a dinner party given by Lady Blanchard. 341 Curzon Street. Heart, sir? No, no, it's more serious than that, I believe. Sir Brown Fortingham of MI6 was a guest at the dinner. Oh, yes. It was he who rang me. He seems to think it was suicide. You'd better get over there right away. Oh, very good, sir. Wouldn't it happen to me? Now, Lady Blanchard, may I first have a list of your guests, please? Oh, yes, Inspector. Uh, we're only a small party. For Mr. Crandon, of course. Uh, yes. And then there's uh, Sir Brown Fordingham. Hello, Clavering. How do you do, sir? Oh, you, you know each other. Yes, yes, indeed. The Inspector and I are old friends. Oh, really? Uh, this is Sir Gilbert Mildmay. Sir Gilbert Mildmay. Address, please, sir? H. Winston Court. It's just off Belgrave Square. H. Winston Court. And your occupation, sir? I am an actor, sir. Oh, yes, of course. I thought the name was vaguely familiar. Well, rarely. Such is fame, Gilbert. May I have your name, sir? This is Sir Hector Panderville. Address, 231 Lowndes Square. And your occupation, sir? Occupation? Well, I suppose you better put me down as a dilettante. A what, sir? Dilettante. It means that I go through life doing nothing of importance very pleasantly. I like good food and good wine. I listen to good music and I collect beautiful things, particularly pictures. You must have heard of Sir Hector's collection of Cezanne. Uh... It's famous throughout the country. Oh, my dear Lady Blanchard, you exaggerate its importance. 
Is there any more you wish to know, Inspector? Not for the moment, sir. Hmm. And your name, sir? Clark Hungerford. Oh, you're an American, Mr. Hungerford. Yes, that's right. Diplomatic service. American Embassy, 1 Grosvenor Square. Been over here long? No, just a few months. I came on the staff of our new ambassador, Mr. Jameson Carew. Thank you. And you, if I'm not mistaken, sir, are Mr. Gerald Lester. You know me, Inspector. Only by sight. Twickenham, three years ago. England versus Wales. So, you're a rugger fan. Used to play a bit myself, sir. Years ago. I say, you're not the Clavering. Played forward for England, 19... Um... 35, sir. Well, you are. I'll be... Uh... <clears throat> Sorry, Lady Blanchard. Oh, uh, we must get together sometime, Inspector. We certainly must, sir. Uh, now, may I have your address? Uh, yes. 18 Tolbury Place, Piccadilly. Mm. And your occupation? Well, I, I'm afraid I uh, haven't one, really. You see, I gave into a legacy and I... Quite, sir. Uh, I'll put you down as gentleman. Oh, thank you, Inspector. <laughs> uh, and my last guest, Inspector, is this young lady, Miss Judith Farrell. Uh, your address, please, miss? 84 Beckwith Square, Kensington. Uh, do you want my occupation? Yes, please. I'm a fashion artist. Thank you. And that's the lot, is it, Lady Blanchard? Uh, yes. Well, now, Sir Brian, suppose you tell me exactly what happened. I think Miss Farrell was the one to do that. She was seated on Mr. Crandon's right. Well, Miss Farrell? There's not much to tell, really. Mr. Crandon and I were talking when the butler interrupted us and handed him a note. Just a small folded piece of paper, really. Uh, you'd better explain about that, Robert. Uh, yes, my lady. Uh, it was handed to me at the front door, sir, by a person. What sort of person? Well, sir, he was a sharp-looking character, a bit of a villain, I'd say. Had you ever seen him before? No, sir. Could he say anything to you? Oh, yes, sir. What? Uh, you want his exact words, sir? If you can remember them, yes. Uh, well, sir, he said, uh, you've got a guy in here called Crandon. And then he pushed the note into my hand and said, uh, give him this. It's urgent and it's personal, see? And then? But then he went, sir. Would you recognize him again? Oh, it was fairly dark, sir. But I've got a good memory for faces. I think I would. Good. So, you took the note straight to Mr. Crandon? Oh, immediately, sir. Thank you, Robert. Oh, right, sir. Right, well, let's get back to you now, Miss Farrell. Well, Mr. Crandon read the note and then slipped it into his pocket. Did he seem disturbed at all? Yes, very. I tried to pick up our conversation again, but he didn't seem to be listening. I turned away for a minute to speak to the person on my other side. Then I turned back just in time to see Mr. Crandon slip a tablet of some sort into his mouth. You actually saw him take something? Mm. You're quite sure? I can bear that out, Inspector. I was sitting right opposite. I saw it myself. Thank you, Mr. Lester. Yes, Miss Farrell? Two or three seconds later, he gave a sort of groan and slumped forward. Perhaps I can pick up the story from there. We thought at first he'd had a seizure of some kind. Three or four of us went to his assistance, but uh, he was dead when we got to him. I realized at once he'd been poisoned. Well, what made you think that, Sir Brian? There was a strong smell of almonds. Ah, oh, cyanide. Yes. So instead of calling a doctor who couldn't have helped anyhow, I rang your chief, Sir Charles Mulley. So that brings us up to date. Except for the note. Now, what happened to that? I took charge of it. Um, here you are. Well, thanks. You have until midnight to make up your mind. Sounds like a threat of some sort. My guess is blackmail. Well, quite agree with you, old man. I think I can tell you who. Indeed, Sir Gilbert? The Prince of Plunder. Oh, my dear fellow, don't be absurd. There's no such person. Well, nonsense, of course there is. Well, how do you know? A lot of melodramatic claptrap, if you ask me. Oh. Don't you agree, Inspector? Well, sir, oh, I... Oh, dear. I just thought the newspapers... I suppose there's no chance of hushing this up, is there, Inspector? I'm afraid not. It's oh. bound to come out of the inquest, if not before. Oh, dear. I don't want to be unkind, but if Mr. Crandon had to commit suicide, I do think he might have chosen elsewhere. It's, it's so inconsiderate. I know most of the press crowd, Lady Blanchard. I'll see if I can't persuade them to uh, play it down. Oh, thank you, Sir Brown. Well, now, I'm afraid I shall have to take formal statements from all of you. And uh, after that, sir, are we free to go? Certainly, Mr. Hungerford. Oh, thank you. Oh, Miss Farrell, uh, I've got my car outside. After the inspector's through, may I drive you home? Well... Oh, please. Uh, I was sort of hoping that... Well, oh, all right, then. Oh, thanks a million. I've hardly had a chance to talk to you all evening. Well, this is it, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Hungerford. Good night. Oh, you don't have to go right away, do you? Well, it's getting late. Can't we talk for just two minutes? What about? Well, you. 
I'm afraid I'm not very interesting. Well, I hope you'll forgive me if I dispute that. You know, I had you figured all wrong. Really? Yes, I, uh, I thought you were one of those social butterflies. Sorry if I disappointed you. Oh, on the contrary. I think every girl should have a career. It's hardly a career. I had to take up something when Father died. I had a bit of a flair for drawing. And so now you're a fashion artist. Of a sort. Lady Blanchard was telling me your father was in politics. A cabinet minister, no less. Yes. He was a better politician than a businessman, I'm afraid. That's why I'm a working girl. But why am I telling you all this? Why am I listening? <laughs> because we're going to be friends. Suppose you tell me about yourself for a change. Me? Yes. Well, I really am a dull character. Oh. Well, I, uh, I graduated in law at Harvard. Did a spell in the army. Got my discharge after I came out of hospital. Jameson Carew was an old family friend, and when he was appointed ambassador, he brought me along. Just for the trip, I guess. <laughs> I've been here three months. Oh, I think London's wonderful. And now I want to hear some more about you. <laughs> for instance, what do you do when you're not working? Oh, go to theaters and concerts when I can afford them. I suppose you've got lots of friends. Not that many. Family? Only Tom, my brother. He's in Sir Ronald Luke's department at the Foreign Office. Oh. Is he as nice as his sister? Oh, Tom's all right. He's a bit reckless, perhaps. How come? It's the crowd he's in with. They all seem to have more money than sense. Oh. And he, uh, he tries to keep up with them, huh? Yes. I've tried to tell him dozens of times that it won't work, but he won't listen. Yeah, brothers never do. I'd, uh... I'd like to meet him sometime. Perhaps if you were to talk to him. Yes, he'd tell me to go jump in the lake, and he'd be right. No, I I just thought we might get on together. I'm sure you would, Mr. Hungerford. The name is Clark. And yours is Judy, isn't it? Yes. And now I simply must go. Good night, Clark. Good night, Judy. Hello, fellow. Oh, hello, Lester. I didn't know you were here. I just dropped in for a few minutes on the way home. Matter of fact, I've been to dinner at Lady Blanchard's. Your sister was there. Judy? Oh, that must have been exciting. Yes, it was, but not quite in the way you mean. Huh? That surgeon fellow, Crandon, committed suicide in full view of everyone. What? And poisoned himself halfway through dinner. Why? Oh, the police didn't think it's blackmail. Excuse me, I must make my bet. Yes, of course. Number 16, I think. How's the luck? Oh, foul as usual. They're my last trips. Rien ne va plus. C'est tout, s'il vous plaît. Come on. Yeah. Numero 10. Numero 10. Well, that's that. Look, I, I hate to ask you, Lester. Yeah? Do you think you could oblige me with a small loan? Well, certainly, if you really want it. But it's no good pushing your luck when it's out, you know. Why don't you call it a night? Yes, but... Oh, oh, maybe you're right. Tell you what, I'm only a few minutes from here. Why not come up for a drink? I wouldn't be very good company, I'm afraid. Nonsense. I realize I've no right to say this, but you're in a bit of a spot, aren't you? Uh, I am rather. Yeah, I thought as much. It's just possible I may be able to help. Well, that's damn good of you, Lester. Well, hang it all, we're friends, aren't we? Come along. We'll talk it over. So you think it was blackmail, eh, Clavering? It certainly looks that way, Sir Charles. Well, no, I mean, and... Well, I've been checking on Crandon's past. It's not exactly the open book one would expect of a Wimpole Street surgeon. Of course, I've no actual proof of anything, but there were two or three incidents years ago... Knowledge and... of which could be dangerous in the wrong hands, eh? Exactly, sir. Any leads yet? None at all, sir. The note was on cheap paper, writing obviously disguised. Mm. How about the fellow who delivered it? I've already had the butler in going through the rogues gallery, sir. No luck so far. Well, stick at it anyway. I certainly will, sir. Excuse me. Mm. Hello? Assistant Commissioner? Yes, he's here. Uh, it's for you, sir. No, thanks. Morley here. Yes? Yes? I see. Very well. I'll send a man over right away. Goodbye. Didn't you say one of the dinner guests last night was a Miss Judith Farrell? Yes, sir. Daughter of Sir Michael Farrell, the politician? That's right, sir. Hmm. That was Bayswater police. They found her brother. Found him? In Hyde Park, with a bullet wound in his head and a revolver in his hand. Suicide? Looks like it. I wonder whether there could be any connection. Between this and Crandon, sir? Yes, maybe just a coincidence, of course. Probably, sir. 
Silver may be a link of some kind. Exactly. Sorry to push more work onto you, Clavering, when you're up to your eyes already, but I think you're the one who should investigate this. Very good, sir. I'll get onto it right away. It can't mean, Inspector. It can't. I'm sorry, Miss Fallon. There must be some mistake. I'm afraid not. It doesn't seem possible. Tom! No, no. Take it easy. I'm sorry. How did it happen? You'd better prepare yourself for another shock. I'm sorry to have to tell you your brother took his own life. But, but that's ridiculous. Tom wouldn't do a thing like that. I know he wouldn't. The evidence is quite clear. But... I'm sorry. If you say it's right, I suppose it must be. If it's any consolation, he didn't suffer at all. Why did he do it? Why? He was very heavily in debt, or didn't you know that? I realized he was probably living beyond his income... But I had no idea. I mean, surely for the sake of a few hundred pounds... It was considerably more than that, I'm afraid. About 3,000. 3,000? He'd been gambling rather heavily in a small club off Piccadilly, roulette mainly. How do you know all this? That's our job, Miss Fowler, to find out such things. Last night, your brother was at this club. He gave the proprietor, a Greek named Pirelli, an IOU for 50 pounds and lost the lot. Altogether, Pirelli holds his IOUs for just on 2,000. Was it in the club that, that it happened? No, no. Quite some time later. Your brother left the club with someone you know, Mr. Gerald Lester. Yes. He was at Lady Blanchard's last night. From there he went to the club where he met your brother, persuaded him not to play anymore and took him to his flat for a drink. He guessed your brother was in some sort of trouble and thought he might be able to help. That was good of him. Of course, he had no idea he was so deeply involved. When he learned how much it was... Tom told him. So it seems... Anyway, he realized there was nothing much he could do. He offered to lend your brother 500 pounds if he promised not to gamble again. But your brother wouldn't accept. In fact, Lester says he rather resented the offer. Knowing Tom, I imagine he would. I'm surprised he discussed his affairs at all. It's quite unlike him. You know how it is, Miss Farrell. Sometimes you've just got to get a thing off your chest. Mayhow, it did no good. He left Lester's flat about one o'clock. And after that? You can only guess his movements from then on. Somehow, he must have got hold of a revolver. The doctor thinks death took place about 3 a.m., so I imagine he probably walked in the park for a couple of hours and then decided the only way out was to end it all. Do you say he didn't suffer? What about the mental agony he must have gone through in those two hours? And all the misery over the past weeks and months? I know, Miss Farrell. It's an old story, of course, but always a tragic one. Believe me, I can't tell you how sorry I am. Thank you, Inspector. Do I have to identify him or anything like that? Mr. Lester's already done that. I'm sure the coroner will accept his identification. The coroner? Of course. There'll have to be an inquest, won't there? Yes, it's fixed for tomorrow morning. There may be no need to call you, but I'm afraid we shall want you there in case. All right, Inspector. I understand. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, have you agreed upon a verdict? Uh, yes, sir, we have. In view of all the circumstances, there seems no doubt that the financial position of the deceased preyed upon him to such an extent as to render him temporarily of unsound mind. And we find that he took his own life while in this state. Thank you, members of the jury. I'm bound to add that in my opinion, you have given the only possible verdict. Ah, there you are, Miss Farrell. Can I drop you anywhere? Oh, good of you to offer, Mr. Lester, but... No, no, please. My time is my own. It's no trouble. Well, in that case, thank you. Splendid. Now, where to? I think I may as well go back to work. Where's that? Buckland Smart, Regent Street. You wouldn't perhaps care to have a spot of lunch first? If you don't mind. All right, I quite understand. Buckner on Smart it is. Um, <clears throat> Miss Farrell, um, I'm sure you don't want me to make all the conventional noises of sympathy, but uh, may I just say one thing? Of course. Tom was my friend. I did try to help him. I know that, and I'm grateful. I'd like to think of you as my friend, too. So if there's anything I can do at any time, any little thing at all, 
please don't hesitate to say the word. Thank you. And having got that off my chest, let's say no more about it. It's just past the next light. Ah, I see there. That's it. May I give a final word of advice? Of course. I hope this doesn't sound too pompous, but don't brood. It'll do no good, you know. I'll try not to. The way I see it, a man has the right to do what he likes with his own life. And if Tom decided the only solution was, uh, well, you uh, see my point? Yes. Except, of course, that I don't believe for a minute he did commit suicide. What? But, but surely the coroner... The coroner didn't know Tom. I did. Uh, even so, the evidence... I realized he was in a jam, but he'd have stuck it out somehow. Whatever else he may have been, he wasn't a car. I understand how you feel, but if you'd seen him when he left my flat, he was really desperate. All the same, he didn't take his own life. I'm convinced of it. But then, forgive me asking, how did he die? I believe he was murdered. Murdered? Uh, by whom? I don't know. For what reason, then? I don't know that, either. But I'm going to find out if it takes the rest of my life. Hello, Betty. Judy, what on earth are you doing here? I work here, remember? Ah, oh, look, my dear, I know I'm a slave driver, but what, surely you could take a couple of days off? I'd rather be working than moping in the flat. Oh, you could, you could go to a cinema or, or have your hair done or something. It would take your mind off things. I'd be all right, really. Well... It's up to you, my dear. But if you're determined, you you might as well start with the Vanya Dean assignment. The actress, you mean? Well, that's how she's officially described. Don't tell me she's descended to buckle and smart. What have we got that Dior hasn't? A credit account, dear. <laughs> she's been resting these last three months. And I shouldn't imagine she'd get much out of that current boyfriend of hers, Ronnie Luke. Sir Ronald Luke? He was Tom's chief. You don't mean that he and Miss Oh, Dean. darling, everyone knows. Can't be for his money. It's probably all he can do to pay his alimony. I'm reluctantly forced to conclude it must be love. Anyway, it's no business of ours. What's this assignment you mentioned? She's condescended to give us a trial. She wants something for formal evening where I thought, um, perhaps that slinky black thing you sketched the other day. You mean that chiffon cocoon? Yeah, with the waist-level neckline, yes. <laughs> It's up to you to convince her it's just what she's been looking for. Do you want me to see her? Yes, at her flat, 2.30. What's the address? Um, 87 Selwood Square. Mm. And if you do sell it to her, my dear, you're on a bonus. I do the best I can. Good. I knew you would. How do you feel, Judy? Oh, I'm all right. Bit numb still? Bit. No hitches at the inquest? No. Everything went according to plan. Oh, well, that's a relief anyway. Was he there? Was who there? Oh, that American you met the other night. Uh, the one you thought so nice. Clark, what's his name? Of course he wasn't. Why should he be? Well, if I were in his shoes, I know I'd have been. After all that talk about let's be friends and so on. You don't think I believed all that, do you? Well, the way you spoke, I, I did sort of get that idea. He's probably even forgotten my name by now. Disillusioned all of a sudden, aren't we? Oh, Betty. Anyway, he might not even know about Tom and me. It was only a small paragraph in the paper. Mm. Determined to find an excuse for him, aren't you? I'm trying to be fair, that's all. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd rather not discuss him anymore. Oh, okay, my dear. Anything you say. Hello. Oh, Mr. Hungerford, there's a gentleman asking for you, a Mr. Brook. Not George Brook. Yes, sir. Well, send him in right away. Yes, sir. George, you old son of a gun. Hello, Clark. Of all the people in the world, I, I've been looking for you ever since I got to London. I've been away. I figured you must be dead or something. Gosh, how long has it been, George? Oh, it must be nearly three years. Yes, yes, I guess it must be. How long have you been in England? I got in this morning. And you came to see me right away? <laughs> I just had a yen to gaze on that ugly mug of yours again <laughs> for five minutes. How's the embassy job going? Oh, fine. Quite the big diplomat now, eh? Well, I'm learning as I go along. <laughs> well, what about you, George? Back in City Street? In a way. How do you mean? The military administration? Not exactly. Okay, if it's some sort of secret. Well, between ourselves, and I mean between ourselves, yeah. I'm a sort of cloak and dagger boy. Secret service? Something like that. Boy, do you have all the luck. And here's me wearing striped pants and going to garden parties. What do you do? 
Oh, we managed to fill in time. At the moment, I'm looking for a man. Who? I don't quite know. I think his name's Lurt. Oh, what do you want him for? Murder. Oh, I thought that was for the cops. No, no, not this kind. It was one of our own fellows. A chap named Gapacre. Ah, sort of private and personal, huh? Very. He got on the trail of some racketeers who were buying stuff in a big way. Steel and alloys and so on. And smuggling it behind the Iron Curtain through dummy companies in Switzerland. Yes, I heard that kind of thing was going on. Anyway... Gatacre disappeared, and a day or so later, his body was washed up on the rocks near Antibes. And you figure the guy who did it is here in England? Yes. Well, let's hope you find him. Say, George, now, this calls for a drink. Let's go. I don't think I'll have the time. Oh, nonsense. Listen, I'm an honorary member of a club just around the corner. All the best people. It'll only take five minutes. Well, just the one, then. I really am in a hurry. I have an appointment with my chief, Fordingham, in uh, half an hour. Oh, Fordingham, eh? He's a nice guy. I met him the other night at a dinner party. Oh? Huh? Well, let's get going, shall we? Just one more drink, George. No, no, really. I must fly. Well, okay. I'll finish this and walk no along. No need for you to rush away, too. I'll find my own way out. Hey, wait a minute. I don't even have your address or phone number yet. I'll give you a ring in a day or so, I promise. Goodbye. Well, goodbye for now. And don't you forget... Be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> Lost in port, Mr. Hungerford. Oh, hello, Sir Gilbert. Hello, Mr. Hungerford. Uh, you remember Sir Hector Pandeville, of course. Oh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, how do you do, sir? Gilbert has a theory that no man should drink alone. Bad for the soul, he says, not to mention the morale. <laughs> do you mind if we join you? Oh, not at all, sir. Uh, may I order for you? No, 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 no. We already have our drinks. Well, you've quite got over that extremely nasty experience of the other night, I trust. Oh, sure. Lady Blanchard was right, you know. It really was most inconsiderate of Crandon. Well, I guess he must have been so scared stiff over that note he didn't stop to think of anything. Gilbert still insists it was sent by our mythical friend, the Prince of Plunder, of course. Now listen to me, old boy. My dear fellow, must we start that all over again? You still say it's a lot of melodramatic nonsense, eh? I do, yes. Then what have you to say to this? A month from now, I shall be the Prince of Plunder. <laughs> you? Oh, really, Gilbert? Oh, on the stage, of course. Oh, he won't actually be called the Prince of Plunder, but the same sort of character, you know, Master Blackmailer and so on. Well, far be it for me to teach you your business, Gilbert, but are you being wise? Daddy Hector, I've been in the theatre 35 years. I should know a good part when I see one. You always take a perverse delight in missing my point. I'm simply saying that you built your reputation on sympathetic crows. An actor must be versatile, my dear boy. <laughs> Think of all the great ones. Garrick, Keane, Irving. Uh, anyhow, this part is sympathetic. A blackmailer, really, my dear fellow. Uh, to the last minutes, at any rate. Well-known social figure, wealthy bachelor, hordes of friends and so on. Without wishing to be immodest, that seems a fair description of myself. I trust he isn't by any chance also an art collector. No, here's the wonderful payoff, old boy. He's an actor. What? Well, Dammy, a successful blackmailer would need to be a pretty good actor, wouldn't he? Well, it's a point, of course, but... I'm um... telling you, it's the best part I've had for years. It'll put me right back on top. Well, you know your own business best, I suppose. Oh, by the way, Mr. Hungerford. Yes? You remember meeting a Miss Farrell at Lady Blanchard's, I dare say? I certainly do. Unfortunate about that brother of hers, wasn't it? What was that, sir? Oh, my dear boy, haven't you heard... No, not a thing. Uh, I knew she had a brother, of course. Tragic but... business. He committed suicide. Shot himself. Are you sure, sir? Well, of course it was in all the newspapers. I didn't see it. Oh, just a paragraph. I, I think the inquest was this morning. Gosh, poor kid. I. Well, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'd like to go and phone her right away. Hello? I'd like to talk with Miss Farrell, please. I'm sorry, she's not here at the moment. Do you have her home number? Well, you won't get her there either. She had a business appointment. Uh, when will she be back? I'm afraid I couldn't say. But I've got to see her. It's urgent. Well, if you'd like to leave your name, I'll tell her you rang. Oh, yes, do that, please. Uh, my name's Clark Hungerford. Tell her I'll be at the American Embassy, and will she call me as soon as she comes in? Uh, you won't forget? Of course not. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Well, well. Perhaps he didn't know after all. 
So you think with the waistline altered, it really would suit me? I'm sure it would. You're not just selling me a line, I hope. I'm not a sales girl, Miss Dean. I'm a designer. Ah, and that puts me right in my place, doesn't it? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean... But forget it. All right, I'll take your word. Tell Miss Sloan to book the order. Thank you. And tell her if it doesn't turn out like the sketch, I'll tear it into little shreds. I'll tell her. Thank you, Miss Dean. Uh, do you have to go yet? I get so bored by myself all day. Wouldn't you like a cup of tea or a drink or something? I'm sorry. I'm expected at the office. If there's anything else you want at any time, you will get in touch, won't you? I don't even know your name yet. You mean my... Aren't you Tom's sister? He showed me a picture of you one night. You... You my brother? Of course. He was on Ronnie's staff. Uh, Sir Ronald Luke, I mean. That's how we met. Did you know him well? Not as well as I'd have liked. Ronnie took a poor view of it. You know what men are. Didn't he ever mention me to you? We... We didn't see each other very much. Poor Tommy. When I read about it in the paper, I... But I mustn't talk about it. It must have been a frightful shock. I've got over the worst of it now. I wonder what really happened. How do you mean? Would you really believe he was the kind of person who commits suicide just because of a few little gambling debts? No, I don't. Nor do I. Whatever it was, it was something a lot more serious than that. And if you ask me, Gerald Lester could supply the answer if he chose. Mr. Lester? You know Gerald, don't you? Yes, of course. But you can't mean... No, I'm not suggesting he was personally involved or anything like that. But I think Tom told him the real reason, and he's keeping quiet about it. But why should he? To save a scandal, perhaps? Protect someone's name? It hasn't occurred to you, for instance, that Tom was being blackmailed by somebody? Blackmailed? Look... If you know anything, why don't you say it instead of just dropping hints like this? I'm sorry. Now I have upset of you. Of course you've upset me. What do you know about Tom? Nothing, my dear. I was just theorizing, that's all. But all the same, if I were you, I'd have a long talk with Gerald Lester at the first opportunity. Would you like a liqueur, Judy? No, thank you. It, uh... <laughs> It is all right to call you Judy, I hope. Yes, of course. Mm. So you think I didn't tell the police or the coroner the whole truth about my talk with Tom? I can't help feeling there must have been something else. You still think he was murdered? Yes. Well, perhaps you're right. Then you do know something. Not exactly, but... Oh, uh, good evening, Hungerford. Good evening. Hello, Miss Farrell. Good evening. I hope I'm not butting in, but I saw you across the room and thought I'd step over for a moment. Uh, uh have a drink? Oh, no, thanks. I can't stay. I'm dining with Mr. Carew. Oh. Uh, Miss Farrell, I called you up today, but you weren't in. Really? I got no message. Didn't you? I, uh, I left one. I just wanted to say... Well, you see, I just heard about your brother. I'm terribly sorry. Thank you. If there's anything I can do any time, you will let me know, won't you? Of course. Well, I guess I'd better be getting back to my table now. Good night. Good night. Hmm. Nice fellow, Hungerford. Yes, I suppose so. You were saying about hmm? Tom. Oh, oh, yes. I received a rather strange letter this afternoon. Oh, dash, I left it at my flat. What sort of letter? It was anonymous. I can't remember the exact wording, but it said that if I wished to know the secret of Tom's death, I should advertise in the personal column of the Times next Monday, fixing an appointment to meet a person called the Watchman. What an extraordinary thing. Hmm. But why pick on you? Well, I suppose it's because Tom and I were friends. Would you like to see the letter? I would, rather. Let's finish our coffee, then. We'll go to the flat. That's strange. I left it here in this bureau. I'm sure I did. Perhaps it's in one of the drawers. I don't think so, but we'll soon see. No. Not there. Hey, Moss. There must be someone about. You called, sir? That letter I got this afternoon. The one delivered by hand, sir? Yes, I left it here on the bureau. Have you moved it? No, sir. Has anyone been here since I left? Well, only the man to inspect the telephone, sir. Uh, inspect the telephone? What was wrong with it? Well, I don't know. He said there'd been a complaint. Well, certainly not from me. Was he alone in this room at all? Well, yes, sir. For a few minutes. Thank you, Amos. Well, you don't think, sir, that... All right, I... Amos. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Hmm. You think someone came here to steal the letter? <laughs> that seems fairly obvious. You mean... I mean, the man who wrote the letter and I won't be the only ones who'll turn up. There'll be a third person. Someone who's determined I shan't learn the truth about Tom. In that case, you'd better not make the appointment. Why not? 
I shouldn't want you to run any risks on my account. It wouldn't be fair. Fair? Oh, I'd do anything for you, Judy. Anything at all. That's very kind of you, but... Don't you realize that I'm trying to tell you? Don't turn away, Judy. Please, I, I've got to say this. I know it's neither the right time nor the right place, but when I first met you... Oh, there's the doorbell. Oh, never mind about that. Now, please listen to me, Julia. <laughs> I'm so head over heels in love that I can't... You mustn't. Please, let me go. Be kind to me, Judy. Please. Hey, what goes on here? Clark! What the devil are you doing here? This happens to be my flat. And this young lady you've been mauling around happens to be a friend of mine. Get out, or I'll throw you out, brother. You ask for it. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Come on, Judy, let's beat it. I hope you realize... Look, are you going to go quietly, or do I have to carry you, you out? absolutely no right. Okay, let's go. Put me down! Put me down! Yeah, yeah, put me down! Well, the point is, Sir Brian, that if... Uh, excuse me, Brooke. Forwarding him here. No, no, I'm engaged at the moment. I can't talk to anyone. I'll ask him to ring me again in ten minutes, will you? Right. Oh, sorry about that. And now, Brooke, you were saying... I was saying I saw Lurtz last night. You did? I think it was Lutz. He sprang out from a doorway and tried to knife me. We had a bit of a scuffle, then he landed me one on the jaw and ran for it. Oh. Did you get a good look at him? That's the trouble. It was dark. I'm uh, pretty certain it was him. So, you were right about his being in London. And about him killing Gataker. Oh, how do you make that out? He must know I'm after him. And he must know why. Otherwise, why would he try to murder me? Uh, that's a reasonable thesis, but it's still not proof, you know. Oh, I'll get proof all right as soon as I can lay my hands on him. <laughs> Need any assistance? Uh, no, thanks. This is personal. Yes, I see your point. Well, anything else you want to discuss while you're here? Uh, just one thing, Sir Brian. Yes? Apart from you and myself, who else knew Gatteger was on this mission? No one. Well, that's to say no one but uh, the PM and uh, Sir Ronald Luke. Luke, eh? Yes, the whole inquiry originated through him. At least uh, through his department. I've been hearing one or two stories about Sir Ronald. Oh. Uh, How long has this affair of his been going on with that actress, Varnia Dean? About seven or eight months, I believe. Anything known about Miss Dean? What do you mean, departmentally? Yes. Good Lord, no. Ever had her investigated? Certainly not. It uh, might be worthwhile, you know. Hmm? Why? Well, it can hardly be Luke's appearance that attracts her. It certainly isn't his money. And seven or eight months is quite a long time. Yes, Miss Dean? Yes? Yes, we'll send them round. Thank you very much. Goodbye. You've done it, Judy. Hmm? She's not only taken the black dress, but she wants us to prepare sketches of three others. Well, you might try to look a little pleased about it. Sorry. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Oh, come on, darling. What would you think if you were... Well, if you were with someone and someone else burst in and knocked him down and then fly you over his shoulder as though you were a sack and carried you out? <laughs> Is that what happened? Now, I've never been so humiliated in my life. <laughs> it's a good sign when they're prepared to fight for you. It shows they mean business. But he lied to me, too. He said he tried to get in touch with me yesterday. Well, so he did. <gasps> oh, didn't I tell you? No. It was while you were at Vanya Dean's. Oh, I must have forgotten. Oh, Betty, how could oh, you? I'm sorry, now darling. Now you've ruined everything. Oh, baloney. All you've got to do is ring him up and tell him. Oh, I couldn't. What's his number? I don't know. Well, we'll soon find American Embassy. It must be in the book. Hello, this is Clark Hungerford. It's Judy speaking. Judy. Apologize for last night. Apologize? Well, what for? I behaved rather badly. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I was the guy who behaved badly. No, it was my fault. You see, I was hurt that I hadn't... I did call you up. Honestly, I did, Judy. I know. The person who took the message forgot to tell me. I've only just found out. Oh, you must think I'm terrible. No, I don't. I think you're... Well, I think you're okay. Then is it all right? Of course. About hitting Lester on the chin, I mean have to make your peace with him about that part of it. Sure, I'll do that. I'll phone him right away. Oh, and, uh, Judy? Yes? What are we going to do tonight? Well, I... Uh, you are free, I hope. Yes. Okay, how about dinner someplace and then maybe a theater? That sounds wonderful. Right. Be ready at seven. I'll be there on the dot. Bye now. Shall I answer it, madame? Yes, please, Marie. And if it's Sir Ronald Luke, I'm not in. But, madame... In fact, from now on, that's the general instruction. I don't want to talk to him or see him again. If you will pass them the liberty. Have you quarreled with him, madame? No. 
I'm just sick to death of him and his nasty, niggling, narrow little mind, that's all. See who that is? Yes, madame. This is Miss Dean's apartment. I wish to speak to Miss Dean, please. Who is it, please? Just tell her, an old friend. One moment, please. I will see if she is available. It's a man, madame. He will not give a name. He says he is an old friend. It's not Sir Ronald, is it? Oh, no, madame. A different voice altogether. Tell him I... Oh, all right, I'll speak. Yes, madame. Hello, this is Vanya Dean. How do you do, Miss Dean? Who's that speaking? You wouldn't know me. They call me the Prince of Plunder. What? Is this some stupid joke? I never joke. Then you must be mad. There's no such person as the Prince of Plunder. No. Of course there isn't. It's all newspaper talk. A friend of mine told me only the other A night... A friend? You refer to Sir Ronald, perhaps? I'm not going to waste any more time. I think you will, Miss Dean. Do you remember a certain John Wickham? What? According to my records, John Wickham was hanged 15 years ago for murder. His wife, it seems, was jointly charged. Uh, just a minute, please. You may go, Marie. Yes, madame. And close the door. Yes, madame. That was my maid. I, I didn't of want... Of course not. I quite understand. I was saying that Wickham's wife was jointly charged with murder, but rather quixotically, perhaps, he took all the blame, and she was acquitted. Of course, she was only young then, barely 18. I wonder how many people realize that Martha Wickham, who let her husband hang to save her own skin, is today... <laughs> is today the famous actress. I, I know the evidence was against me until John spoke, but I had nothing to do with it. You've got to believe me. Of course me. I believe you, but would others, do you think, your friends and management for whom you work, your public... Oh, I should if I know. I might find it necessary to make known the facts in the public interest, you understand. Unless, of course... What do you want? Money... You may as well know at once. I haven't any. Your money doesn't interest me in the least. What do you want, then? A small service. What? You are friendly, shall we say, with Sir Ronald Look of the Foreign Office. I was, you mean. When did you break with him? Well, I haven't actually yet, but... Splendid. Then he still believes you are in love with him. Well, I think even anyone as stupid as Ronnie must guess I've been cooling off lately. It will be your job, Miss Dean, to correct any such false impression. But... Now, listen. Today, look, received a confidential report from MI6 regarding certain companies registered in Switzerland and trading with countries in Eastern Europe. I want that report. You mean I... It's Luke's custom to study reports of this nature at night in his lap. All you have to do is to find out whether he's done so with this particular report, and if so, where he keeps it. What could be simpler? Suppose he won't tell me. That's up to you. I'll phone you again tomorrow. I'll do the best I can. I'm sure you will, Miss Dean. Goodbye. Hello? Hello? Marie? Oh, damn the girl. Marie! Yes, madame? Get me a drink and make it strong. Yes, madame. Shall I see you with you? Oh, never mind, I'll answer it. Hello? Is that you, Vanya? Oh, Ronnie, darling. I've been hoping you'd ring. I, I feel as though I haven't seen you for ages. Well, Judy, this looks like good night. Thanks for a lovely evening, Clark. Oh, listen to who's thanking who. This has been the most wonderful night of my life. Nonsense. No, no, I mean it, honestly. Judy, I, uh... Yes? Hmm? Well, there's something I, uh... What are we going to do tomorrow night? Tomorrow night? Mm. Well, I'm sore. Well, I am going to see you, aren't I? I mean, you don't have another engagement. Well, no. Oh, that's fine. Same time? You're sure you want to? Of course I'm sure. Hold everything. I've mm -hmm. got a better idea still. Tomorrow's Saturday. Mm -hmm. You don't work Saturday afternoons, do you? No. Then let's take a run out someplace into the country. We can find a little pub somewhere and have oh, a meal. Oh, I'm afraid I can't. I have an appointment at half past five. Half past five. Can't you put it off or something? No, it's important. I'm to call on Sir Ronald Luke. 
The foreign office guy? Yes. He was my brother's chief, as you know. Tom's job was only a minor one, but all the same, it brought him in touch with things that were of a confidential nature. Yeah. And I have an idea that this might have had something to do with his murder. So you still believe he was murdered? More than ever, after talking to Gerald Lester, and after that letter he got. You're quite sure there was a letter? Of course. Why should he invent such a thing? Oh, maybe he thought it was better than come up and see my etchings. Isn't that just a little unfair to him? Uh, nothing could be unfair to that wolf in a sheep's clothing. <laughs> Why do you laugh? I was just remembering the way you looked when you burst into the flat. Poor Mr. Lester. He didn't really deserve it, you know. Well, I guess not. But I did call him up this afternoon and apologize. <laughs> that was sweet of you, Clark. How did he take it? Oh, like an English gentleman. <laughs> but I still say he's a wolf at heart, though. Anyway, don't let's talk any more about that. Uh, you were saying about Luke? I thought he might be able to give me some clue about Tom. So I wrote asking if I could see him. I got a note back this afternoon asking me to call at his flat tomorrow. 5.30, you say? Yes. Well, uh, how long do you expect you'll be with him? Oh, it shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Well, how about if I pick you up there at, say, uh, 20 to 6? Mm. We'll have a drink at Tony's bar... And then decide what we're going to do. Is that a date? It's a date. Good night, Clark. Good night, Judy. You're very quiet tonight, darling. Am I? Have another drink. No, thanks. Come on, tell me what's wrong. Nothing. Well, there is. I, I, I don't like to see you like this. It, it worries me. Well, if you must know, Ronnie, I've been thinking about us. Us? How do you mean? Wondering how much longer it's going to last. You're not getting tired of me? Of course not, darling. Oh, you frightened me for a minute. I wish I could be as sure you're not getting tired of me. My dear Vanya, don't talk such nonsense. Is it nonsense, Ronnie? You know it is. You do love me, don't you? Well, haven't I proved it over and over again? Please, Vanya, I hate to see you like this. I'm sorry, darling, but for all we've been to each other, I just can't help feeling I mean very little to you, really. Oh. That I'm no more than a very small part of your life. But that, that, that's quite untrue. You mean everything to me. It's sweet of you to say it, Ronnie, but how can I? I have to share you. What do you mean? Well, your wife, for instance. But you know I've asked Celia three times for a divorce. Uh, your friend. But, darling, I've already explained... Oh, I but... know, in your position you have to be discreet. I realize that things are, we can't be seen together, and I can't share your friends. Even your work is so secret, you can't discuss it with me. Yes, well, I... I bet before you and Celia parted, you used to talk it all over together. Husbands and wives always do. But I'm not your wife, and so... Do you realize, Ronnie, that all the time we've been with each other, you've never told me a thing about your work? Well, you know, darling, it, it, it is rather confidential. And you don't trust me, is that it? No, of course not. I trust you implicitly. Well, what is it, then? Well, you see, I'm bound by oath not to talk about it to anyone. Oh, well, that amounts to much the same thing, doesn't it? Please, Vanya, you seem determined to misunderstand. Well, you can hardly blame me, can you? I think it's time I went. No, 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 but please, don't... don't. Oh, what can I say to prove to you that... Does it matter? Of course it matters. You, you want proof. Very well. You shall have it. Look. Oh, is that where you keep your safe? Behind the bookcase? I always knew you must have one, of course, but even that was secret. You see what I mean? Yes, of course I do. Now, look, I'll I show you whether I trust you or not. This is where I keep documents I bring home to study. See? You, you, you can look at them if you like. No, really, darling, I didn't How mean... about this one? Hmm? Top secret. There are only two other copies of this report. The Prime Minister has one, the Foreign Secretary the other. It concerns the smuggling of vital raw materials to countries behind the Iron Curtain. Men have died so that this might be compiled. Go on, go on, read it. Read it? Yes. But it would take me hours and hours, and I wouldn't know what it was about. Uh, you anyway. said I didn't trust you. Oh, but Ronnie, I am dear. proving I do. You do believe me now, I hope. Oh, darling, of course I do. Please, put it away. You, you're sure you don't want to read it? Quite sure. Very well. I'll put it back. There. I'm, I'm sorry, Ronnie. It was beastly of me to go on like that. Oh, that's all right. <clears throat> Let's uh, have another drink, shall we? I really should be going. 
Who on earth could that be at this hour? You're not expecting anyone. At midnight? Good Lord, no. Why doesn't your man answer it? Oh, it's his evening off. Well, you, you better go then, haven't you? Uh, yes, listen, Vanya, don't misunderstand me, please, but it might be... Well, it might be embarrassing if you were to be found here. Is there any other way out? No, you'll have to go into the bedroom. I may be there for hours. Well, I'll get rid of whoever it is as quickly as I can. Please, darling, be a good girl. Well, all right. <sighs> all right, Hal, all right. I'm coming. Oh, it's you, boarding. Good evening, Luke. Sorry to trouble you at this late hour, but uh, may I come in? Well, yes, I suppose, sir. Thank you. Are you alone? Yes. Quite sure. What do you mean? Oh! Oh, the glasses. Yes. I, uh, I had a friend in earlier on. I haven't cleared up yet. Miss uh, Dean, perhaps. <clears throat> now, look here, Fording. I'm sorry to be so blunt. You know my job, Luke. You know, there are times when I have unpleasant duties to perform. Uh, this is one of them, I'm afraid. I, I don't understand. I think you do. As a general rule, a man's private life belongs to himself. And we've known for a long time of this uh, liaison between you and Miss Dean. But uh, we've had certain inquiries made, Luke. What sort of inquiries? Into Vanya Dean's background. I'm sorry if this hurts your feelings, but do you think it wise for the man in your highly responsible position... A man with access to vital secrets. Get out of here. Oh, for heaven's sake, Luke, don't be a complete fool. Get out, I said. So that's your answer? Yes. Very well. But don't say you weren't warned. Now don't bother. I'll let my stuff out. Damn secret service types. All the same. Well, that's just about the limit. Huh? Practically accused me of being a spy. Now, Vanya, wait a minute. Well, that's what it amounts to, doesn't it? You might at least have defended me. But, but I did. I, I always knew you were spying. Oh, Vanya. How could you have stood there and let him say those dreadful things? Oh. This is the end, Ronnie. Oh, Vanya, please. No, no, wait, please. Wait, wait. Listen good to night. me. Good night. Oh, Vanya. And goodbye. Oh, Vanya. Hello, this is Miss Dean's appartement. Can I speak to Miss Dean, please? Who is speaking? Never mind, she'll know. Yes, sir. It's a gentleman, madame. The same one as yesterday, I think. Thank you, Marie. There's no need for you to stay. Very well, madame. Hello. Well, Miss Dean? The report in a war safe in his sitting room, hidden behind a bookcase. To get at it, you have to pick out a book called Green's History of England. Splendid. You've done very well, Miss Dean. Have I your word that you won't bother me again? Certainly. Except for one small final service. What's that? The flat must be empty when our man enters it tonight. We shall rely upon you to arrange that, please. But I... I can't. Why not? After I'd learned about the report, Sir Ronald and I quarreled. I told him I never wanted to see him again. Uh, that's unfortunate. You'll have to find some way to patch it up, I'm afraid. But I couldn't. I mean, after all the things I said... A clever and beautiful woman can do anything when she tries. That's all very well. You will make sure that the flat is empty at 11 o'clock tonight. How you do it is your own concern. Goodbye, Miss Dean. Good afternoon, Sir Ronald. You are Miss Farrell, I take it? Yes. Uh, come in, please. Thank you. It was kind of you to agree to see me. I doubt if it will serve any good purpose. <clears throat> However, you mentioned in your letter that you wish to discuss certain aspects of your brother's death. Yes. Yes, well, I'm afraid I know no more than the bare fact that he committed suicide in Hyde Park. I believe he was murdered. But surely the, the gun was in his hand. It could have been put there by whoever killed him. But if it wasn't suicide, who did kill him? And why? That's what I'm trying to find out, Sir Ronald. 
That's why I'm here. My dear young lady, I've already... Perhaps told Tom's you. murder had something to do with his work in the Foreign Office. Oh, really, Miss Farrell? Somebody may have tried to force him to reveal secret information, and when That's he quite refused... impossible. Your brother at no time had access to our secret files, or even to our confidential files. He was a very junior employee. I know that. You but... have my assurance that nothing like that could have happened. Well, if you say so. You knew Tom well, Sir Ronald. Did he ever mention to you that he was in trouble of any sort? Apart from financial trouble, I mean. I make it a rule never to discuss personal affairs with my staff. Then you can't help me at all. I'm afraid not. I must apologize for having wasted your time. Not at all. Goodbye, Miss Farrell. Goodbye, Sir Ronald. Hello there. Hello, Clark. Well, it's just as well I arrived early. You couldn't have been in there more than a couple of minutes. I wasn't. Yes. And if I'm any judge, you didn't have much success. No. Well, what did he say? He simply ridiculed the whole idea in a few well-chosen words and showed me the door. Yeah, he would. Oh, anyway, the heck with him. Ah, now I see why he was so anxious to get rid of me. Huh? All that blonde just going into the building, you mean? Yes. It's Fanny Adeem, the actress. Ah. They're supposed to be close friends. <laughs> Very attractive, don't you think? Mm, not my type. What is your type? Well, maybe I'll tell you a little later. <laughs> well, let's get into the car and go. Tony's bar, first stop. Ronnie, I'm sorry. Really, I am. I behaved stupidly last night. I said things I shouldn't have. You certainly did. It was just that, well, hearing that man say all those dreadful things about me, I lost my temper. I'm sorry, darling. It's too late, Vanya. Too late? You were right. We're through. But I'm trying to tell you. I didn't mean that. Perhaps not. But I do. Ronnie, I thought we might drive down to the coast, have dinner it's somewhere. It's no good, I've had all day to think it over. And shall I tell you what conclusion I've reached? That Fordingham was right. You can't mean... You can't possibly believe that I'm a spy. That wasn't his word, you know. It was your own. But he practically said... Oh, no, he said no such thing. What was it, Vanya? A guilty conscience? I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. That sudden interest in my work after all this time. Oh, very clever, my dear. And like a fool, I fell for it. Oh, please, Ronnie, you mustn't say things like that. But it's true, isn't it? Isn't it? And tonight we're going to drive down to the coast. Empty flat, report in safe. I see it all now. You are a spy, or as near as makes no difference. It's not so, I swear it. Well, we'll soon see about that. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Ring Fordingham, of course. Let him decide. Oh, Ronnie, please. Ronnie... Uh, excuse me, Brooke. Hello. Matthew Fordingham. Yes. This is Ronald Luke. I'm speaking from my flat. Can you possibly come over here at once? Yes, I dare say. But uh, what did you want to speak about? That matter we were discussing last night. Oh, yes. I think you should know that... Uh... Hello. Hello. Are you there, Luke? Hello. What's the matter? Something's happened to Luke. He's either had a seizure of some kind or... What? I don't know. Come on. Let's get over there at once. Open the door! I'll have to break down the door. All right, ready. Now! Once again, now! That's it. Luke, Luke, where are you? There he is. Good God. Is he dead? Yes. Looks like compound fracture of the skull. Yes, is he dead? It's paperweight, I imagine. I shouldn't touch him if I were you. No, I won't. Now, have a look around. See if you can find any evidence of who's been here. Okay. How about the police? I... I don't know. They'll have to be told. Yes, yes, I suppose so. All the same, we don't want this to get into the newspapers. I've got it. Clavering. Most discreet man at the yard. I'll ring him now. I say, look at these. Huh? A letter from a Judith Farrell asking for an appointment. Judith Farrell? She was at that dinner party at Lady Blanchard's. Anything else? And this. It's a note in Luke's diary for today. Miss Farrell, 5.30. You surely don't think... Well, it was only a quarter of an hour later that Luke was knocked on the head. Yes, but... Hello? Uh, put me on to Detective Inspector Clavering, please. 
Senior Hungerford, what can I get for you in the senior arena, please? Champagne cocktails, Tony, and make them good. Si, Signore. Very good. Champagne? Are we celebrating something? I hope so. Can't be Independence Day, I know that much. No, it's not. Perhaps it's your birthday. No. What is it, then? Well, I, uh... Well, look, Judy, uh, how long have we known each other now? Just under a week. Well, is that all? It seems a lot longer. I'm not at all sure you're being complimentary. Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean it that way. I meant, well, uh... Well, for so short a time, we've gotten to know each other pretty well, don't you think? Yes, I think we have. And after all, uh, time is relative. So Einstein says, a week, a month, a year. What's the matter? You're being very philosophical this evening. Yes, I guess I am. Because I'm scared. Scared? Well, I might look it, but I am. Judy, this is going to come as a great shock to you, so hold on to your hat. But, but will you marry me? Well, I know this is a heck of a place to ask you, all these people, I mean. uh, You probably think I'm crazy, but it's sort of easier here somehow. Do you really mean it, Clark? Oh, sure I mean it. You don't think I'm just talking to pass the time, do you? I'm trying to tell you that I love you, Judy. From the first night we met at Lady Blanchard, remember? Of course I do. I knew then this was going to happen someday. Well, it had to. But I never thought I'd pluck up courage so soon. Oh, you don't have to answer right away if you don't want to. And if I do want to? You don't mean you... You can't possibly mean it. Yes. I can't believe it. Gosh. Your champagne, you signore. Tony, you're talking to the future Mrs. Hungerford. So, this is the recent news? Yes, very recent. In that case, the champagne is on Tony. Oh, Tony, I, I didn't Please, mean that... I uh, salute your very good fortune, signore. And mine, I hope, Tony. But, of course, signorina. I, uh, hope you like this, Judy. But I happened to be passing a jeweler's shop this morning, and I, well, I just sort of spotted it in the window, and it looked all right. So I took a chance, and, well, here it is. Oh, darling. Beautiful. You really like it? The most wonderful ring. Oh, I... try it on for size. If it doesn't fit, the fellow said that you could take it. But it does. Look. It's perfect. It does look kind of good on, doesn't it? I don't know what to say. Nor me. Oh, it's... Oh, it's just like a dream. Then I hope I never wake up. I'll try to make you happy, Judy. I promise. Come on. Let's drink. To us. To us. Well, hello, you two. Oh, hello, Mr. Lester. Hello, Gerald. I should hold my head in shame, I know. But as we've already all apologized profusely to each other on the phone... Oh, come on. Forget it. Have a drink. Oh, thanks, but I'm expecting friends in a minute. Oh, we insist. Don't we, Judy? Emphatically. As a matter of fact, you're just in time to congratulate us. Oh. Look. Isn't it beautiful? Well, this is really something. I hope you realize, Hungerford, you're straining friendly Anglo-American relations a bit far. How come? I should be madly jealous. <laughs> in fact, I am. Okay, brother. <laughs> What's it to be? Pistols at dawn? A pinch of arsenic in your champagne, I think. It's more fun. <laughs> Talking of champagne. Hey, Tony, uh, another one of these, please. Si, signore. When's the wedding to be? Oh, that's up to Judy. As soon as you like. Good Lord. Here's Inspector Clavering. Oh, uh, Mr. Farrell, I've been searching the whole of London searching for you. Searching for me? But... Is something wrong, Inspector? I'm afraid so. I'll have to ask you to come along with me, Miss Farrell. Is it something to do with Tom? Not exactly. You'll hear all about it in a few minutes. Sir Brian Fordingham and a Mr. Brooke are waiting outside in a car. Forgive me, but it's urgent. I must insist. Of course. Is it all right if I come along, too? I'm Miss Farrell's fiancé. Also, I'm a friend of George Brooke's. All right. Oh. Sorry about this, Lester. I'll drink. Good luck to you both, anyway. I apologize to Ronald for wasting his time, and he showed me to the door, and we said a polite goodbye, and... That was that. Hmm. And uh, that's all that happened? Yes, Sir Brian. Uh, how was Sir Ronald? Uh, did you get the impression he was at all disturbed or upset? Not in the least, Mr. Book. You're quite sure there was no one else in the flat? I didn't see anyone else. They may have been in another room. Look, I know this is not my affair, but what is it all about? At a quarter to six this evening, while Sir Ronald was speaking to me on the phone, he was attacked by someone. Attacked? <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. You don't suggest that Judy... We are simply trying to get at the truth, Mr. Hungerford. Well, if you want the truth, here it is. At a quarter to six, Miss Farrell was with me. What? Yes, in fact, at 22. I knew she had this appointment, and I was waiting for her outside. You'd swear to those times? Certainly I would. And if you want confirmation, as we were about to drive off... Oh, yes. 
we saw... Ah, with the clock, you saw what? Well, I... I don't imagine there's any connection, but we saw a woman called Vania Dean entering the building. Vania Dean? Are you sure? Yes, it was Miss Dean, all right. I met her only a few days ago. I think I'd better go around and have a word. No, wait. Let me do that. But it's my duty. Brooks, right, Inspector. Now, there'll have to be normal police inquiries, of course, but they can come later. At the moment, this is our pigeon. Well, that's all very well, but... If you're worried at all, I'll speak to the Assistant Commissioner. Oh, you'd uh, better get moving, George. I'm on my way now. Sir, what about Miss Farrell and me? May we go now? Certainly. I'm sorry to have put you to all this trouble, Miss Farrell, but... Uh, I'm sure you understand. Of course, Sir Brian. There is just one thing. Yes? I dare say you realize there may be a great deal more to this than appears on the surface. So I beg of you both, most earnestly, to say nothing about it to anyone. You might as well come clean, Miss Dean. We know you entered the building at 20 to 6. We know you went to Luke's flat. We know you were in the room with him when he rang Sir Brian Fordingham. You know a great deal, don't you? Enough to put you away for a long time, and I don't mean only for attempted murder either. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. No? Luke had found out something about you, hadn't he? And you struck him down to silence him. And what's more, we know that something was. You were after a paper he kept in his safe, weren't you? A certain report? It's not true. First you tried to persuade him, and then he became suspicious and tried to telephone, and so you attacked him. Then you panicked, and instead of opening the safe and getting the report, you ran for it. I I know nothing of any report. Why should I want such a thing? Oh, not for yourself, of course. You were acting on orders. Whose orders? That is exactly what I want to know. Now, look. I'll make a bargain with you. As things stand, you face a very serious charge. The police must act, and we can't stop them. But we can, I believe, persuade them to break the charge down to manslaughter. We can't promise, of course, but we'll do all we can. All we ask in return is the name of the man who sent you to get that report. I don't know it. Please, Miss Dean. I don't, I tell you. I only spoke to him on the phone. He he knew something about me. You see, he threatened to make it public if I didn't do as he told me. Didn't he call himself anything at all? Yes. The Prince of Plunder. So that. Did you have a long conversation with him? Fairly long. And you didn't recognize his voice? No. He had a foreign accent. It, oh, it may have been assumed, though, because once or twice it did sound vaguely familiar. Who did you think it may have been? I, I wouldn't like to say. I may be wrong. And be, besides, he threatened me. I'm afraid. We'll give you all the protection you need. Now, come on, Miss Dean. Who was it? Well, it sounded to me rather like a man I'd met called... <laughs> Christine! Oh, Monsieur, I heard a noise. Uh, Madame! Your mistress has been shot. Shot? From somewhere in that opposite building, I met him. Home for a doctor at once. I'm going across to look for whoever did it. I'll be back as soon as I can. And you found no one at all? Uh, it was an empty building. There were plenty of footprints in the dust, of course, but that's all. Whoever fired the shot must have made a pretty swift getaway. Hmm. And when you got back to the flat, Vanya Dean was dead. Yes. A doctor had just arrived, but he was too late. You found nothing in the flat? Not a thing. I didn't expect I would. <sighs> so we're no further forward at all. On the contrary. Hmm? All we have to do now is to find the man who calls himself the Prince of Plunder. <laughs> if he exists. Oh, he exists, all right. Uh, Scotland Yard's been on his trail for months. How can we succeed where they've failed? Oh, we happen to know something. The Yard doesn't. Uh -huh. What's that? That he's not only a blackmailer, but also the man behind this international smuggling racket. Yeah? Which means we also know one of his associates is my old friend Lertz. Lertz? In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if it was Lertz who fired the shot that killed Vanya Dean. And I'll tell you something else. Hmm? I have a hunch that young Farrell's death is tied up in this somewhere. Uh, you're doing a lot of guessing, Brooke. Well, what's wrong with an occasional guesser? That's so long as it's right. Anyhow, it's good enough for me. I'll see you later. Where are you going now? To look for Lutz. Of course, I don't know what your ideas are about a honeymoon, darling. But I figure it might be sort of nice to go back home. To America, you mean? Yes. You could meet my folks. I think that's a wonderful idea. They could come over for the wedding, I suppose. But, well, if we're going to be married next month, it mightn't be so easy for Dad to leave his business so soon. Excuse me, sir. You haven't forgotten our coffee, have you, waiter? No, sir. It will be here in a minute. You are Mr. Hunderford, aren't you, sir? Yes. I've been asked to give you this note. 
Who by? I couldn't say, sir. It was left with the commissioner. Oh, thanks. Thank you, sir. Who can this be from? Who'd know we were dining here tonight? It's from George Brooke. Oh. Listen to this, Judy. I just unearthed some important information about the death of your fiancé's brother. Clark! Don! I, I have an appointment now, but if you can be outside Holborn Tube Station at 11 o'clock, one of our fellows will pick you up and take you to where I am. Sorry if this sounds complicated, but I'll explain when I see you. George. 11 o'clock. That'll just give me time to run you home first. Oh, can't I come too? I mean, if it's about Tom... Oh, I'm sorry, darling. But if George wanted you as well, I think he'd have said so. Oh, I suppose so. Clark, you're sure this note is genuine? Oh, why shouldn't it be? I don't know. It just seems a little odd, that's all. Well, you know how it is with these cloak and dagger boys. They make everything seem so mysterious. I suppose it is in Mr. Brooks' handwriting. I wouldn't know. I don't think I've ever seen it before. I don't think you should go. It might be a trap of some kind. Now, who'd want to trap me? And for why? It doesn't add up. Now, stop worrying yourself over nothing, honey. Your coffee, sir. Oh, sorry, waiter. Looks like we'll have to skip it. Let me have my check, will you please? Very good, sir. Mr. Hungerford? Yes? Ah, you're right on time. I have a car over here. Oh, I've got mine, too. Oh, that's a complication, I'm afraid. Well, suppose you drive to wherever we're going, and I'll follow. Mr. Brooks said nothing about that. I, I think you'd better leave yours here, and uh, you can pick it up later. Okay. You're the boss. <laughs> Let us go, then, shall we? Is this the place? Yes. Will you follow me? Here? Yes, that's right. Look, I'm not quite sure. Oh. Nice work, let's shut the door. Right. What are we going to do with it? Help me drag him over here. Right. Uh, we'll tie him to this chair. That's the idea. Give me a hand. He's coming round already, I think. Good. A bit tighter, I think. Yes. Oh. That's more like it. What happened? Good evening, Mr. Hungerford. Lester. But I thought I was going to meet your friend, Brooke. Exactly. I'm sorry, but one has to resort to a little subterfuge now, then. I don't get all this. Then I shall do my best to enlighten you. My colleague, Mr. Lertz, here, first suggested he should lie and wait for you as you were going home. He's a very good shot, is Mr. Lertz, and I'm sure he'd have done an excellent job. But there was a risk, and he might have failed. I didn't fail with the Dean woman, did I? Or with Gattaker? I don't question your efficiency for a moment, Lertz. But this way is better. You see, if a man's to die, it's better he should know why. Don't you agree, Mr. Hungerford? Or don't you follow me yet? I follow you, all right. Good. I was willing to overlook our little fracas at my flat the other night. Rather generously, you must admit. But you should never have got yourself engaged to Judy. That, I'm afraid, was fatal. You mean to say Exactly. That... Pistols at dawn, Mr. Hungerford? Your own phrase. Only there'll only be one pistol in the very capable hand of Mr. Lurtz. You don't kid yourself that even with me out of the way, Judy's going to fall for you, do you? I think it's possible. Gratitude can easily turn to love. And what's she got to be grateful to you about? I propose to clear up the mystery of her brother's death. To remove the stigma of suicide, which she appears to find so distressing. Yeah, cook up some evidence, you mean, to make it look like murder? But, my dear fellow, it was murder. Or shall we call it justifiable homicide? Huh? Young Farrell was very foolish. He was heavily in debt, and I offered him money in return for copies of certain documents in the possession of his chief, Sir Ronald Luke. It seemed a fair enough bargain to me. It would, to you. But far from being grateful, he called me a number of unpleasant names and threatened to expose me. So you killed him, huh? He left me no choice, I'm afraid. And how do you figure you're going to sell the police a story like that without implicating yourself? That's quite simple. I shall implicate you. When your body's found, there'll be certain papers in your wallet which will make it quite apparent you've been using your position at the embassy to obtain and pass on information to certain people in Switzerland. You're crazy if you think anyone's going to believe that. Come to think of it, you're crazy anyway. No! Oh. Ah, never say that again. You're crazy. 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 Get him, Lutz. Right. No, you don't. George. All right, Lutz. You won't need the gun. Drop it. <coughs> Boy, am I glad to see you. 
Look out. Lester's got a gun. Uh, oh, my God. Over against that wall, let's keep your hands well up. Now turn your back. That's the idea, and stay like that. Uh, let's set you loose first, Clark. There. There we are. How's that? Fine. Take this gun and keep an eye on Lutz. Right. I'll see if there's anything I can do for Lester. Lester, can you hear me? Yes. I didn't want to shoot you, but you fought. Better this way. Maybe you're right. Listen to me, Lester. You've got a last chance to square your conscience. I know you were working for someone else. Yes. Someone else. Who? What's his name? Name? Yes. Who is he? Did you get it, George? Yes, I got it. Lester? <gasps> He's dead, I'm afraid. Well, I can't shed any tears over that. Well, what are we going to do with this Lutz now? Turn around, Lutz. No, no, don't. You can lower your hands now. Give me your wrists. Those will keep you quiet till we turn you in. Turn me in? For a couple of murders you were kind enough to admit. Gataker was my friend, remember? So you were listening, George. Well, you don't imagine I got here by chance, do you? No, I've been trying to figure out just how you did get here. Oh, that's easy. I just picked up Lutz's trail and saw him meet you outside Hope and Tube. So I thought I'd better join the party, just in case. Oh, it's lucky for me you did. Oh, I'd have intervened sooner. Only I was interested to hear what Lester had to say. We've a lot to do yet. Come on, Clark, let's get moving, shall we? There you are, Hector. Shit. Oh, I believe you've got me, Gilbert. Mm. I can only go there. <laughs> of course I've got you, dear boy, right where I want you. There. Oh, mate. Mm. Oh, it's not very good at chess, are you, Hector? Oh, my dear fellow, it ill becomes a winner to gloat. Oh, bad loser, eh? Not at all. I, I, I think I'd better go. Nonsense. It's early yet. It's just after midnight. It's all right for you actors. Natural night birds, all of you. What you need, old boy, is another whiskey. Now, say when. Oh, really, Gilbert? Um, oh, d d just a small one, please. What's the word of a small one? Here, have a real snorter. You are obnoxiously hearty tonight, I must say. Well, why not? God's in his heaven, and all's right with the world. I detest heartiness. <sighs> you know what's the trouble with you, Hector? Liver, not enough exercise. Now, take me, for instance. A big party, uh, sir. Oh, what is it, Jameson? Two gentlemen have called, sir. At this hour? Who are they? Uh, Mr. Brook and a Mr. Hungerford, sir. Hungerford? Our young American friend. Naive, but rather charming. Oh, yes, that chap, yes. Sir. Well, damn it, what can they want? Oh, ask them in, Jameson. Very good, sir. Now, if you'd rather not stay, dear boy... Oh, no, no, not at all, not at all. Mr. Brook, Mr. Hungerford. Good evening, Hungerford. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Sir Hector. Oh, delighted to see you again, young man. I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, Mr. George Brook. Oh. Sir Gilbert Mildmay. How do you do? Sir Hector Pandado. How do you do? Oh, now then, gentlemen. Drinks? No, thanks. Not for me. You'd better do the talking, George. Bless my soul, this all sounds very serious. It is, I'm afraid, sir. But first, let me explain. I'm a member of what's commonly known as the Secret Service. One of Fordingham's boys, eh? Yes. Yeah. How interesting. Uh, do go on, Mr. Brooke. Recently, while he was investigating a certain smuggling activities on the continent, a colleague of mine was murdered. I traced his killer, a man named Lurtz, to England. In the course of my inquiries, I discovered that the man behind the smuggling racket was the blackmailer known as the Prince of Plunder. One up to me, Hector. Didn't I always insist there was such a man? Assuming we can accept Mr. Brooke's story, of course. You can accept it all right, sir. As you can guess, this Prince of Plunder is a man of considerable social standing. Over the years, he's kept diaries of these activities. And as a result, he's been in a unique position to extract blackmail. Normally, he's worked through what one might call a chief of staff. A man you both know. Who the devil's that? Gerald Lester. Lester? Really, Mr. Oh, I Brooke. can't believe it. It must be some mistake. We've had his confession, Sir Gilbert. Do you, you mean he's under arrest? Lester is dead. Dead? And this man, uh, what did you call him, Lurt? He's in custody on two charges of murder. Uh, tell me, Mr. Brooke, as a matter of curiosity, in his confession, did Lester name the man he worked for? Yes. That's how we found the diary. We've been doing a little burgling. Strictly illegal, of course. Where about? 231 Lounge Square. 231... Why, damn it. Exactly, Gilbert. My address. But, uh, you seem to have done very well, Mr. Brooke. Allow me to drink to your success. Grab that glass, Clark. Right. 
Let me go. You'll break my arm. You got it, George. Yes. No, you don't. I thought so. Will someone please tell me what this is all about? You weren't quite quick enough, Sir Hector. I saw you drop the tablet in the glass. There'll be no easy way out for the Prince of Plunder. Not you, Hector. Surely not you. My dear fellow, don't look so surprised. After all, you're not the only good actor in the world, you know. If you're quite ready, Sir Hector, shall we go? In The Prince of Plunder, adapted by Rex Renitz from the novel by Sidney Haller, Sir Hector Pandeville was played by James Thomason, George Brooke by Clifford Norgate, Sir John Mildmay by Godfrey Kenton, and Clark Hungerford by Edward Bishop. Elizabeth Cassie played Judy, Diana Payan, Betty, Hector Ross, Sir Brian Fordingham, Edward Kelsey, Inspector Clavering, Ian Cooper, Sir Charles Morley, Rosemary Martin, Vanya Dean, John Bentley, Sir Ronald Luke, Griselda Harvey, Lady Blanchard, Peter Tottenham, Gerald Lester, Anthony Brothers, Lertz, Robin Brown, Tom Farrell, Cordelia Mansell, Marie, Ian Ricketts, the croupier, Anthony Higginson, Jameson, and Kim Grant, Lady Blanchard's butler. The Prince of Plunder was produced by David Geary.
I thought I meant to pitch a harpoon down a life whale's throat and then jump after it. I am, sir, if it be absolutely indispensable to do so. Good. What name art thou called? Call me Ishmael. At the period of my arrival in Nantucket, the storage of the Pequod had been almost completed, so I had but little time to wait before word was given out that the ship would sail on Christmas Day. I shall not soon forget that gray, imperfect, misty morning. I had taken an early start from my inn, so it was barely six o'clock when I drew nigh the wharf. At first I thought it deserted, but as I made my way along the piles of casks and fishing nets and coils of rope... Morning to you, shipmate. Oh, good morning. Sharp cost this morning, ain't it? Uh, yes, it is. Where are you bound, shipmate? For the Pequod, down at the end there. The Pequod, eh? Going aboard? Yes, we're sailing today. You signed the articles? Yes. Shipmate, anything down there about your soul? My what? Your soul, shipmate? Oh, perhaps you haven't got one. There's many half and better off for it. A soul's a sort of fit wheel to a wagon. Look, shipmate, you... Have you seen half yet? No, I haven't. What did they tell you about me? Why, nothing much. Only that he's a good whale hunter and a good captain to his crew. Did they tell you nothing more? Nothing but the thing that happened to him off Cape Horn when he lay like dead for three days and nights? Nothing about that deadly scrimmage with the Spaniard in Santa for the altar? Eh? Well, why, no. Nothing about the silver calabash he spat into? Nothing about him losing his leg last voyage? Well, I did hear he'd lost a leg. Ah, he heard about that, I dare say. But did you hear all about it, eh? Only that a whale took it off. Look, who are you anyway? My name is Elijah, shipmate. Elijah? Wait. Look there, shipmate. Hey, there, through the mist. Do you see anything going toward the Pequod? You mean those sailors? I those sailors. How many are there, eh? Well, I can't see very clearly. Four or five, I guess. Four or five. See if you can find them on board, shipmate. See if you can find them on board. Well, Mr. Starbuck, I'll say goodbye. But this day in three years, I'll have a hot supper smoking for thee in old Nantucket. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pellick, before you go, there's just one thing. I am. Cut me half, sir. Is he sick? Sick? No, I don't think so. I spoke to him just now. Then why does he stay below in his cabin? I don't know, Mr. Starbuck. He's a queer man, is Captain Ahab. He is indeed, sir. But I'll take him well enough, no fear. Ahab's above the common, Mr. Starbuck. He's been in colleges as well as among the cannibals. Been used to deeper wonders on the waves. Fixed his fiery lens in mighty ass, stranger foes on whales. Aye, he's Ahab. And Ahab of old, thou knowest, was crowned a king. Aye, a very vile one. When he was slain, the dogs licked his blood. Look thee, Mr. Starbuck. Never say that aboard the Pequod, even if thou art chief mate. Captain Ahab's a good man. I know him well. Not a pious good man, but a swearing good man. He's that all right. Aye. Now, I know that since he lost his leg last voyage, he's been kind of moody. But let me tell thee, Mr. Starbuck, he's better to sail with a moody good captain than a laughing bad one. I hope you're right, sir. I hope you're right. Outward bound through biting polar weather, then southwards toward the Cape of Good Hope. For the first few days after leaving Nantucket, Nothing above hatches was seen of Captain Ahab, and to all intents, the Pequod was commanded by her mates, Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. This in itself may not have been extraordinary, but as time went by, my natural curiosity concerning our unknown captain gave way to a vague uneasiness. I remember, too, my meeting with old Elijah and his incoherent warning 
seemed strangely heightened now in the seclusion of the sea. At length, I began to make inquiries among the motley set of renegades and savages which comprised the Pequod's crew. Don't worry, lad. You'll meet him soon enough for your lodging. I step and growl, growl and go. No word with Captain Ahab. Well, what does it look like, Archie? Couldn't say, lad. I haven't seen him yet. But I've heard that he's old and has a long scar running down his face. And where's a wooden leg? Not wooden, Archie. It's an ivory leg, white ivory, carved from a sperm whale's jaw. How do you know, Nat? Have you seen him? No, but I've heard plenty. So have I. But hasn't anyone seen him, except the mates? Me see him. You have, quick, quick. Where? On quarter deck. Him stand by rail. Me up masthead. Me and Dago and Castigo. Did he say anything to you? Uh, him say, look. Oh, white whale. White whale? I thought whales were black. So they are, lad, most of them. But there's one white brute they tell of. We've seen all over the world. Off Japan, round the Horn, Indian Ocean, everywhere. Moby Dick, they call him. All hands, them. That's them all. All hands, them. What's the matter, mate? What's the matter? I don't know, Captain's orders. All hands, them. Muster up there. Captain, so all hands back. Hi, old Ahab's coming to hide. Come on, lad. We'll see him now, right enough. Here he comes. Good. Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on. 
Aye, and I'll chase him round Good Hope, and round the Horn, and round the Norway Maelstrom, and round Perdition Flames, before I give him up. And that's what you've shipped for, men. To chase that cursed white whale on both sides of land, and over all sides of earth, till he spouts black blood. had gone up with the rest, my oath had been welded with theirs, and stronger I shouted and more did I hammer and clinch my oath because of the dread in my soul. That Ahab was mad, I had small reason to doubt. Since the loss of his leg, he had cherished a fierce and growing vindictiveness against Moby Dick. Until now, the white whale swam before him as the incarnation of all that most maddens and torments. All the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all truth with malice in it, all evil, were visibly personified in Moby Dick, and thus made physically assailable. Yes, Captain Ahab was mad. Yet the very fury of his madness drew from us all a mystic response. A wild, sympathetical feeling was in us. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed ours. Only Mr. Starbuck stood alone. Oh, God, to sail with such a heathen crew, whelped somewhere by the sharkish sea. The white whale is there, demigorgon. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned, and by a madman, Yet I must obey, rebelling. Worse yet, hate with touch of pity. In Ahab's eyes I read some lurid woe would shrivel me up had I it. Still there's hope. The hated whale has all the watery world to swim in. God may wedge aside our heaven-insulting purpose. Stand by me, hold me, bind me. 
and icebergs all astern, the Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quito Spring, which at sea perpetually reigns on the threshold of the tropics. For sleeping man, it was hard to choose between the starred and stately nights and the warmly cool, clear, perfumed days. And yet, for all the witcheries of such unwaning skies, a nameless tension charged the crew. There was talk of omen and strange weather signs and mysterious sounds at night. But I tell you, Ned, I heard it distinctly. Where? On the quarter deck. It seemed to come from under the edge. You were dreaming, Archie. First there was a sort of cough, and then a noise like two or three sleepers turning over. The three ship's biscuits you had supper turning over inside you. All right, love. But I tell you. Somebody's down in that afternoon. Somebody that's not being seen on deck. But how could anyone stow away all this time? I don't know that. But I'm a feeling old I am does. It's a strange man. Look at him there at the rail. Staring into the sunset. What do you suppose he's thinking, eh? What do you suppose he's thinking? I leave a white and turbid wake, pale waters, paler cheeks where'er I sail. The envious billows sidelong swell to well my drink. Let them, but first I pass. Time was when as the sunrise nobly spurred me, so the sunset soothed. No more. This lovely light, it lights not me. Damned, most subtly and malignantly, damned in the midst of paradise. They think me mad. I Starbuck does, but I'm demoniac. I'm madness, maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. What I've dared, I've willed, and what I've willed, I'll do. Not conserve me. The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails whereon my soul is grooved to run. Come, ye great gods, come forth and swerve me if you can. <laughs> Dive as soon as he does. 
Blast, there he goes. There go flukes! Have we lost him? No, he'll be up again in a minute. He's making a regular sounding, and he may stay down for an hour. Uh, here come the boats. Uh, step out ahead. Hello? There's another one. Where? Pulling around the stand. Oh, looks like Captain Ahab. It is. And by heaven, look who's rowing him. The stowaway. I led the stowaways. The spare whale boat. So that's his game. Game? The owners won't risk a captain in a whale boat during the chase, especially if he's only one leg. So they don't assign him a regular boat crew. But all they have sworn to get Moby Dick for himself. So he's brought along his own private oarsman without the owners knowing. Who are they, that? East Indians. Percy, they reckon. And they look at devils, too. But by thunder, they can row. What's Ahab pointing at? The whale. See that patch of vapor? The head of the boat, huh? The whale's swimming there. Just under the... There she breaches! Stops right on him! Pull, you dogs! Pull! There's Chico standing up. He's aiming the iron. Give me to him, Cash. Give it to him. Why doesn't he throw it? Well, they're not close enough yet. Double telegram. There it goes. <gasps> he ah, got him. Right behind the fin. See the iron sticking up? Well done, Cash boy. Yeah, well done, you heathen savage. That's Bob the Brute. Great heaven. Look at it wallow. It's gone crazy. Watch out for the tail. Watch out for... <clears throat> God, that was close. Another foot, and he'd have smashed him to pieces. He's slowing down, isn't he? Aye. Pull alongside now, and he was the last. Uh, see? The double All in your dogs. Oh, they swung round. I can't see. Stump was driving the lance into him. Trying to strike his heart, huh? Once. Twice. There! Ah, he found it! Good Lord, Nat. The whale's spouting blood. Aye, yeah, that drove the spigot out of him. Watch out for the furry Stand clear, you fools. God, Nat. The blood. He's streaming blood like a fountain. <laughs> He's in agony. Hey, cheer up, lad. You'll get hardened to it. You'll see worse things than blood before this voyage is done. <laughs> By noon next day, the intricate business of cutting in had been completed, and the huge, peeled, headless body of Stubbs' whale floated slowly away on the tide. All morning we had toiled, stripping the vast blanket of blubber and storing it away below hatches, carefully severing the massive head and suspending it by chains against the Pequod's hull. There was still a great deal to be done. The precious sperm had yet to be tapped from the monster's brow and the ivory teeth extracted. But now it was noon. The men were below at dinner. The great hooks and tackles still. And silence reigned on the deck. Only Captain Ahab remained, leaning over the taffrail, staring down at the gigantic black head which hung halfway out of the sea. Speak, our vast and venerable head. Speak, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers, thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid the world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there, in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thy head hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham. And not one syllable is thine. Ah, well, now that's cheering. Where away? Enough helm there. Stand by to hail. Have you seen?
under easy sail toward the Straits of Sunda and Java Head. Days pass, weeks, a fantastic procession of booming sails and reeling decks, of shouted orders and aching backs, of whale boats drenched with the clotted gore of stricken whales, and always the mingled stench of blubber and tar and oil and blood. As Nat predicted, I grew hardened to it. But as time went by, another, more subtle horror possessed me. At first, I believed I was alone in my apprehensions. But one middle watch in the Javan Sea, I heard two of the mates discussing it. I don't like it, Stubb. I don't like it at all. What's the trouble, Mr. Flask? That yellow parsi the old man smuggled aboard. The ugly one with the turban. You mean Fadala? Aye, Fadala. You know what he is? Some kind of oriental mystic, I'd say. Worse than that, Stubb, worse than that. You ever notice his eyes? Like a snake with a death limb. Aye, he's a sinister-looking dog right enough. Wonder why the old man has so much to do with him. They never apart, those two. And all the hogs they have like his shadow. Like his evil spirit, you mean? That cross, he's a devil of some sort, Stubb. And Ahab's in his power. Oh, Flask. No one controls all Ahab. The devil does, Stubb. And I tell you, Fidelis the devil. He's the Elzebub in disguise. And even God doesn't know what hellish work he does. Well, the oil in the main hole is leaking, sir. 
have to heave to and break out the casks. Heave to and break out. He'd taken leave of your senses, we'd lose a week. In time of that, sir, they'll lose more oil in one day than we may make good in a year. Don't be a fool, man. We'll be in the Pacific tomorrow. I realize that, sir. Surely what we've come 20,000 miles to get is worth saving. Aye. So it is, Starbuck. So it is. If we get it. I was speaking of the oil, sir. And I was not speaking of the oil. Let it leak, Starbuck. I'll not heave two for 50 leaking casks. What will the owners say? Owners, owners! Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out yell the typhoons! Confound it, Starbuck. But you always prate to me of these miserly owners, as if the owners were my conscience. Be gone, sir. On deck. But, sir... Last year, man, get out of my sight on deck. One moment, Captain Ahab. I'm not used to being spoken to in that manner. Avast. On deck, I say. Must I remind you that I'm your chief officer, sir? Devil's men! There is one god that is lord over the earth, and one captain that's lord over the big one. On deck! By heaven, sir, if you were a younger and happier man... Just dare to threaten me, Starbuck. No, sir. No, Drake's not insulted me, sir. For that, there's no cause to beware of me. But this I'll say. Let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of yourself, old man. Beware of yourself. What's that he said? Ahab, beware of Ahab. Stella, what think ye? Have I not said, my captain, that ere thou could die, thou must first see two houses afloat on the ocean. Aye, aye. The first, not made by mortal hand. The second, of wood that must be grown in America. Till they be seen, thou canst not die. Aye. Aye. Then it follows I must be immortal. Immortal, my captain? Aye. Two horses afloat on the ocean is a sight we'll not soon see, Fadala. But what was the saying about myself? Though it come to the last, I shall still go before thee, thy pilot. And when he is so gone before, then there I can. Follow. He must still appear to pilot me. Is so? It was so, my captain. Uh, well then, uh, I've here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Take another pledge, my captain. Hemp only can kill me. Hemp only. The gallows, you mean? <laughs> that I must be immortal on sea and on land? I, Fadala, on sea and on land, I'm immortal! <laughs> Look up! The masses are on fire! We've been struck! The masses are burning! 
Avast there! What craven noise is this? We've been stripped, sir! Look at that! The masts are on fire! The lightning rod! Drop them over! Silence, you fools! We've not been struck! Have you never seen the corpuses before? The corpuses! Ah, Aye, the corpuses! The corpuses in Elmo's light! Look up at it, men! Mark it well! A white flame but lights the way to the white whale. It's an omen, sir, and an ill one. God is against us. Leap up, thou spirit of fire. Leap up, I say, and lick the sky. In God's name, forbear, sir. Let us square the odds and hold. Square the odds. Aye, it's an ill voyage, sir, ill begun and ill continued. Let's make a fair wind of it homeward while we may. Square it for home. the braces. Square it. Stand back. Stand back. Yes, on a hell. Harpoon. It scuttles the first dog that touches a rope. Stand back. Now, hark here, men. Did you not swear with me to hunt Moby Dick to his death? Did you not swear? I swore I. I. And so did I. My heart and soul. Body and lungs and life am I bound. And I'll not strike spars for any gale till Moby Dick's out at last and wallows in his blood. Such a day I stuffed my first whale, Starbuck. A boy. 
willing to lure to keep the good spout in sight. But there's no one chasing you. Mr. Stubb, why have you come aboard? My boat was smashed, gun. Moby Dick charged us when he stopped to pick you up. So, two boats towed. <laughs> my leg! Stop with my ivory leg! Steady, sir. Compass is making another. Mr. Stubb, can 
My comrades in the whale boat, caught by the last rush of waves that spread from the Pequod sinking hull, were hurled from the bow and vanished with the rest. It was the devious cruising Rachel that picked me up at last. Still searching after her missing children, she only found another orphan afloat on a dirge-like name. And even as her sail appeared, my eyes were turned to the still yawning gulf of the Pequod's grave. Small fowl flew screaming over it. A sullen white surf beat against its side. Then all collapsed. And the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled five thousand years ago. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone in The Phantom of the Opera with Edgar Barrier. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. A Broadway first night thrills the few hundred people who can enjoy the play. A Hollywood premiere is exciting for the few thousands who gather to see the stars. But opening night in the Lux Radio Theater belongs to the millions. The millions in American homes and camps from coast to coast. And it belongs to our boys in uniform beyond the seas who join us for the first performance of our tenth season. The real adventure is not in the lights or the crowds, but in the historic privileges of the theater, in hearing a famous star score again in a brand new role, and in the joy of discovering a new star. All that is yours tonight, when we present Nelson Eddy and Susanna Foster in their new universal technicolor success, The Phantom of the Opera. And with them, in one of the theater's most interesting parts, we bring you Basil Rathbone. It's the first of a big parade of stars and plays that will challenge your attention and our ingenuity. Tonight's play has the thrill of mystery, the gaiety of comedy, and to stop everything else, one of the great singing voices of our day, the romantic baritone of Nelson Eddy. And if that isn't the right way to start the Lux Radio Theater off on another season, I don't know how to find it. We hope to make this season the best in our history, and we're counting on you to help us make it the best. By help, I don't mean just buying Lux toilet soap. I I think you'll do that anyway, because you know how good it is. But backstage in this theater, we need your help in selecting plays. We want you to tell us what stars you'd like to hear. Everybody has a personal preference, and you give all the orders for our command performances. Your loyalty to Lux toilet soap has kept this curtain going up for nine years. Your award has been a fine product, and the finest plays and stars we could discover. And now, the thrill of another opening night, as the curtain rises on the first act of The Phantom of the Opera, starring Nelson Eddy as Anatole, Susanna Foster as Christine, and Basil Rathbun as Claudin, with Edgar Barrier as Raoul. In the year 1880, the old Paris opera stood like a giant torch in the heart of the city. A thousand windows ablaze with light. But there were shadows, too. Shadows that flitted high in the gallery over the great stage. Shadows that lingered in the sub-cellars far beneath the street, 
where the black sewers of Paris ran sluggishly in the dark. But we were not concerned with these things, or so we thought at the time. We of the opera knew only the light of the dressing rooms, the bright gaiety of the stage. I suppose it all began the night we sang Martha. The house was crowded, enthusiastic. There were no shadows for us that night. Demande, mes chers amis, ce qui pourrait emplir la vie d'un tel immense plaisir. Vous verrez bien que la raison pour la gaieté de nos chansons, si plein de nos frais, de choix et refrains, c'est là le parterre. No, there was no warning that night, no hint of the strange things that were about to happen. But I noticed at the finale that Christine was not on stage for the curtain call. Christine Dubois, who sang the role of Nancy. It was not like her to miss the finale of the act. Stage when the curtain had fallen, I saw Christine hurrying to her dressing room. Christine, Christine, wait. Yes, not at all. What is it? What happened to you? You weren't on stage. Why, I... You weren't ill, were you? Oh, oh, no, no. You're all right? You're sure? Of course, Anna Toll. Do I look all right? Oh, you look lovely. What happened? Well, I had a visitor. Somebody wanted to see me. Oh? Mademoiselle Dubois. Oh, good evening, maestro. Mademoiselle. I understand that you were entertaining a gentleman backstage during a performance. Is that true? Yes, maestro. You are not the greatest soprano in the world, mademoiselle. Not yet. So you will please not take liberties. See me later in my office. Yes, maestro. Anatole, what will he do? Don't worry. He's just barking again. Who uh, was the gentleman? Well, he... He's an old friend of mine. But not so very old. <laughs> no. He's Inspector Dobert, the Sûreté. Inspector? You mean a policeman? Well, he's not an ordinary policeman. Oh, does he sing? <laughs> no. He's a graduate of the military academy at Saint-Cyr. How much does this man mean to you? Well, I- I'm not sure. Christine, it- it's not like me to preach. But someday you'll have to choose between your career and what's called a normal life. You can't do justice to both. I think you'll find that music has its compensations. In other words, you don't think I ought to have supper tonight with Raoul? Um, uh, no. But if you want it all, that would be all right? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> we'll see. There was another man that night who missed Christine's appearance during the finale. His name was Eric Claudin, a violinist. He was a strange man, this Claudin. Quiet, almost shy, but a brilliant musician. When Christine came from Villeneuve's office, Claudin was waiting in the passage. Good evening, mademoiselle. Good evening, Claudin. Monsieur Villeneuve will see you now. Thank you, mademoiselle. Good night. Oh, mademoiselle, 
Uh, may I speak to you for a moment? Certainly. You, uh, you weren't on the stage tonight for the curtain call. Everyone in the theater seems to have noticed that. It's really quite flattering. Why weren't you there? What? Oh, please forgive me, but I... I've been here so long that you, that everybody, everything connected with the opera is so much a part of my life. Of course. But Monsieur Villeneuve is waiting. Yes. You weren't ill, were you? You're not in any trouble. Oh, it's impertinent of me, I know, but... <laughs> no, it isn't. You're very kind. And I'm not in trouble. Good night. Christine. Monsieur. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I shouldn't have called you Christine. I'm sorry. Good night. Good night, mademoiselle. Come in. Oh, Claudin. Yes, maestro. Close the door, please. You know why I sent for you, Claudin? I think so, maestro. I have brought my violin. Take it out of the case, please. Hey, Claudin, for some time now I have sensed discord in the violin section. It was not until tonight that I definitely located the source of the trouble. Now, let me hear you play, Claudin. Yes, maestro. What shall I play? Anything you please. Yes, maestro. Wait a moment. What is that? A little song. A lullaby from Provence, where I was born. Oh, it is very nice, very charming. I, I've written a concerto on the theme. Yes, I... yes, charming, Claude Amber, too simple. Uh, suppose instead you let me hear the opening movement in the third act of Martha. Well? It's no use, maestro. Something's happened to the fingers of my left hand. I see. Perhaps it's only temporary, maestro. Perhaps it will get better. I hope so. In the meantime, I'm sorry, Claude. I'm very sorry. You've been with us a long time. Twenty years. What am I to do, maestro? I know it's hard, but no doubt you've saved enough to retire on. Yes. Yes, of course. And in appreciation of your long service, I shall arrange with the directors to have a season ticket issue to you. <laughs> Thank you, maestro. There are things I can tell you now, things I didn't learn until months, even years later. Laudin had no money put aside. He lived in a miserable garret in the Paris slums. He was cold in the winter and often hungry. What money he earned was used for just one purpose, to provide singing lessons for Christine Dubois. She knew nothing of his sacrifice for her. It was a secret known only to Claudin himself and Signor Ferretti, the singing master. My dear Claudin, if you don't mind my saying so, you're a fool. Signor Ferretti. For three years I've taught Christine Dubois and you have failed. Why? How can a man of your age hope to interest a girl as young as... Signor, you? please. We agreed never to discuss my motives. Very well. So now you have been dismissed from the orchestra. You can no longer pay for her lessons. Is that it? Yes, senor. But I, I hope that you would continue to instruct her. For uh, what? Just for a while. I'll have money soon. A concerto I've written. I've taken it to Monsieur Playel. It's going to be published. Yes, yes. I, I know. Every violinist has written a concerto. Then you'll go on with the lesson, senor? Why should I? Why should I assume your burden? The girl means nothing to me. But her career means a great deal to me, senor. More than anything else. I'm sorry, Claudin. Really sorry. I will uh, let her come a few times. Then I will tell her she no longer needs me. But that isn't true. Perhaps not. Signor, if you will give me just a little more time. You will have time, Claudin, when you have money. Come back when Monsieur Playel has bought your concerto. For weeks, Claudin haunted the publisher's office. But always it was the same story. Monsieur Playel was too busy to see him. One evening, just at dusk, Claudin forced his way past the manager, up the stairs into Playel's study. Who's that? Monsieur Playel. What are you doing here? I've been waiting to see you since this morning. Didn't they tell you I was busy? Georgette, more acid, please. Is this the bottle? The blue one, dear. Pour it in the tray and be careful, dear. Monsieur Playel. This should be the best etching I've ever made, Georgette. Monsieur. Will you please be careful? Those trays contain etching acid. Would you like to burn the skin from your hands? I'm sorry, monsieur, but my manuscript. I must find out about my concerto. Georgette, would you mind giving the fellow his manuscript? You'll find it on the table if it's anywhere. What is your name? Claudin. Eric Claudin. Claudin? 
I don't see it. No, 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 it wouldn't be there. It's a large manuscript in a portfolio. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't know where it is. Oh, but it must be here. Well, if it is, it'll turn up. You might call again in a few days. But you don't understand, mademoiselle. It's the only copy I have. It represents two years' work. You heard what the lady said? Get out. But it was brought into this office. It must be here. It must be found. Did we ask you to bring your manuscript to us, Claudin? Perhaps some employee has thrown it into the waste paper basket where it probably belongs. Good night. Listen. That piano. That's my music. Someone's playing my music. I thought I told you to get out. Thief. You stole on my music. Thief. Help. Let him go. Let him go. You stole on my music. Thief. Thief. You're choking him. Do you hear? Let him alone. I'll burn you if you don't let him go. This is acid. I'll burn Thief. you. Thief. My work. My music. My music! It was mine! He had no right! You killed him! You! Ah! My eyes! My eyes! Ah! In that room, a man lay dead on the floor, and Claudin stumbled down the steps, screaming in agony, the acid burning into his face. Ah! Into the street he ran with his hands before him groping his way blindly through the darkness. Oh. He was seen once on the Rue du Jardin and again in a dim street near the opera. And then he was gone, lost in the black of the night. Oh. 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 There was a search, of course, but he was never found. It was not a thing that was close to any one of us. It was something you read about in the newspaper, shudder over for a moment, and then try to forget. In a few days, it was out of our minds completely, for Christine and I were rehearsing a new opera. One morning, we were sitting at the piano in her hall. <laughs> well, that's very nice. What is it, Christine? It's a lullaby of Provence. Provence? I was born there, you know. I've known it for years, ever since I can remember. Sing it for me. If you like. Hear those bells ringing soft and low, bringing peace through the twilight glow, calling to everyone, night has begun. Lovely, Christine. Christine! Yes, Aunt Berta. Didn't you hear the door? Monsieur Dobert is here. Good morning, Christine. Raoul, good morning. You see, monsieur? They call this rehearsing. Rehearsing. Huh. Well, I'm sorry to intrude, but I must speak to you, Christine. But, but you see, I- I'm busy right now, Raoul. Anatole has been helping me. Yes, uh, to rehearse. Yes. Uh, monsieur is very kind. Well, not at all, monsieur. I find it a pleasure. I'm Anatole Garon of the opera. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is Inspector Daubert of the Sûreté. Oh, the policeman. Police inspector, monsieur. Ah, yes, of course. I've heard of you, Inspector. Your work must be very exciting. Oh, not half so exciting as yours, monsieur. It doesn't lend itself to self-expression. <laughs> Christine, I'd like to see you alone, please. I'm here on business. With me? What business could Mademoiselle have with the Sûreté? What is it, Raoul? If you don't mind, I'd rather Anatole stayed. Very well. Christine, do you know Eric Claudin? Why, yes. How well? Oh, I knew him as a violinist in the orchestra. Oh, I met him a few times in the foyer on the stage or outside the opera, but, but that's all. He he acted a little strangely. Strangely? How do you mean? Well, I, I don't know. He just he just seemed eccentric, but, but harmless. I thought he was a rather kindly fellow until I read of the murder. What is it, Raoul? Well, he was a kindly fellow until he thought Playel was robbing him of his work. Then something snapped, and he became a homicidal maniac. But what has all this to do with me? Well, we found something in his room, Christine, that connects you with him. No doubt you can explain. What is it? This statuette. 
As you can see, Christine, it's the image of you. So that's what became of it. Be good enough to explain yourself, monsieur. Why, certainly, that statuette is mine. Yours? Definitely, I made it. I intended to make you a present of it, Christine. How nice of you, Anatole. Unfortunately, it disappeared from my dressing room. Hmm. That's an extraordinary likeness. My compliments on your versatility, monsieur. Christine must have posed for this many times. I never posed for it, not once. You did this from drawings, monsieur? And from memory, monsieur. Extraordinary memory. Thank you. But it's a simple matter to recall Christine's face and figure. I'm sure you have found it so, monsieur. Mm Mm-hmm. But what was the statuette doing in Clodin's room? He must have stolen it. It's obvious. Is it? Speaking purely as an inspector of the Sûreté, I'm afraid even the obvious needs confirmation. But as a man, monsieur, I'm sure you can understand. Sitting there in the orchestra pit night after night looking at Christine, Clodin probably fell in love with her. You admit that is possible, no? Mm Mm-hmm. Christine, did Claudin ever seek more than a casual acquaintance with you? No, never. Can you imagine so diffident a lover, monsieur? Claudin was barely 50. No doubt he lacked fire. No doubt. Christine, this statuette is yours. I give it to you. You give it to her? Yes. Well, that's interesting. (laughs) I'll accept it as a gift from both of you. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. It seems I have the worst of this bargain. In the future, Monsieur Inspector, I detect you model. In any case, that was a bad clue. Oh, not so bad as it seems. It enabled me to recover Mademoiselle's statuette. Is, uh, is that your carriage at the door, Monsieur? Yes. Would you be good enough to give me a lift? Well, um, which way are you going? Oh, it doesn't matter. As Inspector of Police, I have business all over Paris. Well, in that case, au revoir, Christine. Au revoir. You've been most helpful, Christine. Most helpful. I I hope you catch Claudin. Thank you. Well, you ready, monsieur? At your service. After you, monsieur. After you, monsieur. Thank you, monsieur. (laughs) We could laugh then because the horror had not touched us. We didn't know that in the cabins of the sewer beneath the opera there was a shadow darker than the surrounding gloom. The shadow of a man in a black cloak, his face hidden behind a mask. This was the man whose features had been burned and whose mind was on fire. Before long, that shadow was to envelop all of us. In a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, Basil Rathbone, and Edgar Barrier, will return in Act Two of The Phantom of the Opera. One way you can be sure of having the last word in an argument is to have an argument with yourself, as this young lady is doing, for instance. I don't see anything the matter with my skin, really. Doesn't look as nice as it used to look. It does so. It's just that the light over this mirror is so bright. Well, doesn't Johnny Brooks always tell me I have a complexion like a million? Hasn't said so for a good long time. Well, he's been away at camp, Smarty, that's why. He's due for a furlough most any time now. Maybe you'd better start doing something about your skin. How about some real beauty care instead of that dip, dab, lick and promise kind of treatment you've been giving it lately? Maybe I'd better. Yes, I will. I'll try those beauty facial screen stars use. Active lather facials with Lux Toilet Soap every single day. If it works for the screen stars, it ought to work for me, too. Well, she'll find it does work. This gentle complexion care used by 9 out of 10 Hollywood stars. You see, Lux Toilet Soap is a real beauty soap. With lather so rich and smooth and super fine, it feels like a caress on the skin. Lovely screen stars tell you they take their Lux Soap beauty facials this way. They smooth lots of the creamy active lather well in. They rinse with warm water and splash with coal. Then they pat their skin dry with a soft towel. Now, that's a very simple, easy care. But if you use it every day, you'll find that soon your skin feels softer, smoother, takes on a fresher, lovelier look. Why not get some Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? You'll notice each satiny white cake is hard milled. That means it lasts and lasts. And remember, it's patriotic not to waste soap. 
Use only what you need. Don't leave your cake of Lux toilet soap standing in water. And be sure always to put it in a soap dish that's dry. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of The Phantom of the Opera. Starring Nelson Eddy as Anatole, Susanna Foster as Christine, and Basil Rathbun as Claudin, with Edgar Barrier as Raoul. There was a master key at the opera house, and the night we were to sing Amour et Gloire, the key disappeared. Other things had been stolen. Costumes, masks. But now the shadow had entrance to 2,500 doors. He could roam at will from the sub-cellars to the very top of the auditorium, where the great chandelier swung over the audience. There were some who swore they had seen this shadow, flung on the walls of dim corridors, or crouching like a griffon on the high balconies over the street. And there were some who swore they had heard mutterings in the deep cellars where the sewers ran black. And tonight, so tonight, it is Amour et Gloire. Amour et Gloire with Anatole Garon and the soprano Biancaroli. Biancaroli sings tonight, not Christine Dubois. Well, we shall see. We shall see. It was strange the way it happened. In the third act, the libretto called for me to give Biancaroli a cup of wine. When she had drunk it, I thought for a moment that her face paled. She finished her aria and left the stage. But she was late for her next entrance. There was a wait. And then came the cadenza from off stage. I knew that voice. But it was not Biancaroli who was making the entrance. It was her understudy, Christine Dubois.
I was perfectly well during the second act. You saw me, Maestro. Madame Biancaroli, we realized If you, that you realized I was drugged, then tell that police inspector there to arrest the man who did it. We all know who it was. Anato Garon. I know nothing of the sort, madame. I am a police officer, not a psychic. It is my duty to collect evidence without prejudice. Haven't you evidence enough? Everyone knows Madame, that... will you be seated, please? Monsieur Garon, is it true that you had the opportunity during tonight's performance to place the drug in Madame Biancaroli's glass? Certainly, Monsieur Inspector. We all did. It becomes then a question of motive. The motive is very simple. Garon wanted to get me out of the way to make room for that... Are little... you referring to Christine Dubois? I am. You heard, Monsieur Garon? Oh, yes. Madame is in good voice and most explicit. Have you anything to say, monsieur? I deny madame's accusation. Do you deny, monsieur, that you had any motive in drugging madame? I deny that I drugged her. Monsieur Inspector, I do not understand your reluctance to make an arrest. You are not an examining magistrate. Can you substantiate your charge that Anatole Garon had a motive in drugging you and that the motive was Christine Dubois? Why, anybody with half an eye would be able to tell Hearsay you. Hearsay is not evidence, Then madame. I'll go over your head. I have influence at the Sûreté. I was drugged tonight to the point of death. And I insist upon the arrest of the criminal and his accomplice. And if you don't... One moment, madame, please. You've heard Garon deny that he drugged you. As the inspector says, there is no evidence to warrant an arrest. If you insist upon it and fail to gain a conviction, you will find yourself in a very difficult predicament. Yes, quite right. And no matter what the outcome, don't forget that your career is bound to the Paris Opera. Whatever scandal injures us or any member of the company will injure you as well. Are you suggesting that I forget the whole affair? Yes, for your own sake as well as ours. Very well. That is under certain conditions. I want a new understudy. Christine Dubois goes back to the chorus and stays for the two years my contract has to run. No, I won't permit it. If any such arrangement is my made, I'll go... My dear Anatole, I have not finished. I go a step farther. I suggest that we all forget that anything happened afterwards. For once, madame, I don't understand you. Oh, but it's so simple. Nothing happened tonight. I was not drugged, and Christine Dubois did not sing. What? Madame, there are always critics in the house. You will send word to the papers that no mention of hers to be made. You'll do nothing of the sort. It's ridiculous. Besides, what about the public? Shall we send word to the public to forget that Mademoiselle Dubois was a sensation? If you are willing to ruin the opera for the sake of Christine Dubois, that's your affair. But you'll either do as I say, or I will charge both of you with trying to murder me. Do you understand that? Murder! Ah, Madame Biancaroli. Good evening, Maria. Oh, Madame, you were magnificent tonight. Oh, my dress, please. You really thought so, Maria? Oh, yes, Madame. The best I've ever heard you. Especially in the part with Garon. The cadenza from off stage. it was so... Oh, you liked that, did you? Why, yes, Madame, it... Uh... Yes. Yes, I was very good tonight. My dressing gown, Maria. Yes, Madame. Ah! Maria! Madame! Madame! What's the matter with you? A man, Madame. Outside the window on the balcony. Oh, don't be a fool. How could a man... Madame. Good evening. What do you want here? I'm sorry. I cannot let you see my face. You would not be pleased. Take off that mask, Anatole Garon. You do not frighten me. Madame, it is not Anatole Garon. I did not come here to frighten you unnecessarily. Only to tell you that Christine Dubois will sing tomorrow night. Oh, yes. You will leave Paris, madame. Leave Paris? You will see to it, of course. Yes, I will see to it, madame. Get back. Madame. Do you force me to reason with you, madame? I will not leave. Get away from me. I am sorry, madame. <coughs> I am very sorry. <coughs> Anatole. Anatole. What is it? Madame Bianca Rolli and her maid. They have been murdered. The opera was closed for almost a week. And then from somewhere within the darkened building, a note was written to the directors. Gentlemen, the opera must open very soon. Christine Dubois will replace Bianca Rolli who chose to ignore my advice. Good morning. Yes? Is, is Christine at home? Yes. Well, may I see her, please? 
Come in. I'll tell her you're here. Thank you. E vieni alla finestra, o mio tesoro. Beautiful, monsieur, beautiful. Oh, I didn't see you, Inspector. Good morning. How's the opera business, monsieur? Well, very poor at the moment. How's the inspecting? Very good. Splendid. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Not at all. <clears throat> good morning. Oh, good, oh, good morning, morning, Christina. Christina. Aunt Bertha told me you were waiting together. Did you amuse each other? <laughs> good. May I Christine, have a word I wonder with you? If I... Sorry, monsieur. After you, monsieur. After you. Thank you. What Christina, I was you going and I to say... Only... One <laughs> at a time, please. Anatole? They're going to open the opera, Christine. You and I are going to sing together. You are wrong, monsieur. I'm sorry, Christine. They are going to reopen the opera, but without you. Circumstances connected with the murder of Bianca Roli demand that someone else sing the leading role in your place. Really? You may be interested to know, Monsieur Dobert, that circumstances connected with the murder of Bianca Roli demand that Christine does sing. Well, the police have changed that plan somewhat. We are going to draw the murderer out into the open by defying his warning. My men will be posted at every entrance and exit. And probably miss him. <laughs> Monsieur... I am aware that your profession requires a certain self-assurance, but aren't you going too far? Not at all. I happen to have a plan of my own for trapping the murderer. So you've turned detective, monsieur? I have. Well, very well, if it amuses you. I might add that my plan is strictly confidential. All I can tell you is that Lorenzi is to sing the role, and I am not in the least interested in your plan. May I have a word with you alone, Christine? Yes, that's what I came for. May I speak to you alone, Christine? But I... I'm going out. Well, my, my carriage, carriage is just, just outside... Well, I... I'm not going right now. I mean, I'm going later. I'll, I'll wait. wait. Yes. Yes, we'll both wait. We were certain now that the murderer was Eric Claudin. The plan I had worked out took me to the home of a great pianist and composer. On the night before we were to open, I went to see Franz Liszt. Ah, uh, very nice. But do you really think this Claude uh, could be tempted to leave his hiding place and risk his life merely to hear his own concerto? Played by Franz Liszt himself, do you doubt it, maestro? Now, my plan is for you to play the concerto be between the second and third acts, and then... Well, when so they... many crimes have been committed in the name of music. It seems only fair to use it now to avert one. I am at your service, monsieur. Oh, thank you, maestro. Uh, most exciting, this detective work. Most exciting. Well, it's more than exciting to me. I have the honor of being suspected of the crime. Gentlemen, I have been very patient. Now I learn that Christine Dubois will not sing. Gentlemen, if Madame Lorenzi sings in her place, you will be responsible. Two are dead now, only two. There will be more, gentlemen, many. Many more. Lorenzi sang that night. Through two acts we waited and nothing happened. An old worker at the opera house thought he saw a figure on the catwalk leading to the dome of the theater. It was the old man's duty to light the monster chandelier, a great heavy thing of glass and bronze held in place by chains. When the police searched the catwalk high over the audience, there was no one there. We began to feel secure. Christine had come to the theater, but she was safe in her dressing room. When I entered from the wings at the finale of the second act, I was thinking only of the opera. Oh, 
to and fro like a giant pendulum. Others had seen it, too. A woman in the audience screamed. There was no time to get out of the way. The audience below was frozen, staring up at the monster of glass and bronze. And then it came hurtling down through space. Doctors. Doctors. Get every doctor you can find in Paris. Watch every entrance. Let no one in or out except doctors and the injured. Christine. Christine, where are you? She's in her dressing room. No, she's not in her dressing room. I've been there. I saw her, monsieur. She went down the steps. You saw Christine Dubois? Yes, monsieur. Yes, monsieur. She was going down the steps beneath the storeroom. I called to her, but she did not answer. Which way are the steps? Over there, monsieur. And there was a man with her. A man in a cloak with a mask covering his face. It's Claudin. She's with Claudin. Christine! Where are you? We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone in Act Three of The Phantom of the Opera. And now, our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with a fashion tip. Why, Mr. Kennedy, I thought our listeners would be interested in this little example of resourcefulness on the part of one of our famous stars. Screen stars must look chic and glamorous always, you know, but they're subject to the same wartime limitations as the rest of us. Take hairpins, for instance. Why, Libby, even a mere man has heard that hairpins are almost as scarce as nylon. (laughs) Alas, that's true, Mr. Kennedy. But Ida Lupino found some wooden ones that were lacquered in bright colors. Much too pretty to cover up, Ida thought. So she parted her hair in back, pulled it up on top of her head, and on each side of the part set a row of the colored pins to make a crisscross pattern. Look cute as could be, too. That sounds like Ida Libby. She's as smart and bright as Quicksilver. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. And she darts around Hollywood almost as fast. She has to, what with her studio work and the hours of war work she puts in. Not much time for beauty care, either. 
That's why she depends more than ever on Lux Toilet Soap for complexion loveliness. My daily active lather facials are such a wonderful beauty aid, she said. Busy women everywhere find that's true, Libby. Those Lux Soap beauty facials take just a few minutes a day. Yet the creamy lather gives skin gentle, thorough care it must have to be soft and lovely. Yes, a few minutes every day to smooth the rich lather in, and you can just feel your skin taking on new freshness and beauty. No wonder Lux Toilet Soap is the beauty soap of the stars. Reason enough why every woman owes it to herself to try it. Lux Toilet Soap is as fine a soap as money can buy. It's hard milled. That means it lasts and lasts. Each cake is set and smooth and fine. And if your dealer is temporarily out of stock due to wartime conditions, please be patient. He'll have more very shortly. Remember, Lux Toilet Soap is worth waiting for. Start your Hollywood beauty care soon. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. There's always excitement backstage after an opening. And you're invited to join us for a chat with our stars when the curtain falls. But now here's Act Three of The Phantom of the Opera, starring Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone with Edgar Barrier. Christine had gone with Claudin. The chorus that night had worn masks, and Daubert had arranged for the police to wear masks, too, so they might mingle with the crowd backstage. That was the way Claudin had enticed her. Thinking he was one of Daubert's men who had come to protect her, Christine followed him down the steps to the cavernous cellars. This way, mademoiselle. Hold tight to my hand. The steps are quite steep. Uh, are you one of the police? Where is Inspector Dobert? He's investigating the cause of the accident. I'll look after you. But why do we have to come down here? Why? Don't you like it down here? It's very lovely. Once you get used to it. Wait, please. Yes? Let, let me see your face. Take off your mask. Oh, no, 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 my dear. I must never do that. Never. You, you're not one of the police. Don't be frightened. I'll watch over you. I've always watched over you, Christine. No! No. No, you must not do that. You'll stay here with me, child, won't you? It's been so lonely without you. But you've come to me at last, haven't you? Sing to me, and I'll play. We'll be together forever. It's beautiful down here. Beautiful. Come now. I'll show you. Come with me. This is the last turn, just through the tunnel. It's you. You're not frightened, are you? It's you. You know I'll not harm you, don't you? How could I harm you? I've always helped you, haven't I? Yes. Yes, what? You, you've helped me. Of course I have. Bianca rolling you. She wouldn't let you sing. She didn't know how much I love you. But now she knows. But it doesn't matter anymore. Nothing matters except you and me. Now you'll sing all you want to. But only for me. You will sing and want to, won't you, my darling? There, there's a piano in the opera for you. We'll, we'll go up there, Miss you. You can play it and I'll sing for you. But you don't understand. We can't go back, ever. It was I who made the chandelier fall. I. For you, Christine. But I warned them. I told them there'd be death and destruction if they wouldn't let you sing. Oh, come. Come, my child. Isn't far now. Look there. Look. Oh. Didn't I tell you it was beautiful here? You didn't know we had a lake all to ourselves? Look at your lake, Christine. You'll love it. You'll love it when you get used to the dark. It's friendly and peaceful. Brings rest and relief from pain. It's right under the opera house. And the music comes down and the darkness distills it, cleanses it of the suffering that made it. Then it's all beauty. And life here is like a resurrection. I came here when my face was on fire. I found calmness in that dark water and comfort in the blackness over it. Then I heard you sing. I thought I died and that you'd come to me. And then the others sang and destroyed my heaven, so I destroyed them. You... You heard me from here? Oh, yes. Why, this is my, my private auditorium. Strange air currents circle these passages. They catch the music as it flutters down like a living bird in a net. You can hear the opera almost as well as from the highest balcony. I heard it. Yes, just as I heard it well, when I first came to Paris. You're not afraid anymore, are you? No. Of course you're not. 
Then come with me. Come. Christine. Christine, where are you? Sure, I'll bring a lantern here. Yes, Monsieur Inspector. Here, Monsieur. Christine! One day, take four men, search the passage to the left. Be careful now. Do you have another lantern, Inspector? This is the only one left. You better stay with me. We seem to have come to the end of the passage. No, we haven't. Isn't that an opening in the wall there to our left? Yes. Yes, it's a tunnel. Keep close to the wall. Feel your way along. There's just a narrow ledge. The sewer must run through here. There it is, just ahead of us. Do you suppose he might have doubled back? He might be upstairs. Why should he be? List will be playing the concerto. He should be starting now. Oh, yes, yes, that brilliant plan of yours. Christine! What? What happened? I touched the side of the wall. The rock came away in my hand. The whole place down here is ready to crumble. Look. Look up there, just ahead. Yeah. It looks almost like a lake. Come on. Christine! 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 My child, this is my home. Furniture from this tall room, even a piano. Do you like it, my dear? You please. Come, give me your cake, my child. And then I'll show you where you will sleep. Listen. Do you hear? My concerto. They're playing my concerto on the stage of the opera. My concerto. I'll play it too, listen, child. It's for you. Yes, yes, for you. You like it, my child? I wrote it only for you. Who are you? Everything I have done has been for you. You understand that, don't you? Who are you? Take off your mask. No, child, no. Listen to that music. Listen. Take off the mask. I'll take it off for you. Why did you do it? Now you see my face. Oh, look at it. Look. No, no! You'll never live here now, will you? <laughs> You'll hate me. A loathsome creature. Hateful, repulsive. No. And I wanted you to love me. Don't come near me! But you'll see you've spoiled it. Go away! Christine! There he is! Get back, Christine! Stand back! <laughs> you fools! You cannot kill me! Nothing can kill me! Not at all! The walls! They're crumbling! They're going to fall! Come over here, quick! Look out! Get out in the passage, under the archway in the passage. <laughs> Christine, are you all right? Yes. Inspector? All right. Claudin, he's still in there under the rock. My shot must have started the cave in. Come, Christine. We'd better start back. But, but Claudin... It's no use. It would take days to get him out. He's dead, Christine. It's so strange. He said he said he wrote the concerto for me, a song I've known since I was a child. Who was he? He came from your district in Provence. Everybody there must have known that old folk song. He, he was almost a stranger to me, and yet somehow I I always felt drawn to him with, with a kind of pity and, and understanding. His suffering and his madness will be forgotten. But his music... His concerto, that will remain. Christine went on to a great career and great fame. The night we sang together for the first time, the corridor outside of a dressing room was jammed with admirers. I had to force my way to a door. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Oh, you were magnificent, Christine. Incomparable, beautiful, a sensation. <laughs> Is that all? I've just begun. It would take days and years <laughs> to tell you how wonderful you were. We're having supper tonight at the Café de l'Opera. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Anatole, but, but I can't tonight. Why not? Have you another engagement? Well, yes. With whom? With me, monsieur. Oh, <laughs> that policeman? Inspector of police, monsieur. Well, how soon will you be ready, Christine? The carriage is waiting. I know Monsieur Garon will excuse me. How do you know? I have an idea. Why can't we three have supper together? Mm -mm. I am not in the habit of taking baritones to supper. And I don't care to be seen in public with the police. Christine, you'll have to make up your mind finally and irrevocably between the two of us. Exactly. Very well. 
Will you gentlemen excuse me? Of course. Thank you. Good night. What? <laughs> what did she mean, good night? Well, something tells me, monsieur, that she has gone to meet her public. Hmm. Monsieur Caron, would you join me for a bit of supper at the Café de l'Opera? With pleasure, monsieur. Think we can get through that crowd? Certainly. After all, who'd pay any attention to a baritone and a detective? Quite right. Well, should we go? Oh. Huh. After you, monsieur. Oh, no. After you, monsieur. Your Mills Radio Adventure Theater. Welcome to the magic world of radio. I'm Tom Bosley. We've traveled together all over the world and up into the stars seeking the thrills of adventure. But today, we don't have to cross any oceans. Our story is waiting for us right here at home. From the very beginning, America has been one of the greatest adventures of all time. The story of America is packed with enough heroes to fill a fat telephone book. Our story, The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, was adapted specially for the General Mills Radio Adventure Theater by Paul Tripp and stars Ian Martin. I'll return shortly with Act One. <laughs> Only recently, we celebrated our 200th birthday as a free nation. But before we became the 13 United States of America, we were 13 colonies ruled over by the King of England. At that time, a great struggle raged between England and France over the possession of the northern part of our continent. This struggle was called the French and Indian War. Now, only a string of forts protected our colonies against the French and their Indian allies who kept coming down from Canada to attack us. Our story begins at Fort William Henry, which was situated on Lake George in New York, under the command of Colonel Monroe. Come in, come in. Yes, what is it, Sergeant? Urgent news, Colonel. A message just came in from Nathaniel Bumpo. Nathaniel who? Uh, Bumpo, sir, your, your special scout. The Indians call him Hawkeye, sir. Ah, much simpler. For once, I agree with the Indians. Well, now, what's this urgent message? An army of 8,000 French soldiers and Indian warriors under the command of General Montcalm are on their way to attack this fort. Good Lord. 8,000 men? We'd be hard put to defend ourselves. We've only half that number. And that includes our own Indian allies. Uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, speaking of our Indian allies, their chief, Magua the Fox, is still out in the square with his head and hands and feet locked in that wooden contraption like a monkey. Well, serves that scar-faced villain right. Stealing guns and ammunition right from under our noses. Well, his tribe isn't taking it very well, Colonel. When we're attacked by the French, we'll need all the help we can get. We can't afford to offend Magua and his warriors. Well, well... Perhaps you're right, Sergeant. Have Magua released and uh, sent in to me. Yes, sir. Corporal, release Magua and send him in to the colonel. Oh, good Lord, I almost forgot. My daughter Alice is away visiting some friends at Fort Edwards, 40 miles to the north of us. Oh, when the French come, they'll hit that fort first, Yes, sir. precisely. Uh, Sergeant, I, I want you to saddle a horse immediately. Ride to Fort Edwards and fetch my daughter. She'll be much safer here. Uh, uh, ah, come in, Magua. On the double, sir. Ah, all right, Magua. What have you to say for yourself? You have disgraced me in front of my tribe. I will not stand for stealing in my fort. Oh, come now, Magua. This is no time to quarrel. What's done is done, eh? We have a great task ahead of us. A great army sweeps down upon us from Canada. I shall need every warrior in your tribe to fight beside me. First you shame me. Now you need me. 
Is that the way of the white man? <laughs> Magua, let bygones be bygones, eh? Why don't you go now and prepare your braves for battle? I will go and speak to them. Tonight, Red Eagle, you will take our tribe silently out of this place where I have been shamed. You will lead them toward Fort Edwards. But, but you, Magua, why will you not lead us? Because I leave now. The colonel has sent his sergeant to bring his pale-faced daughter from Fort Edwards to safety here. <laughs> we shall see how safe she will be when I ambush the sergeant and take the colonel's daughter myself. Are the English about to be attacked, Magua? Yes, but we shall not fight on their side. We shall fight by the side of the French. Oh, but we are allies to the English. Would you have us break our word to them? Do not teach me how to be a chief. You will do as I say. Oh, there. Oh. <laughs> Who's that? Oh. Oh, great. It's you. What, what are you doing here? The colonel sent me to help bring his daughter. He thought it would be safer. Yeah, he certainly changed his mind about you in a hurry. Is that so surprising? We are good friends now. Hey, wait. Why is your horse suddenly limping? Has he caught a pebble in his hoof? What? Oh, yeah, let me see. <laughs> easy, boy, easy. Now, now, let me see that hoof of yours. Hmm. I don't see anything. <laughs> Lie there, white man. Tonight, when my warriors find you on this trail, they will know what to do with you. Magua will fetch the colonel's daughter. Magua, how good it is to see you. You have been away too long from us, Miss Alice. We have missed the yellow-haired daughter of our colonel. Oh, how very kind of you. Yes, it has been a long time. Six months. How is my father? Oh, he is well. But he is troubled for your safety. A great French army comes from the north to attack the English. Your father sent me to take you back to him. He said you will be safer in his fort. And you come now. At once. <laughs> Bumpo, I'm worried sick. Blast it. I can't keep on calling you by that ridiculous name, Bumpo. Among my red brothers, he is known as Hawkeye. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I remember now. Hawkeye. Well, now, see here, you. What are you doing in my headquarters? Indians are not permitted unless they're invited. This young Indian is my friend. Where I go, he goes. I am Uncas, son of Chingachgook. He's the last surviving member of the Mohicans, the most honorable tribe in this entire state. Now, you treat him with respect, or we'll both skedaddle out of here. Yes, well, <clears throat> well I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Hawkeye. I, I didn't <laughs> mean to offend you. But I'm beside myself with worry. Uh, for your information, it was Uncas here who first discovered General Montcalm's plan to attack this fort. Oh, I see. Well, we're uh, most grateful... Now, about Alice. When I got your message about the coming French attack, I immediately sent my sergeant to fetch her from Port Edwards. I figured she'd be safer with me here. A wise decision, Colonel. Fort Edwards will be attacked first. Yes, but she hasn't arrived yet. She should have been here hours ago. You didn't happen to see any sign of her on your way here? No, nope, but I wouldn't worry too much about it, Colonel. There's no sign of the enemy yet as far as Uncas and I could see. Oh, by the way, when we got here, I didn't notice any sign of your Indian allies. They hiding or something? You're going to need all the help you can get when the French attack. The French and their Indian allies are as countless as the leaves in the forest. Yes. Well, I... I don't have any Indian allies anymore. I had an argument with our chief, Magua, when I caught him stealing guns and ammunition. I had him punished. 
The next thing I knew, he'd walked off with his whole tribe. You have made an enemy, Colonel. When you punished him, you made him lose face. Yeah, this Magua character's a low-down snake. Come on, Uncas, we better make tracks. The Colonel's daughter is in a bigger danger than I first thought. We will wait here. If Magua has stolen her, he will come this way. Shh. Uncas... You are right. It's Miss Alice. And you are right too, Hawkeye. See who leads her horse? Magua Bakkori. Magua, are you sure this is the way to the fort? We must have lost our way. I'm sorry, but you must trust me. Well, I don't. Mr. But... Hawkeye. Howdy, miss. So, friend Magua, you've lost your way in the forest? No Indian can lose his way in the forest, Magua. There is water in your veins. You are a squaw. We shall see which one of us is a squaw. Later! Ah, Ramonkas! Eh, I missed him. Now we're in for it. We better hightail it out of here right quick. Magua will be back with a whole war party. Oh, my fault. I never should have trusted him. Now, don't you worry, miss... We'll get you out of this somehow. I have hunted many times in this place. There is a cave. We shall hide there until dark. Then we shall escape. Miss Alice, dismount, please. We go on foot. Yeah, and I'll stampede this horse the opposite way so he'll throw Margo off the track. Get on, move! Now, we go this way. Quickly. Oh, no, I tore my sleeve on the ground. Don't stop. Keep on a move. <laughs> Ah, here they come. Now we have them. So, they think they have tricked me. They do not know Magua. Come, we will go back in the direction from which the horse came. They cannot be too far away. This is the place where I left them. Now, which way did they run? Uh, Look, Magua. There is a red piece of cloth. Hanging from that branch to the right. And the pale-faced girl wore a dress of red. Come, we go this way. They shall not escape us. There. Now the mouth of the cave is hidden by these branches. I think we're safe. Perhaps we must pray to the great spirit Manitou. When it grows dark, we go... You rest, Miss Alice. Tonight we must run. Oh, thank you, Uncas. Don't worry. I'll keep up with you tonight, I promise. Well, Uncas, I reckon Magua must have done some hunting in these parts, too. He seems to know about this cave. So, Uncas, I am a squaw. I have water in my bed. We shall see who is the mighty warrior. Right now I'm going to see if he'll swallow this bullet. Come on, Mr. McGill. Well, we might as well make ourselves comfortable. Looks like we're going to stay here a little while. Uncas was the last of the Mohicans after whom this adventure is named. The Mohicans were the most peaceable and friendliest tribe in the territory. The other Indians held them in great respect. Each tribe had a totem, a sign which they tattooed on their chests. The totem of the Mohicans was the most highly regarded. It was a turtle. According to Indian legend, when the world was created, it was placed on the back of a giant sleeping turtle. Well, right now, it looks like that turtle is wide awake. Listen a little later in the program for exciting news on how you can enter our Disneyland contest. The General Mills Radio Adventure Theater will return shortly. One minute. Pass it on. Hawkeye was among the great heroes who protected our settlements from unfriendly Indians when our country was very young. Daniel Boone was another one of these brave men. They respected the Indians, learned their ways, and became friends with them. The Indians invented their own names for these heroes. 
Hawkeye was also called Deerslayer and Leatherstocking. Put these three names together and you get a good description of the man who at this very moment is in the cave fighting off Magua and his warriors. Marcus, how much powder and bullets do you have left? Not very much. Well, I'm running short, too. Don't fire unless you get a good target. Magua and his warriors don't seem to be running short. I have a plan. It is a dangerous one, but we have no choice. The girl and one of us must surrender to Magua. We'll do anything you say, Uncle. But if we surrender, how will that help us? Isn't that exactly what Magua wants? Oh, easy, miss. You go on, Uncle. One of us will surrender with Miss Alice and mix two of us. Now, what what will the third one do, huh? You or me? The third one must escape. See? The sun is setting now. The shadows are many. It would be easy to crawl out of this cave and escape. I'm with you so far. Then what? Which one of us will go? I think it would be better if I went. If they did catch sight of me, they would only see another Indian and think I was one of them. All right, that's good thinking. And after that? When I am safely away, I will signal with the call of the mockingbird. Then, and not till then, you will surrender. Magua has captured us. Won't he do terrible things to us? I fail to understand your plan. I will explain. He and his warriors now wear war paint on their faces. I think it is their plan to join with the French when they attack Fort William Henry. They will do nothing to you tonight. Tonight will be the time for war dancing. It is the way of the Indian just before battle. Then, they will sleep. When they sleep, I will come and free you. In the morning, we will be gone. Well, like you say, Uncas, it's a dangerous plan. But it sure is better than the three of us sticking around here like setting ducks. I will go now. Hawkeye, fire some shots now so that Magua does not suspect a trick. Till we meet again, my good friends. Zunk is gone, Miss. Yeah. Well, that's good. And all we have to do is wait until he signals. So, uh, make yourself comfortable, Miss Ellis. You're a strange man, Hawkeye. Nothing ever seems to bother you. <laughs> There's no sense in losing sleep over something happening when it hasn't happened yet. Your friend Uncas, he's such a fine young man. Indians and white men could learn to live at peace with each other. This is such a wonderful new country. It's a shame it has to be spoiled by hatred and bloodshed. Shh, wait, wait, wait. That's Uncas signaling us. Oh, sir, I reckon it's time to surrender to that moment. Hey, Magua! Call off your men! We're coming out! Now don't shoot! We surrender! No tricks! One false move, and you die. Here we are, Magua. Wait. There were three in the cave. I see only two. Where's the other? Uncas. Uncas? Oh, him. He ran out on us. Scared of you, I guess. Oh, ho, 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 ho. So, Uncas, the great and brave warrior, has run away. And he called me a squaw. Oh, do not look so frightened, daughter of the foolish colonel. I will not harm you. Not yet. Magua, you should be ashamed of yourself. My father trusted you. Trusted me? He shamed me. And this I will never forget. What would the great English colonel say if he heard that Magua had a new wife in his wigwam? A pale-faced, yellow-haired squaw. I'll see you, Miss Alice. Will you be the wife of Magua? I'd sooner die first. Let me go. Hey, that's a girl. Ah. So, first the father shame me, then the daughter strikes me. For this, you shall die. Hold it, Magua. Ain't you forgetting something? Magua, forget nothing. What mean you? Well, tomorrow at sunrise, you go into battle. Is it not the custom of the Indian to celebrate war dances and then sleep and rest so that he may awake with fresh strength? He speaks truly, Magua. He knows our ways. In the morning before the battle, 
You can do as you wish with the pale faces. Ah, very well. I will be patient. Tie the man and the woman to that tree. Right. Let them stand there all night and think upon what shall happen to them in the morning. You all right, Miss Alice? Fine. My wrists hurt. They tied them so tightly. Now be patient. Them Indians have been asleep for some hours. Uncas ought to be along any minute now. But the moon is so bright. It's almost like daylight. That sentry over there is sure to see him. Yeah, maybe. But do you see a bank of dark clouds coming in from the west? <laughs> He'll be covering the moon any minute now. That's Uncas now signaling us. I'll answer him back. Won't be long now, miss. Hey, Uncas, here we are. Quietly. Now, while I cut you loose. Oh, what a relief to be free again. Quickly now. We must go before the moon is uncovered again. This way. No, no, that's not the way to the ford. Why are we going toward the river? Because a canoe waits for us there. I did not think Miss Alice could walk so far. We are getting closer to the fort. What are those flickering lights ahead of us? The campfires of the French army. During the night, while you were tied to the tree, the soldiers and Indians surrounded Fort Edwards and made camp. At sunrise, they attack. <clears throat> Lucky for us, there's all the clouds in the sky hiding the moon. We'll never get past the guard. Where is the fort ahead of us? Now, you two go on ahead without me. Aren't you, aren't you coming in with us? Now, from the looks of all them campfires around us, the French general has brought more of an army than we figured on. You're going to need plenty of help here. I'm heading back to Fort Edwards. Maybe if I ask politely, General Webb will send a rescue party back with me. In you go now. There's light coming up from the east. Oh, thank heaven you're safe, Alice. Father, Uncle saved my life. Oh, well, I'm much obliged, young man. Oh, where's Hawkeye? Why isn't he here? He's gone to Fort Edwards to bring us some help. Help? We don't need any help. We can handle this ourselves. Colonel, you have not seen the true picture of what faces you. In the night, while you were asleep, the French general came with his army. This fort is now surrounded on all sides. Father, Uncle speaks the truth. And here is another truth you will not like, Colonel. The man who was once your ally, Magua, the man whom you punished and put to shame, that same Magua and his warriors now fight against you on the French side. I'm a traitor. We are now all in danger together. The sun is rising. The attack will come any time now. Yes, you're quite right. I'm behaving like a fool. There is the enemy, Colonel. The enemy you did not believe was here. Yes, so it is. So it is. Uh, Alice, my dear. Yes, father. Choose a cabin and, and set up a camp hospital. I'm afraid there will be many wounded. I'll get some of the women to help. Good. Now, let me see. May I suggest, Colonel, that buckets of water be placed around every cabin in the fort. What on earth for? Magua will have his braves shoot flaming arrows on the rooftops. If the fires are not put out at once, the fort will burn to the ground. Good Lord, I never thought of that. Uh, Sergeant, have the men place buckets of water in each cabin in case of fire. Uh, anything else, Uncas? How long can you hold out? Do you have enough food and water in the fort? Oh, enough for three days, I should say. It may not be enough. If I were an English colonel, I would order my soldiers to cut their rations in half. Then we could hold out twice as many days. <laughs> my George, Uncas, you should have been a general. Thank you. Now pass the word along. Yes, Uncas, I, I know what you're going to ask now. We have plenty of ammunition. And if we run out before Hawkeye comes with help, we'll fight them with our bare hands. Indian fighting in those days was something the English soldiers did not understand. They didn't understand the guerrilla type of fighting such as we've had in our times. During the same French and Indian War, an English general, Braddock, 
innocently marched his army into a forest somewhere near Pittsburgh as though it was a parade. They were ambushed by Indians who waited for them from behind trees. Only the bravery of a young colonel from Virginia saved that army from complete disaster. The name of that young colonel? George Washington. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. The General Mills Radio Adventure Theater will return shortly. In those early days when our country was young, all the forts, including Fort William Henry, were made out of wood, which explains why Uncas was so worried about flaming arrows. A fort was usually a cluster of log cabins surrounded by a tall wall of thick logs, which all were whittled to a point to prevent the enemy from climbing over. And behind this wall, platforms were placed from which soldiers shot down at the enemy. It's on one of these platforms that we now discover Colonel Monroe and Uncle. How much food have we left? Enough, perhaps, for another day. But what is worse is that we have only one box of ammunition remaining. And then there's only one thing left to do. And that is to pray that Hawkeye gets through to Fort Edwards to get help. Look, look, Uncas. French are wheeling up a cannon. One blast from that and half our wall will be torn apart. Men, direct your fire at the soldiers behind that cannon. Don't give them a chance to fire it. What? No! Oh, my arm. You've been hit, Colonel. Here, I will remove the arrow from your arm. And then I will take you to your daughter to find your wound. No, no. I must stay here with my men. Colonel, a dead soldier is not a good soldier. You come with me. Miss Alice. Miss Alice, help your father. He has been wounded. It's just a scratch, my dear. He's almost run out of bandages. Pull out your arm, Father. I... Wait, I have some dried herbs in my pouch. Put some on his arms. It is strong medicine. The arm will heal well. Thank you, Uncas. Uncas, I know I've said some pretty horrible things about you Indians. But I take it all back. You've been a tower of strength to me. I'm very grateful. What was that? Oh, French cannon must have torn a breach in our wall. I must go and inspect the damage. No, Father, not until I've bandaged your arm. I will go, Colonel. Very well. Uncas, tell my men to wheel all our wagons in front of the hole in the wall. We must hold them up somehow or they'll be inside the fort before we know it. I'm sorry, Alice. I got you into this. I could have left you safe in England. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. My place is with you. Uh, now what's going on? Colonel. Colonel, the French general approaches the fort under a flag of truce. He will wish to speak to you. Probably wishes to discuss the terms of surrender. Very well, I'll speak to him. Have I the honor of addressing the commandant of this fort? I am Colonel Monroe, at your service. And I am General Montcalm. I regret that we meet under such sad circumstances... You have fought very bravely. Thank you. For that, I salute you. But look around you. I have twice the men you have. Half your wall is down. You cannot hope to hold out much longer. Perhaps. But I'm expecting a relief force from Fort Edwards. We'll beat you yet. Now, I admire your courage, but let me point out to you that Fort Edwards is also surrounded. There will be no rescue. You can take his word for it, Colonel. Hawkeye, where on earth did you spring from? What about the relief party from Fort Edwards? Didn't you tell General Webb we needed help? Fort Edwards is surrounded. You better face it, Colonel. You're on your own now. Very well. <clears throat> General Montcalm, we will surrender. What are your terms? Generous. Except for one thing. My orders are to burn this fort to the ground. We have no desire to harm your men. Therefore, you will all be permitted to march out of the fort with all military honors. You will then be escorted to a safe place. You guarantee our safety? Hold it, Colonel. Isn't that Magwan is brave standing outside the gates? 
I doubt if the general can guarantee our safety with him around. I swear to you upon my honor, you and your men will be safe. The Indians are under my command. They will obey my orders. Very well, then. I accept your terms. A wise decision. By the way, Colonel, where's your daughter, Alice? Still in the fort with Uncas. She'll be safe with him. Sound the fife and drum. never forgive myself for this breach of honor. But at least the Indians have been driven off. And I promise you, Chief Magua will be punished immediately. Well, you can punish Magua when you find him. But I've got bad news for you, Colonel. What's that? Your daughter Alice and Uncas have disappeared. A little more of Magua's dirty work. General Montcalm, you must send your soldiers after them immediately. They have my daughter. Easy does it, Colonel. If Magua and his men are attacked, we'll never see your daughter and Uncas alive again. No, I, I think a little brain work is required. General Montcalm, I wonder if one of your officers would be good enough to lend me his uniform. Yes, of course. You expect to disguise yourself as a French officer? But Magua knows your face. You'll never get away with it. Well, sir, that remains to be seen, doesn't it? Great and ancient Tamamon, great chieftain of Indian nation, tell me why you look so angry and scowl at me. Am I not a guest in your camp? Let the dancing cease. I command. Listen to me, Magua, and listen well. Your French general gave his word that the English soldiers would be safe. It was not my word. He spoke for all. In the days of my youth, there were warriors who held honor more dear than life. Old man, hold your tongue. Soon you will die. And I shall be chief in your place. Nah. Why does it matter what you say? I still have my two prisoners. Bring them in. So, Magua, brave warrior, I see you also fight against women. Chief Tavamund, I heard your words to Magua. Don't let him harm me and my friend Uncle. Silence. You are my prisoners, not his. I'm free to do with you as I like. Ah, bonsoir, my friend Magua. I'm glad I found you. Uh, French officer. Ah, uh, what do you want here? I am the personal doctor of General Montcalm. He ordered me to come to your camp to see if I could help your wounded warriors. Where are the wounded? Over there? Well, very well. I will go and see what I can do. And uh, permit me to release this white woman. I will need her for help. But she is ah, my prisoner. Monsieur Magua, do you not trust me? Am I not your friend? Well... Very well. Be quick. But of course. <laughs> Come, mademoiselle. And uh, please to bring that blanket with you. I will be quick, Magua. Oh, Another word. Just open 
open that blanket quickly. Now lie down in it and let me wrap it around you. I don't understand. I'm carrying you out of this camp right under Magua's nose. Uncas, what about him? First things first. Excuse me now while I cover your face and your hair. Now. Here we go. French medicine man. What you carry in your arms? Uh, one of your warriors. He has a great fever. I take him to my hospital to care for him better. The uh, mademoiselle will be with you directly. Au revoir, magua, mon ami. Ah, you see, old Tamamund, the French pale faces are my friends. But they will never forget your evil deed. Old oh, man, the years have put too many words in your mouth. Wait. Where is the yellow-haired squaw? Ah, tricked. I have been tricked. She's gone. That French doctor. It was Hawkeye, Magua. Did you not recognize him? Uncas, oh, you shall pay for this. You shall pay and pay with every bone in your body. I am ready, squaw warrior. Oh, enough of this wrangling. Enough. Angry word for one day. You, Uncas, are you indeed Mohican? I am the last. Can you not see the totem of the turtle tattooed on my chest? Aye, aye. The turtle is indeed proudly there. Magua, you shall not kill Uncas while he is helpless. A Mohican deserve better. Why have you freed him, old man? That he may defend himself. Here, Uncas, is my tomahawk. But he is my prisoner. Then take him if you can. And Uncas, may our great god Manitou give strength to your right arm. Then I shall kill you both. Soon you will lie in the dust, Uncas. But first, here is some dust for your eyes. Uh-huh. I, I cannot see. I cannot see. Uh, Chiro, Magua, why have you thrown earth in his eyes? Where is your honor? Hey, my tomahawk. Die, Uncas. Die. <laughs> Bullseye. You're lucky, Magua. I hit the tomahawk instead of you. Hail, Tamamon, great chief. You are most welcome, man with a hawk eye. Magua, your treachery has offended me for the last time. Drive this renegade out of my camp. When I die, Ancus shall be chief in my place. Warriors, hear the last words of Tamamon. Because Magua has brought the anger of the white man upon us, soon the red man will be forced to go toward the setting sun to find new hunting ground. But do not be afraid, for a young and wise chieftain will lead you. Ancas, son of Chingachgook, known forever as the last of the Mohican. And that was the way it happened, just as Tamilman predicted. The Indians went west to find new lands, and so did the pioneers. And Hawkeye was among them, helping the covered wagons cross the plains and up over the Rocky Mountains until they reached the Pacific Ocean. Thirteen colonies grew into a great nation. I'll be back shortly. More than 200 years have passed since the time of our adventure. Lake George, where once Fort William Henry so bravely stood, is now a peaceful place where people swim in the summer and ski in the winter. There are no scars left from the past. And Canada, from where the French and Indian Army once invaded the United States, is now our neighbor and a good friend. There are no unfriendly borders. Canadians and Americans can go freely without passports. I think the early settlers would be very pleased. Our 
cast included Ian Martin, Court Benson, Morgan Fairchild, Robert Dryden, and Russell Horton. If you missed the details on how to enter our Disneyland contest, be sure to tune us in tomorrow. This is Tom Bosley inviting you to return to the General Mills Radio Adventure Theater for another exciting tale you can hear through the magic of radio. The General Mills Radio Adventure Theater is recommended by NEA, the National Education Association. Hi, gang. Bob Bovin here to unleash the Mystery Project. The sight of a body lying by a dark country road is enough to unsettle any person. But when the body disappears and the police get nasty, then you can't blame a girl for getting upset and a little paranoid. The play is called Dead Drop by Max Marquis. It's in two parts, and this is the opener. Did you hear anything? Like what? I don't know. A collision, something like that. No, Jim. Oh, you know, Hampstead Heath really is marvelous. We could be miles from town, right in the country, instead of, well, about three miles from Euston. Hmm. I think I'll have to move up to Hampstead one day. It's expensive. It depends. Yes, I suppose you're right. Unless we both... There's no move. chance of that. No. Well, not for a while, anyway. What's that? Look, there's someone lying by the roadside. Oh, it's, it's probably a drunk or a tramp. We, we don't want to... Oh, we can't it. just leave him. Well, he'll be all right when he stepped it off. Harold, stop. We've got to go back well, and have it's a... it's not up to us. Harold! Oh, well. I'll go. You stay in the car. I'll come with you. I'd rather you didn't. He's very still. Harold, his eyes are open. June... Keep away. He's dead. What? How? I, I don't know. Heart attack, I suppose. Isn't that blood on the road? N no. Oil. It's these yellow lights, they make things look different. Well, come on. Back to the car. But, He's dead now. Come on. But, how would you come on. my arm? Then hurry up. God. I told you to stay here. I try to forget it. I'll, I'll give you a drink in a minute. We've got to report it. But we don't terrible. want to get involved. But we have Look, to. Look, the pair of us out together at this time of night. We've only been for a drink. drink. Probably get our names in the papers, policemen calling at us at work, inquest. But we've got to do something. Why? Somebody might have killed him. Oh, come on. Look, there's a phone box. I'll call the police anonymously and tell them what we saw. How's that? Well, uh, well what more can we tell them than what we saw? All right, but, but I'll phone. Well, if you like. But no names, though. No. Distribution? Harold, it's me. I have to see you now. Uh, I'm afraid we're rather busy at the moment. Can I call you back? No, it's important. Well, I'll see. It can't wait. Very well. I'll come along now. Where is it to be picked up, please? I'll meet you at uh, Westminster Underground Station. Say ten minutes. Fifteen at the outside. Now, look, June. What's all this about? I had to spin a yarn to my chief about a file going Read missing. Read that. Have you got me out just to... Read it. Hampstead Police, answering a 999 call made late last night by an, an anonymous woman reporting a dead man by the roadside at the Heath, found no trace of a body. A search was carried out and resumed at first light this morning without success. It was either a hoax 
or a drunk who got up and walked away, a local police spokesman said. But there was a body there. They couldn't have missed it. Oh, wait a minute. Perhaps it was a drunk after all. It, uh, it could even have been... You said yourself he was dead. Well, keep the voice down. Look, we can't talk here. Let's, let's go onto the bridge. We've got to do something. June, let's think for a moment. If it would have caused trouble to report it and give our names last night, how much more of a mess would it be now? I don't Look see that. Us. Look, you're pretty, but sometimes you're not very bright for your grade. Two civil servants out for a night's boozing at the Spaniards, followed by a bit of you-know-what in the bushes. Well, we didn't. Yeah, don't I know it? Oh, be serious. I am. No, really, that's how it'll look. But we... Wait. There's Sybil... If she suspects I might want a divorce, then I've got someone, well, th that I love. Darling. Well, she'll hang on forever just to be a bitch. I don't know. There was a dead man there. I thought he was he dead. He was. What happened to him? We've got to report it, give them full details. Why? No, listen. What more can we tell them than we've told them already? What good would it do? At least they'll know. Will they? I'm not so sure. And let's face it, we did have a few drinks. I wouldn't have fancied my chances with the breathalyzer. I could have been wrong. It looks as if I was. Now, let's forget it, darling. It can't do any good. And it might do us... Our chances, a lot of harm. Mm. But forget it. You won't go to the police. All right. Promise? Promise. I'm Inspector McAndrew, CID. The desk sergeant says you claim you saw a dead body in Windmill Lane last night. That's right. I made the 999 call. Yes, I've, uh, I've got the report. We uh, didn't find any dead bodies. There was one. Then I wonder what happened to it. I don't know. But he was dead. <sighs> Look, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Coney... You'd be surprised how many dead bodies on the heath we get reported. But when we get there, they're either drunk or just plain shagged out, if you see what I mean. This one was dead. He was lying there with his eyes open. Very well. Let's start from the beginning. What time was this? 11.15, 11.20. You on foot? Driving? Driving. Towards town. I'd been to meet a friend for a drink at the Spaniards. Were you alone? Yes. Are you sure? Of course. Well, uh, you saw this uh, body by the roadside. Yes. Well, there was this man lying there, one arm sort of half under his head. His eyes were open. He was dead. How did you know? You could tell. So I, I, I drove onto a phone box and dialed 999. But you didn't wait? No. Why? I didn't want to get involved. Statements, inquest, all that. But you are involved. You've uh, you've come back all the way from um, SW15. Why? I had to. I read in the paper about you're not finding the body. I, I realised there was something wrong. How long had he been dead? I don't know. No, was he warm, cold, stiff? I didn't touch him. Because you could see he was dead. You didn't need to feel for a pulse or anything. No. He had his arm half under his head. Yes. As though he was sleeping. Well? He wasn't asleep. Can you describe him? Oh, it was all rather... Oh, you know, he, he was... What a... Medium sort of man. Didn't look all that closely. No. I don't suppose you did. What's that supposed to mean, Inspector? Just agreeing with you, miss. Well, thank you very much. You've been most helpful. Come in. Hello, Petra. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Hart. Oh, Mr. Coleman won't be a moment. Mm, I like that suit. Thank you. Oh, what have you been doing while I was away? Oh, nothing. It's been very dull. I'm ready, Petra. Very good, Mr. Coleman. You can go in now. On my hands and knees, or may I walk this time? <laughs> oh, hello, Hart. 
That Cambridge business all finished now? One dead, two arrested, and one recalled. Yes, I'd say it was finished. Fancy being sent to Cambridge to spy. Here, have a look at this newspaper cutting, will you? Hampstead Police answering a 999 call. Oh, no, 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 no. Dead man by the roadside found no trace of a body. A hoax or a drunk who walked away. Well? You might go up there and find out if there's anything in it. In this? You're joking. Hmm? No. No, of course not. Not you. Good afternoon. Do I make it official or shall I go to stores and draw a false beard? Official, but don't be heavy-handed about it. Better take Bellamy with you. Who was the copper up there? The officer who dealt with the matter is Inspector McAndrew. <coughs> um, yes, I'm Inspector McAndrew. What have we done to get your lot on our back? I don't know, really. Somebody reported a dead body by the roadside last night, but when you got there... You're not here about that, isn't it, Tarzan? <coughs> it, it, it was a drunk. Ah, you found him. No, it must have been. Couldn't it have been a hoax? No. How do you know? The informant came in and told us there was a body. Insisted. But you didn't find it? There wasn't any body. And I wonder why she thought there was. Hysterical, frustrated. How should I know? Can I have her name and address? Miss June Coney, 19 Elm Court, the Terrace, SW15. What was she like? 25, medium height, pleasant features, dark hair. Sensible? Well? She seemed so. Neither hysterical nor frustrated, then? Not when she came here, but I'm not a psychiatrist. But I wonder why she said there was a body. There was no body. No body. We had a whole squad of men searching all round the area. We didn't even find a dead rabbit. She saw a tramp having a snooze. Mm. And if your department has time to waste on this sort of thing, we haven't. So if there's nothing else... Just one more thing. Do you have a copy of your report with Miss Coney's statement in it? Be my guest. You've been most helpful. There's nothing in it. Believe me. I expect you're right. You're going to drop it, then? Uh, not quite. What, then? Reconstruction of the crime. <laughs> in a manner of speaking. Having a look at the place where Miss Coney thought she saw a body. No. But it's dark. Well, it was dark when she saw whatever she saw. You people must have time to waste. And if you could have one of your men call my driver from the canteen? With pleasure. Sergeant Thomas, will you get the driver? Take it easy, Bellamy. It was around here somewhere. She was supposed to have seen a body. 300 yards past the bend, near a broken down public bench. Yeah. Yes, this'll be it. Do you want me to come? Might as well. Lock the car, though. It'd be too embarrassing. What are we supposed to see in the dark? Good question. Lie down, will you? Sir? Sir? There, by the roadside. Well, I've got my good suit on. I'm flattered. I'll lend you a brush. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the light's good enough. These sodium lamps aren't very lovely, but they're effective. She would have been able to see you properly. How the devil did Coleman send me up here? Uh, all right to get up now? Hmm? Oh, yes. See that? There's a light through the trees there. Perhaps it's a lamppost on, on a pathway or something. No, I don't think so. Let's have a look. And don't step on any courting couples. Blimey! Rabbit. Oh, of course. Now, that's not a lamppost, but there's a road there, I think. It's it's a house. Yeah, it's, it's a light in a house. Uh huh. Big place, too. Funny. I didn't realise the road had bent so much. I sense the direction was all wrong. This must be... Yes, I thought I recognised it. You know it? Oh, yes, I know it. The most burglar-proof house in North London. It's got a front gate you couldn't drive a tank through and a big notice beside it. Soviet permanent cultural mission to the United oh, Kingdom. Fair. The good old <laughs> cultural KG Bay. KGB. Uh, that's why Coleman sent me up here. I'll have two bets with you, Bellamy. Hmm? I bet there was a body, and I bet they know in there where it went. 
Good evening. Miss June Coney? Yes. My name is Hart, Ministry of Defence. Here's my authority. I see. May I come in, please? Do I have a choice? Thank you. Charming flat. I hope this isn't too terribly inconvenient. That depends how long you take. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, in here. Miss Coney, you reported finding a body by the roadside at Hampstead Heath the other night. Oh, not that. There was a body. The police talked me out of it for a while, but there was a body. Yes, I expect there was. What? I expect there was. Well, uh, would you like some coffee? If it's no trouble. It's already made. You live here alone? Yes. Pleasant for you. And the reason I asked... Well, if you'll forgive me, I do know that Admiralty clerks, even your grades, aren't all that well paid. And this is rather a splendid place. Actually, I'm a controlled tenant. Well, that sounds very self-possessed. Pay a controlled rent. You know I work at the Admiralty, then? You told Inspector McAndrew. Oh. Thank you. Mmm. I say, this is good coffee. Would you mind telling me about it? What? Oh, finding the body, I mean. I told it all to the police. Oh, very well. I was coming home from the Spaniards along Windmill Lane when I... How were you coming? In my car. Uh, this is in my statement to the police. Oh, that's pity. I should have asked to see it, I suppose. Still... Well, I was driving along when the I... The Spaniards? Saw... How did you go there? I like it. Long way, though, isn't it? Right the other side of London. I like it. Did you go on your own? Yes. Or come back with anyone? No. Did you arrange to meet anyone there? No. But what's this got to do with finding a body? I really can't imagine. Anyway, you went to the Spaniards on your own, met no one there, and came back on your own. Yes. Oh, of course, you didn't have much to drink. Well, I wasn't drunk, if that's what you're suggesting. Oh, well, certainly not. I just mean you wouldn't have many as you were driving. Yes. Now, the body. Well... As I was driving along, I saw this man by the edge of the road. I, I pulled up and went back to him and... Did you see anybody near the man? No. Were there any other cars about? No. Well, when you got out of the car, you must have looked in the mirror to see if there was anything coming up behind you. Uh, no, I was on the... Uh, it wound up. I, I didn't look. But no car did go past me, fortunately. No cars about. No people. Oh, it must have been rather creepy. Yes. That was courageous of you, I must say. I, I, I didn't think. How was he, exactly? Who? The man by the roadside. Oh. He was lying slightly on his side with his head on his arm, almost as if he were asleep. But he wasn't. You're quite sure? His eyes were open. Oh, I see. Could you describe him, do you think? I'm sorry. He was very ordinary. When you saw him, what did you say? My God, he's dead, or something like that. To yourself, of course. Of course. Then you would telephone the police from the next call box without giving your name and address. I didn't want to be involved. But you went back to the police afterwards. I changed my mind. Ah, I see. Is that all? No. Just one more thing. Who was with you? I told Please, you. Please, Miss thought... Coney. An attractive young woman doesn't drive halfway across London on her own, drink on her own, drive back on her own. You weren't sitting in the driving seat of whoever's car it was. You didn't go back and look at the body on your own. And when you saw it, you spoke to someone. Well? You're quite wrong. But they're bound to remember you at the Spaniards. What is it? You having an affair with another woman? Certainly not. That's a... Ah, so it's a married man. Look, I just want to talk to him. His wife won't be involved. They're separated. If she knew about me, well, not me exactly, but that Harold has a girlfriend. I understand. Harold said, if we both gave our names to the police and the story got out, you know what people would say, two civil servants out for a night's boozing and a bit of slap and tickle in the edges. So your friend is a civil servant too. That'll make it easier to call on him at his work. Is he at the Admiralty? Yes. Harold Robson. He's in distribution at Thorley House. Thank you. Oh, and thank you for the coffee. Mr. Hart? Yes? Why are you making inquiries? Well, the police, I could understand, but D.I. No, whatever it is. it's routine when it's a Ministry of Defence employer that's involved. Oh, yes, of course. The body, what, what do you think happened to it? 
Not if you must know. I think it got up and walked away. But you said and that, you... That, that was a slight abridgment of the truth. I really mean I expect there was something that looked like a body. Very like a body. I see. I'm sorry. You know, it's one of the unfortunate facts of life that the people who answer questions have to tell the truth, but not those who ask them. Now, I'm one of the askers. Good night, Mr. Hart. Good night, Miss Coney. Mr. Robson, well, my name is Hart. I expect Miss Coney has told you about me. No. Really? Well, I'm from the Ministry of Defence. Let me hear. I see. Is it all right to talk here? Well, if you'd like to come into my office. Well, the government aren't any more generous with space than they are with money, are they? Well, it's the size of office appropriate to my grade, I suppose. What do you do here, Mr. Robson? Well, I record the, uh, the movement of all the files and manuals and books, things like that. I make sure they get to the people who ask for them, that they're signed for, and that they go back to their appropriate section. Uh -huh. I've seen Miss Coney. She told me all about your finding that man at Hampstead Heath the other night. Oh. She said she wouldn't tell anyone. Well, obviously, she had second thoughts. It was the right thing to do. I am afraid I have questions to put to you. And uh, June explained uh, about us and uh, my wife. Yes. Well, I suppose you must think it was selfish, but... Well, he was dead. At least I thought he was. I didn't really look all that carefully. There was nothing we could do. To tell you the truth, at the time, I didn't even want to phone the police. You thought someone might have killed him and left him there. Or killed him at the roadside. And what happened to the body? <sighs> well, I must have been wrong. He looked dead, but... Well, thank you, Mr. Robson. But, Mr. Hart, there, there's no need for anyone else to know about this. I mean, well, if my wife thought I had a girlfriend, it's not that I mean anything to her. I, I expect she'll divorce me sooner or later, but if she thinks I want my freedom because I've got someone, she'll hang on just to spite me. I understand. Do you, Mr. Hart? I doubt it. People don't know what it's like if they haven't lived it. It, it eats away at you. So, if you do find someone worthwhile, like June, you'll do anything to hang on to them. Almost anything. Well, I don't see any point in making this public. Any of it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hello, Petra. Hello, Mr. Hart. Mr. Coleman's expecting you. You look blooming. Well, it is spring. Mm, for you, maybe. It comes a little late for me. Later every year. I can wait. Tut, tut. Well, now. If that's there, send him in, Petra. Yes, Mr. Coleman. Story of my life. I'd love to hear it. Soon. <laughs> well? Do you mind if I sit down first? I saw the woman who found the body, June Coney. She'd been out drinking with her boyfriend, Harold Robson. They both work in the Admiralty. She's a typist. He's one step above a messenger. He's married, so they didn't want to get mixed up in anything. Oh, God, these people with messy private lives. Was there a body? You know damn well there was. That's why you sent me. And you know damn well where it went. Into the house on the hill. The K. Gay Bay branch office. What did you tell Miss Coney and Robson? Oh, I told them they were mistaken. There must have been a drunk who got up and staggered away. And? Well, she didn't believe me, but she will eventually. And he doesn't care one way or the other. I suppose he just wants to stay out of trouble. Who doesn't? Do you still keep Sherry in that cupboard? Yes. Thank you. Well, what's it all about? Uh, there was a, a new arrival at the cultural mission last night. Sergei Penkarsky. You know him, of course. Oh, yes. General Penkarsky of the KGB. One of the old-time survivors. He's about as cuddly as an Epstein statue and as cultural as a kick in the crutch. I do wish you'd leave your vulgarities at the door. But like shoes at a mosque. I've been getting information out of the cultural mission. Just as I suppose they've been getting it in. Undoubtedly. Yes, I had a man inside. Had? I fancy he was the disappearing body at the roadside. Some time ago, my man reported he thought he was under suspicion, and he asked for the message-passing system to be changed. So you did? I didn't. 
It would have been too complicated. I told him to be careful. I'm sure he was grateful for the advice. No messages came out for a while. Now they've started coming out again. In the correct code. Well, then he's all right. The correct code, except for one thing. The security check is missing. Well, what about the quality of the information? Uh, it seems good, but it'll take a long time to verify. Now, as I see it, the probability is that they've killed my man, found his code book and list of drops, and decided to feed us misleading information. But I can't be sure. Oh, it's really most vexing. If they have killed your man, he probably thought it was rather more than vexing. Mm. To return to my hypothesis that the Russians have killed my man and he's using his code book, I want you to set up photo surveillance of all the drops. When the next drop is made, I intend to know who made it. It sounds so simple. But the opposition mustn't have a scintilla of a suspicion. How many drops was your man using? Here's the list. Oh, God. By the way, am I supposed to recognise anyone in these photographs? No. I am. What sort of people do you have working on this business, Hart? Failed beach photographers with box brownies. Look at these pictures. Well, I think some of them are rather good. Particularly the one with the girl in the prominent jumper in the background. I'm in no mood for your juvenile flippancies this morning. Sorry. Three drops made, and not a single decent picture of our man. I don't think that's the photographer's fault. They are good men. The subject was being very careful. He's a professional. Yes. Which possibly means, perhaps even probably means, it's a Russian plant using one of their men. Well, what about the messages they've dropped? As before. In the correct code, but without the security check. Yes. Sounds very much as if your man has been clobbered. He was a body by the roadside. But you still want a photograph of the man they're using to make the plants. Of course. You know, it may be a new man we don't know yet. But if your people on photo surveillance can't do any better, we never shall. Is there something else? A oh, uh, loose end. Robson. Harold Robson, the man who saw the body. Yes. Well, I checked his personal file. He was divorced five years ago. <laughs> been listening to the first half of Dead Drop by Max Marquis. In the cast, you heard Patricia Gallimore, Nigel Anthony, and Douglas Blackwell. The program was produced in London at the BBC. The executive producer of The Mystery Project is Bill Howell. Our coordinating producer is Barry Morgan. I'm Bob Boving, thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. See you next week. Again, Bob Boving here for the Mystery Project, and tonight, the last half of Dead Drop by Max Marquis. June and Harold found a body beside a road in Hampstead, reported it, and the body vanished. The police, believing it a hoax, quickly lose interest, but some gray types show up in the person of Mr. Hart to ask more and harder questions. Here's the conclusion of Dead Drop. What time is it? Uh... Nearly 9.20. Oh, if we hurry, we can see the play of the month. Well, I, I don't think I should stay that late. Oh. Well, it's not over till nearly 11, and by the time I get home... Yes. Well, darling. Um, all right. She's, she's phoned a couple of times. Late. What for? Well, nothing, really. Just to check up on me, I suppose. Oh, if only. What about the weekend? No, it should be all right. Good. It's our last one before I go on leave. I uh, suppose you still haven't managed to persuade your chief to let you change your dates. I only wish I could. Well, should we have our coffee in the other room? Yes, all right. What sort of people do you have working on this business, Hart? Failed beach photographers with box brownies. Look at these pictures. Well, I think some of them are rather good. Particularly the one with the girl in the prominent jumper in the background. I'm in no mood for your juvenile flippancies this morning. Sorry. Three drops made, and not a single decent picture of our man. I don't think that's the photographer's fault. They are good men. The subject was being very careful. He's a professional. Yes. Which possibly means, perhaps even probably means, it's a Russian plant using one of their men. Well, what about the messages they've dropped? As before. In the correct code, but without the security check. Yes. Sounds very much as if your man has been clobbered. You know... It may be a new man we don't know yet, 
But if your people on photo surveillance can't do any better, we never shall. Is there something else? A uh, loose end. Robson. Harold Robson, the man who saw the body. Yes. And I checked his personal file. He was divorced five years ago. So? But the reason he and June Coney gave for not waiting for the police was that they didn't want his wife to find out about them and cause trouble. That's your loose end? Yes. I think you'd find more profitable loose ends in a plate of cold spaghetti. There is something wrong there. There are times, Hart, when you stagger me. Why should Robson be involved? All he did was drive past the body with his fancy piece. I mean, it's a thousand to one coincidence he was there at that particular moment. Not necessarily. He, he's worried. Oh, very well. Have a go at Robson. Thank you. Oh, don't thank me. I think you're being completely irresponsible. And when you fall flat on your face, I shall put an adverse report into your file. I see. I shall enjoy thinking over the precise wording. Well, if you get stuck for a word, let me know. All right. All right. Oh. Oh, I've had more enthusiastic greetings. Is this an inconvenient moment? Oh, no. I always ask people to call when I'm in the bath. Really? You must put me on invitation list. You know what I mean. I suppose you'd better come in. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll wait while you get dry. I am now. This bathrobe's better than a couple of towels. Can I get you something to drink? I've got some coffee on again, actually. Thank you. Do you lot always call in the evenings? Uh-huh. That's when people are at home, usually. If we're lucky, we catch them in the bath. Ha ha. What's it all about? Uh, the same old thing. But there's no hurry. Let's wait till we have our coffee. Uh, unless you've got a date. Oh, no. Matter of fact, I'm off on holiday tomorrow. Where? Costa Brava. Economy package tour. Well, the sun's the same, whatever the price. Going with anyone? No. You haven't broken it off with your boyfriend, Harold Robson? No. I've got an extra week. He can't get leave at the same time. That's all. Yes, it must be difficult with his wife and everything. Is that what you hear about? No, no, no. Sorry. Wasn't trying to be nosy. I, I was sympathising. You're sure it isn't some sort of security check to see if we'd be vulnerable to pressure, single girl, married man, all that? <laughs> what, these days? Besides, what do you know that could tilt the balance of power in Europe? True. What made you come to London? Well, same as everyone else, I expect. Streets of London paved with gold? Hardly. Anonymity? Maybe. Isn't that another name for loneliness? At first. But the freedom's worth it. <laughs> I suppose you can't cough in a Sussex village without everyone knowing it. It is a bit like that. Do you get home very often? Oh, one weekend a month, sometimes two. Your mother's still alive? Uh-huh. Uh, my father died during the war. Yes. I suppose she worries about you. Says she's sure you're not eating properly. Asks you if you're going to get married soon. How did you know that? All <laughs> oh, mothers are the same. So she doesn't know about Harold Robson? No. So that is what you've come about. No, no, just friendly interest. I'm afraid it doesn't sound like it. Looking up my personal file. Oh, yes, yes, you must have done. You knew where I came from about my father being dead. Routine. My... Well, I'm sorry. It's not my sort of But routine. I didn't mean it to be an imposition. It's worse. It's an inquisition. I assure you, I had no... It is not. It's a rather nasty, clumsy pass, and I can do without either. Thank you very much. Good night. Yes, uh, June... Miss Coney did phone and tell me you'd been to see her. Mr. Robson, you weren't frank with me. Oh, you mean about my wife? Ex-wife. Yes, it uh, wasn't very bright of me to try to fool you. No. Look, I told June soon after I met her that I was married. It was a sort of insurance. Stop it all getting too serious. Well, she accepted me on those conditions. Yes. Look, do you know what the salary is for a civil servant of my grade? I mean, look at this place. It's all I can afford. And don't say two can live as cheaply as one. I wasn't going I've to. I've been married. I've had some. I know what it's like. If June thought I was free, if I told her I wasn't married, we'd probably just drift into marriage and kids. And, well, almost whether we wanted to or not. Yes. Well, now, if she meets someone better off than me, she's free. You know, to tell you the truth, when... June went to the police. I was glad, really. Do you still think there was a body? Yes. And I'm sure that he was dead. Then what do you think happened to him? Well, I expect he was a crook. They did disappear, didn't they? So I believe you. I'm afraid I still can't tell you anything more than I have done. Well, can you remember how he was dressed? No. Well, was he well-dressed? 
Flashy? No. Ordinary. And about 35 to 40. Dark, did you say? Yeah, that's right. He could have been Irish. Dark. Blue eyes. What? His eyes were open. Oh, yes, yes, Miss Coney said that, too. Oh, short of sending Frogman down in Hampstead Pond, I can't think of anything else we can do. Good Lord, is that the time? I didn't mean to keep you so late. Oh, that's all right. Ah, well, good night, then. Good night. Petro! Petro, come in here, will you? Yes, Mr. Coleman. Have you managed to contact Hart yet? No, not yet. Oh, devil take the man. He knows he's supposed to keep in touch. Who's that coming? A fellow, me, sir. Right, come on in, then. What, sir? Have you heard from Hart? Uh, not since yesterday, sir. Uh, all right, Petro, thank you. All right, Mr. Coleman. Well, what have we got there? Well, things are slightly popping, sir. Uh, first, we got pictures of the man who's been dropping messages. Uh, uh, well, come on, sir. Ah, there you are, sir. Uh, now, that's him there, r- right in the act. Well, now... You know him? Oh, yes, I know him. That's Vasily Ivanov. Huh? He's supposed to be a cultural attaché, but he's a major of the KGB. Uh, then your man inside is dead. Huh. He, he wants a body, sir. That's one problem solved. Well, not altogether. And uh, this is the message he dropped, sir. Mm-hmm. Oh, short. Won't take long to decipher. Fancy. Uh, Petra, put out a red tracer to find Hart and tell them to keep on till he's found. Yes, Mr. Coleman. Is he in trouble, sir? Well, not from the opposition, from me, for disappearing. We've got to get hold of this Ivanov very soon. How do we do that? Just go in and grab him? There's a refreshing elementary directness about you, Bellamy. You would have made a good uniform policeman. As a matter of fact, you will. Sir? No, oh, never mind. No, we don't have to go in and get him. According to this message, he's coming out. And there they are. Admirably punctual, Bellamy. Sir, shall I take them now, sir? Uh, no, wait a moment, Constable, until the traffic clears a little. We don't want too many witnesses. I've never felt the collar of a Russian, especially a Russian diplomat. Yes, well, don't make a zephyr any production of it. As a matter of fact, I was thinking more of a sort of sub-Jean-Luc Godard verite. <laughs> I am very properly rebuked, Constable. Ah. Now, I think... Are you aware you went through a red traffic signal, sir? Nonsense, Vasily. May I see your driving license, please? I don't have it with me. In any case, I have diplomatic immunity. Then perhaps you'll be good enough to show me your passport, sir. I don't have that either. Do you think a member of the diplomatic corps carries his passport with him all the time? This car doesn't have a diplomatic road fund license. I have my passport with me. Here. You're not driving, sir. This gentleman is. Sergeant, I think we might ask the driver to blow up the bag yes. for us. Yes, I think we might. Uh, would you mind stepping out of the car, sir? I most certainly would. Varsity cooperate. We can complain later. So, very well. Would you please blow into this bag, sir, and fill it with one single breath? Here. Yeah. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Take that thing away. Here, take care. Would you? You saw that constable. He tried to hit me. I saw him, sir. You were lying. Fascist. Right, come along into the car. Take your hands off him. He is a member of my country's diplomatic staff. Yes, sir. Uh, come on, sir. Where are you taking him? I insist my embassy be informed. You can do that at the station after we've charged you. Fascist, you will pay for this. I am going back to the embassy. I'll inform them at once. All right, you can relax now, Ivanov. Your friend's gone. Hello, Coleman. That all went very smoothly. Well done, Bellamy. Most realistic, sir. And you too, Constable. Uh, Cannon Row Police Station, I think, as our friend is claiming diplomatic immunity. Are you telling me... No, I'm not telling you. You guessed. You don't have to worry about Bellamy. What about the Constable? Is he all right? Him? Oh, yes. He's not quite what he seems. Um, in the best possible way. Right now... Borisenko suspected me and caught me making a drop. 
So I had to kill him and plant everything on him. Including the code book. And that's what made Pelkowski believe me. Eventually. Mm-hmm. He didn't know about the security check in the messages, though. The information is worthless, I suppose. Yes. Well, we'll make it look as if we're acting on it. I take it you were being watched when you made those last drops. Yes, we knew you'd heard about the body. Who from? We have someone in the Admiralty. I don't know who. So, Penkaski was aware you knew about the body. But you couldn't know whether it was your man Boris Tenko or someone else. Hmm. It was obvious you'd be carrying out surveillance, probably photographic. Yes, of course. So, to keep in character, I had to avoid identification. Until this last drop. You put in a priority alarm signal. Yes, now listen carefully. I learned that the English agent we... uh, They have on the outside signals when he has something to pass by sticking a small map pin in the bottom of the door leading to the lavatories at the Spaniards Inn. Two days ago, there was a green pin, top priority. And so I took the risk of contacting you. Someone from the Admiralty is going to change briefcases with Penkaski. It will contain details of the modifications and communications equipment of the nuclear submarines. Where is this going to happen? London Airport. He's catching a scheduled flight to Copenhagen, then on to Moscow. And it's today. Bellamy, sir, uh, call up on the radio, find out when the next scheduled flights to Copenhagen are due out, and if there are connections with a Moscow flight. India Delta Master to India Delta One... India Delta Master to India Delta One. Please inform time of departure from London Airport of next scheduled flights to Copenhagen and whether there are connections with Moscow flights. Over. India Delta One, we'll go. Now, what about the man who's making the handover? Poor woman. They're leaving the country today as well. For good. The Spaniards in. Someone in the Admiralty. Oh, Hart was right. Oh, blast the man for disappearing. Bellamy, sir. have Robson and Miss Coney picked up. Yes, now. sir. India Delta Master to India Delta One. Detain for questioning Harold Robson, Distribution Department, Thorley House, Admiralty, and June Coney, Department S-17, Admiralty, Whitehall. Also check at home addresses. India Delta Master, over. India Delta One, Wilco. Pity we had to pick you up in this way. It's going to cause a lot of trouble. Your people will act very, very angry. And suspicious. We'll declare you persona non grata. But it'll lose you from London, but it will help diminish suspicion. You'll have to go sleep up for a while. But you can always take up your work again in a new posting in a year or two. I'll be in touch. You never let go, do you, Coleman? I prefer to say I never forget old friends. Ah, Canon Rowe. India Delta One to India Delta Master... India Delta Master. Next scheduled flights, Copenhagen. Take off at 15.50 hours, connects with Moscow flight. 17.40 hours, no connection. 21.10 hours, no connection. A message from India Delta 14 for India Delta Master. Oh, come on, come on. Oga Star 3 left Embassy 30 minutes ago and took M4 westwards. Master Roger out. Fifteen fifty, that's less than three quarters of an hour. Ogre Star Three? Penkarski. Ogre, three star general. I like that, sir. Yes, well, Penkarski's left now. Constable, take the prisoner into Cannon Row and charge him. Yes, sir. I expect you'll want to contact his embassy after that. Good luck, Ivanov. And good luck to you, Coleman. Right. London Airport, Bellamy. You drive, I'll be using the radio. And you can play with the siren as much as you like. India Delta One, this is India Delta Master speaking. India Delta One. I want our man at London Airport to call me as soon as possible on this wavelength. Who's on duty now? Wait. Thirty-three, sir. Oh, standard bounds it would be. Make this grade one priority. Welcome. And keep this channel clear. You red tracer on India Delta Three. No contact, sir. Roger. I tell you, Bellamy, when I find Hart, I'll crucify him on Admiralty Arch personally. Come on out of it, deaf and blind tortoise. India Delta Master? Yes. Your message pre Robson and Coney. Neither at work today. Robson not at home. 
Coney starts seven days leave, reportedly in Spain. Roger. They might have switched the briefcases already, sir. No. No, they'll do that at the last second. Pinkowski won't want to risk being caught with those sort of documents on him. We couldn't hold him, but it would mean he'd be a marked man. There's only an ungrater everywhere. We could delay the aircraft, sir. Oh, Penkowski would smell a rat. He'd dodge the contact. Right. Now, I want to get Penkowski with the documents on him and get the person who passes them to him. India Delta, Master. Master. London Airport reports 33 is not answering broadcast calls, sir. Tell him to keep trying. India Delta, one. Uh, Taking Penkowski has got to be done at the critical moment. At the train driver. Too soon, there'd be a fearful diplomatic row. Mm. And too late... Well, he trumpeted he'd been framed by the perfidious British and had something planted on him. Here is a special announcement. Will the representative of Coleman and Company... General Penkarski? Yes? Your flight will be called soon, sir. You'd like to come with me to the VIP lounge? Of course. his travel there. In here, sir. I will sit by the door. Whatever you like, sir. Shall I take a briefcase for you? No, thank you. Oh, then perhaps I can bring you a drink? Yes, vodka. A large one. How long before we go? Not long. Don't worry, I'll let you know. They won't leave without you. It's going to be too close for comfort. End of Delta Master. You Delta One? Where the hell is that man, Barnes? He hasn't answered the call, sir. But keep trying. Out. I don't know who I'll crucify first. Hart or Barnes? Are we going to make it? Look, do try to hurry just a little. Sir, sir. we are doing over a hundred. It doesn't seem all that much faster than the airport bus. That was close. Yes, we may make it. I don't know. We have to make it, as long as the tunnel at the airport isn't too crowded. How much longer? They're finishing provisioning the aircraft now, sir. Matter of moments. The tunnel's fairly empty. Oh, for God's sake, slow down now. We're not a scheduled flight. BA flight number 585 to Copenhagen is now aboard. Would you like to follow me, please, sir? Ah. Uh, do you have everything? Oh, you won't forget your briefcase, sir, will you? No, I won't forget it. VIP large. This way. That's him. He's going out, sir. Yes, and he's got a briefcase. Now, wait. Has there been a, a handover yet? Yes. Stop him, and there's nothing in that. Yes, case, but sir. if we let him go, and he has got the documents. Now, I must. If he's clean, you'll be for the eye jumps. Oh, won't we all? General. Sir. Sir. Barnes. Where's that? Sir. Sir. Benkarski. Yes. Yes, Barnes. Let's go. Sir, wait. I it's all right. I'm in the general. If you'll just come with me. We can still hold the aircraft now, sir, if we have to. Yes. All right, Barnes. Where? Over here, sir. I suggest you start thinking up some reason for your dereliction of duty. Yeah, in here. Good afternoon, Coleman. Hart, I don't think I'll crucify you and Barnes. After all, I'll have you publicly burned. Uh, this gentleman with the black eye and torn jacket is Harold Robson, Distribution Department, Thorley House, Admiralty. That briefcase on the table there contains documents he was trying to distribute rather irregularly. We stopped him. I see. Details of communication equipment and modifications in nuclear submarines. Fancy. Now, if you'll be good enough to explain, starting, for example, with why you've been out of touch... Well, it didn't dawn on me till this morning. When I saw Robson at his flat last night, I noticed a packed suitcase. But it didn't register then. And how I was as a matter of interest, how did you know it was packed? He stumbled against it. It was obviously full, but he said it was empty. That was rather a slight cause for excitement, was it not? Then I remembered something he said. He was talking about the body. He said it had dark hair and blue eyes. What is so monumental about the... Uh, oh, yes, I see. That and the pack uh, Sorry, suitcase? but uh, will someone explain? What sort of street lighting is there where Robson and his lady friend saw the body, Bellamy? Uh, sodium vapour. Yellow. Ghastly. Oh. You couldn't tell what colour a pillar box was, let alone someone's eyes. So, Robson had seen the man somewhere before. He knew what colour eyes he had. And thought it important enough to conceal the fact that he had seen him before. Yes, yes, all right, all right, Barnes. Now, Robson, isn't it? Is there anything you want to say? 
nothing to say. Well, if you change your mind, you'll be given every opportunity. Hart? You know, all this didn't dawn on me until this morning, when I was driving towards the office. Nearly rammed a bus. Can we possibly manage without the colourful minor details? I decided to rush round to Robson's place right away and see if he made a break for it. If he hadn't already. And? And before you ask me why I didn't call in, have you tried to find a phone box that works in London? I knew Robson might be going any time. Maybe in a couple of hours, but maybe in a couple of minutes. So I had to keep his flat under constant surveillance until I could get through to you without the risk of missing him. And? He came out carrying a suitcase and a briefcase. I followed him here. And arrested him? But I had to. You've seen how crowded it is. I could have lost him. I probably would have done too if I hadn't spotted Barnes and got him to give me a hand. I see. Barnes... You heard the broadcast messages calling you to report. Will you please tell me why you failed to report? He was helping me to pick up Robson here and keep him quiet. He was quite a handful, sir. Violent and noisy, it took both of us. Really? Now, Mr. Robson, you've been most patient. Is there anything you'd like to tell us? Nothing to say. Like where you got the documents you were going to pass over? Nothing to say. His job was low-grade and unimportant, but it gave him access to high-grade, important material. Oh, thank you so much for explaining. What about the Coney woman? Oh, Lord. I've forgotten all about her. Ah, and what had you forgotten about her? Well, she was booked on a package tour to Spain today. So in case Robson had given her the documents to bring to the airport, we took her off the flight and had her searched. And? She's still in the detention room. <laughs> then you'd better explain to her. And get her on another flight. Yes, I'd better had. Well, that seems to be that. More or less. I wasn't expecting an instantaneous OBE awarded on the battlefield, as it were. Not even thanks. But After really, such I such a remember. botched, inept job of work. I beg your pardon? Do you know to whom he was going to deliver these documents? To General Penkarsky. So I rather thought he might, but I noticed Penkarsky in the doorway of the VIP lounge carrying a duplicate briefcase. Then why didn't you let this... this this person delivered it and get both of them. That is a very good question. Uh, it, it was because, uh, frankly, I didn't want to take the responsibility of detaining someone like Penkarsky. With your record for unparalleled intemperance and unconcern, you astonish me. Besides, for all I knew, he might be one of your men and the whole thing a plant to strengthen his cover. I'm not impressed, Hart. All I know is that a unique opportunity to arrest Penkarsky has been criminally wasted. You can always fire me. Oh, I'm not going to give you that happy release, Hart. Right. Bellamy, Barnes, take Robson away. Right, we'll sir, get them right. to charge him a duck's oh. Official Secrets Act. And I suppose you wouldn't care to explain to Miss Coney. She might be impressed by your authority. Oh, she's much more likely to be impressed by your celebrated charm. And don't forget... My office, 9.30 tomorrow. I suppose there is no point in reminding you that you said it wasn't worth following up, Robson, that I stopped the documents leaving the country. Leave the speech in mitigation until tomorrow. Good afternoon. Oh, uh, enjoy your chat with Miss Coney. So I'm no longer under arrest. My dear Miss Coney, you never were under arrest. Now, whatever gave you that idea? Illegally detained, then. The helping us with our inquiries. And we're most grateful. We've arranged a place for you on a scheduled flight, and you'll join up with the rest of your party at Benidorm. Actually, it'll be a much more comfortable trip. I still think I'm entitled to an explanation, at least. Yes, you are. Well, I have some rather bad news for you. Harold Robson has been arrested. What for? Official Secrets Act. I'm afraid he was a spy. Harold! Oh, mad! He's, he's so ordinary! Nice and thoughtful. Spy? There must be some mistake. We caught him with his hand in the till, as it were. I can't believe it. I'm very sorry. It must be difficult for you. Just because you suddenly say he's a spy, I can't switch off my feelings like that. No, of course not. He was arrested here at the airport. That's why we had to be sure you weren't involved. Look, if you'd like to put off your holiday for a while, I expect I could wait. Here? Up... What was he doing here? Going on holiday. But he didn't plan to come back. But he told me he couldn't get leave. That's not the only lie he told you. He's not married either. What? He was divorced five years ago, and... Divorced? Yes. Ever since we met, he didn't have a wife? No. Oh, those stories about his unhappy married life at home, his... His wife who didn't understand him. 
your own lies. Look, I know. I've got my car here. Why don't Not we just pop married. in? married. No. No, thank you, Mr. Hart. Will I be required to give evidence? No, I shouldn't think that would be necessary. Well, if I am. Now, what do I do about my flight? Uh, are you sure? Quite, you... thank you. Besides, I think a holiday would do me good. You have been listening to the conclusion of Dead Drop by Max Marquis. In the cast, you heard Patricia Gallimore as June, Nigel Anthony as Hart, and Douglas Blackwell as Harold. The program was produced in London at the BBC. The executive producer of The Mystery Project is Bill Howell. Our coordinating producer is Barry Morgan. I'm Bob Boving, thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. See you next week.